Welcome everyone. We're back in person. Welcome to the IEP workshop. And um, I cannot believe how many new faces I'm seeing after these last few years of COVID, but I'm Stephanie Fong. I'm your um, chair coordinator. So if you have any questions, always feel free to come, come to me. Um, thank you all for coming and battling the weather. Uh, just a few logistical uh, things before we get started. There were restrooms that were right across from the registration area where you guys all registered and got your badges. Please make sure that you um, continue to keep your badges for all of the days that you are registered. There's a little Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday marking for the different days that you're actually registered to be here. And so the folks who will be watching the doors are all going to be just making sure that you're here for the right days. Um, but there is overflow space up on the second floor. So if anyone um, isn't registered uh, ahead of time for the auditorium space, there is some space up there with the posters. So um, please just enter through the ramp and you can exit from this side, the other side as well. Um, there's another one out at the back side of the, the room here. Um, this free space in the first and second floor is very easy to maneuver through without any kind of special badge or anything like that. So rest, restrooms have a code right near the door. So you'll need to use the code to be able to get in. Um, and when it is your last day, the end of the last day that you're here for um, the in-person days, feel free to drop your little badge um, in the box so we, we can use the uh, holder <laughs> in a future year. Um, Let's see, we've got the posters upstairs uh, with the overflow room. And this year is very different from any of our other years in the past because we're gonna have actual sessions. So session three today will be an actual time for everyone to go spend time in the posters and record, or sorry, uh, read and take a look at all the posters, talk with the authors um, rather than having the evening sessions that we used to have. And the remote audience, hopefully everyone can hear us okay. Please stay close to the microphone speakers because uh, the folks that are viewing remotely will only be able to hear you if the microphone can capture your voice. Um, other than that, we'll be having the session chairs moderate the question and answer boxes from the remote folks so we can be, um, get questions from both in the room and from our remote audience. And I think we'll start us off with our lead scientist, Steve Culperson. Welcome back to our in-person workshop. Bear with us since this is a work in progress, uh, a workshop, if you will. Please consider volunteering for the planning committee for 2024. We begin our planning in August and September, and we will solicit participation via email in July. This year, we've decided to celebrate the work of our project work teams. I can think of no better way to infuse agency directed and policy centric monitoring activities with relevant, curious, actionable, durable, and long term supportable science than through our IEP network of project work teams. These publicly facing, open, collegial, mostly self directed centers of excellence have proven, have a proven track record of supplying IEP member agencies with implementable technical and scientific information and research for over two decades. And in the case of the estuarine ecology team or EAT, probably more like three decades or more. In return, scientists of any stripe or color can participate in open collegial forums that focus on particular areas of interest, collaboration and expertise, identifying potential special studies for our IEP community to pursue or to provide management relevant and manager available rosters of subject matter experts to engage to converse with and to have on hand to help understand managerial technical issues related to monitoring in the San Francisco estuary. Additionally, these PWTs aid in interpreting collectively accumulated data into our shared ecological understanding and of the Bay Delta ecosystem. And what a celebration we're going to have. We, we are going to hear from a variety of PWTs as the workshop unfolds, you can check online for our list of IEP papers published over the last year that come primarily from these work teams. 
It's a list that's been averaging 30 or 40 titles annually for the last decade at least. So kudos to all of you who are active in the project work teams and to their leadership and to their membership. I can, again, reemphasize that there, I think there is no better representation of the IEP, its collective work ethic, and its demonstrated management relevance than via the presentations and posters you will see over the next three days. I hope you enjoy the show. With so many critical scientific information needs and policy related issues confronting all of us, including the challenges of the interpersonal collaborations we face as members of nine coordinating agencies and with many more non IEP organizations interacting during and after a multi generational pandemic. I've personally been trying to support actions of issue identification and priority setting as a community, realizing that we all have too much to do and not enough resources with which to do it. I wanted to see if we could articulate our collective struggle and in, in a simple thesis or question, and that's the title of my talk today, who is prioritizing our priorities? Who is deciding what is most important to work on? Is it IEP coordination? Is it your immediate supervisor? Is it your agency executive? Who even keeps a list of what we are collectively trying to do? Do you care? Is your work just work? Or is there something more that motivates you to do what is needed, to take that extra step, to do the collectively beneficial thing? Or rather, do you do only what's required and what will get you by? What urges you to do only what others may think you should do? There is no correct answer to these questions, and I'm provoking you to some extent, of course. Good morning, wake up. But when everybody says yes to everything as a collective priority, who says no? What really then is a priority? When will we be brave enough, honest enough, to say no to things that just don't address our established and stated objectives? Depending on which agency you ask or who you ask within each agency, you'll get different answers, operational issues, biological opinions, incidental take permitting, species recovery plans, adaptive management initiatives, regional restoration plans, artificial propagation experiments, genetic de testing, de detection and testing, regional ecosystem model mo monitoring. There's plenty to choose from. So what gets to the top? When all the answers are yes, how can any one organization or any one person say no? My own response begins with a simple realization, and it might be limited by my personal experience, but I'll offer it up for discussion nonetheless. No one is really in charge. And after 50 IEP years, no one is likely to be in charge anytime soon under the current arrangements. Therefore, I have to conclude for myself, and I would suggest to you, that the answer to what's important comes within me, comes within you. The answer lies within us. What is your priority? What work will make you happy? Have you thought about it? Are we working together? Have you talked to your immediate supervisor about this? Have you talked to your agency executive? Failure to effectively understand the numerous tasks at hand and our inability to understand and address them all is our collective challenge. Our failure to prioritize and hold accountable this lack of decision making by all of us should be questioned and soberly admitted. By not choosing what to do and what not to do, we choose to do the not important as much as we choose to do the important. And that may be the end of the human species given time, which in the end is the only resource we ever really have. As Ehrlich and Ehrlich have recently said, quote, our species failure to make universal well-being normal, to foresee and attempt to deal with existential threats inherent in our achievements and frequent failure to seek sustainability rather than continual growth and immediate maximum return, in our opinion, should be a major source of shame. As many of you are aware, the sixth IPCC assessment report, uh, the summary for policymakers at least, was released this week, and it leads me to my final point and prompts me to ask on behalf of all scientists and astute policymakers everywhere, whoops, and in keeping with my interest in discussing selection of our priorities, what's going on? Why aren't 
all of us working on climate issues and planetary energy overrun and preparing for coming planetary scale reactions to climate variability and increased atmospheric energy that we are all experiencing and will experience more frequently into the future. Why not begin to focus on this change in our daily working lives and in our agency related working jobs? When the pace of science is slower than our need for useful information, don't we have an obligation to speak up whenever we feel things are heading in the wrong direction? Why do we let process and production of unassailable proof get in the way of doing the right thing or making the right choice? Science is a way of conducting ourselves in the face of confusion and a way of keeping our knowledge honest, not an impediment to admitting we have a conscious and have some deep-seated sense of wrongdoing. The conduct of science should not preclude us from having a moral center or personal sense of what is wrong and what is right. How much more science do we need to know that our actions are degrading our environment? How much more science will we ignore? As Christopher Ketchum has written in The Intercept, and I quote here, the crux of the problem is that mainstream environmentalists have siloed climate change as a phenomenon apart from the broad human ecological footprint, separate from deforestation, overgrazing of livestock, megafauna kill-off, collapsing fisheries, desertification, depleted freshwater, soil degradation, oceanic garbage gyres, toxification of rainfall with microplastics, and on and on, the myriad biospheric effects of breakneck growth. Climate change, another quote here, is but one symptom of an environmentally dysfunctional system of constant growth of economies and populations. The meta problem that we need to keep our eyes on is ecological overshoot. Modern techno-industrial culture is systematically, even enthusiastically, consuming the biophysical basis of its own existence. And this last quote was from William Rees, who some of you may know from the University of Columbia, uh, British Columbia. We need to be honest about causality and identification of impediments to workable solutions, especially given the remarkable and sustained contributions of the monitoring collective like the Interagency Ecological Program. I found myself recently turning for inspiration in this regard to the recent uh, award-winning HBO series Chernobyl, which many of you will have seen. At the end of the story, Valerie Lagasov, the leading Soviet nuclear physicist, reflects, quote, to be a scientist is to be naive. We are so focused on our search for truth, we fail to consider how few actually want us to find it. But it is always there whether we see it or not, whether we choose to or not. The truth doesn't care about our needs or wants. It doesn't care about our governments, our ideologies, our religions. It will lie in wait for us for all time. And this at last is the gift of Chernobyl. To our purposes within the IEP and why we monitor ecosystems, I think we can face the future of our planet and estuary together as scientists. Let's stick to the truth about our estuary, about our state, about our region, and about our planet. Science is but a small part of policymaking. The rest requires citizenry and our public participation. I hope we can avoid hiding behind our science, and I trust that together we can choose to do what is right. Please enjoy the rest of the plenary session and the entirety of our workshop this year. Welcome back to the IEP and welcome home. Thanks, Steve. Now you're going to throw me off. <laughs> Woo. This is what it's like when um, you really care about what you do and the people that you do this with. So a testament to that. Um, all right, here we go. All righty. So next we have Dr. Louise Conrad and um, she was one of our uh, 
really directing scientists at DWR, formerly also the, I'm going to read these, um, Deputy Executive Officer for Science at the Delta Stewardship Council's Delta Science Program. And now she is the lead scientist for DWR. So welcome, Louise. Thank you, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Stephanie, and for your talk, Steve. Big kudos to the whole planning committee for putting together a three-day workshop plus training. I know that's no small lift. And so I'm going to spend some time talking first about my position and then move into IEP. And I wanna spend some time talking about environmental monitoring and synthesis, which I regard as the bread and butter of IEP. So Steve, thank you for that introduction. We are gonna drill way back down to, to, the, to the estuary. I wanna to share too that this has been a challenging talk to prepare for. And that's because as Stephanie said, I'm not a stranger to IEP. I have been part of this community from, um, I wanna say really going back to 2001 when I started as a scientific aide under Ted Summer and the Yellow Bypass. And so it's always your professional family that you do not want to disappoint. So I'm going to do my best. So first, Department of Water Resources lead scientist. What is that these days? I want to first acknowledge that this is a new, this is a relatively new position. Uh, first had, occupied by Dr. Ted Summer, which when the position started in 2016. And Ted sat in the Division of Integrated Science and Engineering at DWR. He advanced a lot of science initiatives to, um, to guide them, to help achieve the mission for the department with a heavy focus on the Bay Delta and science needs for state water project compliance. That really doesn't say all of what Ted did. He really was a force of credibility for Department of Water Resources. He advanced a science culture that we are all nourishing today as part of IEP. So what does chapter two look like? Uh, the position is cast a little bit differently <clears throat> in this next iteration. And with a major change being that it is now sitting on the executive team of the department with the goal of it being a little bit more accessible to different parts of the department as it's a really um, broad set of science initiatives and activities that DWR does. If I had to boil down my job description into three bullet points, this is what they would be. My job includes tracking DWR scientific and activities and products, bringing those and bringing updates to the directorate. Also leading and organizing science initiatives. That's not too different from what Ted was doing, but again, um, a lot more to choose from, I think, um, in terms of scope. And then advancing best scientific practices for DWR. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time as I think this position is relevant to IEP, just drilling down into what each of these is looking like. I forgot to say that I've had this position since July of 2022. So we're less than a year in and it may change. I may say something totally different a year from now, but this is what it looks like today. So tracking science at Department of Water Resources turns out to be a big job. This is a graph that comes from a database curated by the California of Energy Commission librarian who um, tracks and puts into a database contributions from agency scientists, mainly state agency scientists, that um, because of a partnership that we now have to gain access to peer reviewed literature for state employees. So if you're a state employee, I guarantee you, you can get access to literature without having to um, pay. So this just goes back to 2020 when this partnership began. And I like this database because it's somewhat consistent and it tracks the acknowledgement. Um, so it's not just about authorship. That's one of the ways that DWR is contributing scientific publications, but it's also a lot of funding where, um, where we are paying for others to complete research and then that paper is published, funding's acknowledged. And that last category is in other resources, which are often data contributions for an analysis. In the author category, you might, some a lot of these publications are familiar to us in IEP, such as Pete Nelson's recent synthesis of considerations for developing a juvenile production estimate for Central Valley Spring Run Chinook Salmon. 
but there are many other examples as well. And I'll just highlight two of them here. Um, you may be aware that Department of Water Resources has a long running climate change program that is directed by John Andrew. And this program has developed a climate change adaptation plan for the department that includes everything from emissions from our fleet of vehicles to how do we manage land for DWR owned land. And they published their action plan for climate as a cover story on the Journal of American Water Works Association just last year. There are other examples that um, I've been really enjoying learning more about. Um, this is an example that actually comes from the social sciences. The DWR author on the author line here is Julie Ekstrom, and she and a team conducted a series of surveys, interviews, workshops about how managers of small drinking water systems think less than 10,000 people um, were adapting to the recent drought in, well, the, well, the drought just before 2012 to 2016. So, um, and then and then, how does that guide policy for um, water management systems of this scale? So I've been enjoying this, this quite a bit. Um, next category of work, uh, leading science initiatives. And I will share that there's lots of different threads in this category, but my center of gravity is with the voluntary agreements. If you're not aware, voluntary agreements are a series of proposals by public water agencies to provide environmental flows as well as habitat restoration in order to um, satisfy requirements of an updated state water board water quality control plan for the Bay Delta. With now eight tributary systems submitting proposals, um, this is at the scale of the full Central Valley watershed practically with the central idea being that you need both flow and habitat for native fishes to build some resiliency into their populations. Besides this being at the landscape scale, um, the exciting thing here is that there's the opportunity for a lot of collaboration. Instead of operating tributary systems operating in a silo, there's the opportunity for them to work together. And that's built into the uh, proposed, the, the proposal uh, at large of the VA package. What's exciting to me is that the proposal also includes a system-wide science monitoring um, and evaluation plan that includes the need and recognizes the need to conduct synthesis at years three and six of this eight-year program in order to inform future updates to the water quality control plan. So we only just recently formed a science committee, which is now drafting the voluntary agreement science plan. It's starting, it's a big job. Um, lots of different aspects of science that need to be included given the scale of the program and really enjoying the, um, the work in this area and really excited to see how the next few years play out. So third major category of work, advancing best science practices. With an organization as large as DWR, there's always going to be a lot to do in this area, but our focus in 2023 is on science communication. And the inspiration for that comes from this book, which is entitled Getting to the Heart of Science Communication. The author is Dr. Faith Kearns, who comes from the UC California Institute for Water Resources. She is a lead person for science communication there. And I highly recommend this book, which I became aware of only because uh, director Carla Nemeth read it and was motivated by it, and then recommended to the rest of the executive team that they read it as well. A central tenet of this book is that science communication as a field needs to move away from a model of having the sage or the expert on the stage providing information and expecting others to just take it in and, and adopt it. Instead, she suggests that we move to a relation-based communication where we are working with partner as partners with the communities that we are trying to serve. We understand what their needs are, what their perspectives are. And then from that place, we can communicate science in a much more effective way. So uh, we recently held a workshop. We, as a department, are working to engage with Dr. Faith Kearns. We held a workshop just a few weeks ago in honor of the International Day for Women and Girls in Science. And we had a whole panel on, the, on science communication at natural resource agencies. 
So that was a very exciting event that some of us are still glowing a little bit from, but we are not stopping there. And in the fall of this year, we plan to bring Dr. Kearns to our internal Department of Water Resources annual environmental science workshop, where we will do a workshop within a workshop on science communication, really evaluate how are we communicating our science now? What are our barriers? How do we open the door to relational based communication at the department? So very excited about that. So that's uh, me stealing the stage a little bit to tell you about the work that's on my plate now, but I wanna switch gears. Um, this is not a smooth transition, but we're just gonna do it. We're gonna go into environmental monitoring and synthesis, which I regard again as the bread and butter of IEP. And in that order, I think you can think about environmental monitoring as our bread and to make it really good, you need the synthesis, which is the butter. So. Um, starting with environmental monitoring, I think about environmental monitoring as a major engine of science in the Delta. It is foundational to the work that we do, and it is foundational to our community. Let's think first about community, which is the theme of this workshop. Monitoring is field work. Field work builds teams, and when you're in the field repeatedly, you are getting to know your team and you are getting to know your system. Whether you stay in science or not, um, people that have this experience under their belt bring that experience to their next job. They um, become parents or foster community for science, uh, for the Delta or otherwise. These are some examples of people that are all very important leaders or have been in the past and they all started out working in the Delta on some of our routine monitoring programs. Monitoring is more than getting a great start on a career. Um, it is also part of how we evaluate management actions. There's of course a lot of debate about how well monitoring programs are providing information for this task, but this is one of the roles. Of course, it's there for also for status and trends and we've all seen graphs like this one before and it provides the raw material for synthesis. And I wanna focus on synthesis for actually a few slides here because IEP, um, I think many of us are aware has been criticized occasionally, maybe often for not reporting out on its data enough. Um, however, I do wanna say there is a strong history. There's quite a bit, a thread of synthesis has, is not recent. There's been, um, synthesis efforts that have been going on for some time. It's one of the reasons that I pictured Larry Brown on this slide. He was a master synthesizer of data and storyteller that we all learned quite a bit from his synthesis work and helped, um, I think he helped provide a shared understanding of our system. So in more recent years, synthesis has become a more formalized resource part of IEP with some dedicated staff. This is what I call a synthesis pyramid, which is a really simple graphic that I developed when writing the first draft of the IEP synthesis framework document, which in a new iteration made better by Dr. Rosie Hartman is still on the IEP website. This was developed at a time when um, open science, the open science movement was beginning to touch IEP. And Vanessa Tobias founded the data utilization work group and she and others really opened our eyes to the power of data science, what it could do to catalyze synthesis efforts. So the idea behind this very simple graphic is that as a foundation, you need data to be integrated in a sensible, robust manner. You need to have access to that data in order to address any management synthesis question as a team. Once you've done that, those synthesis teams are well positioned to provide distilled information to non-experts. Non-experts might be managers, they might be policymakers, they might be scientists in a different field, or they might be complete lay people that are looking to understand the system better. So much progress, just since this graphic was sketched on a poster that we brought to the long-term ecological research um, stations, all scientists meeting in 2018, so much work has been done that it's just very impressive and worth breaking down. So going to the bottom of that pyramid, first with open science practices, there's been a lot of work uh, to publish some of the core IEP monitoring data sets on the Environmental Data Initiative, which is there uh, accompanied by massive amounts of data from other systems, again, from those long-term ecological research stations. 
This allows IEP data to be accessed and cited for anyone that has the internet, um, but we haven't stopped there. There's also the Delta Science Program hosting a platform featuring our Shiny applications for interactive viewing of data. And that goes along with the Bay Delta Live platform, which is a longer running platform that allows you to visualize our data. Of course, many of our publications, if not all at this point, are being published in open source peer-reviewed outlets. There's also been a lot of progress in integrating data sets. We all know that uh, for a parameter like water temperature, that's collected at lots of different surveys. And you are more powerful to examine trends in water temperature if you can look at all the data at once. And so a lot of work has gone into actually integrating some key data sets. Um, discrete water quality is now integrated across 15 surveys from multiple decades. Same with zooplankton and our fish monitoring surveys. These integrated data sets are published on EDI as well. And a lot of careful attention has been put into uh, documenting the metadata making sure that when integrating, there's robust attention to inconsistencies in the way data are collected. Moving to that, this next tier um, is to have these synthesis teams that are building on all the open and integrated data to address specific questions. And this is often with a team of scientists, which might be really, really big, and it might be just a few people working on an analysis. Um, a recent example comes from a drought synthesis effort led by Dr. Rosemary Hartman, who uh, has led a really impressive set with others um, uh, to look at effects of drought on the ecosystem. And these papers are, this is a series of papers now that are in review where the team has been able to take a deep dive on impacts of drought on water quality, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and other factors and arriving at a conceptual model, which is new and advances our understanding in this area. We also have leadership from the Delta Science Program in, uh, in producing the state of Bay Delta Science with a very recent edition, but just published in January of this year on the ecosystem services and disservices of plants and algae. We're building out the bench of synthesis scientists. So the Delta Science Program has uh, partnered with the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis to provide a biennial opportunity for in-depth training on data science and synthesis work to, um, and then with the opportunity to apply those new skills in a synthesis working group. That's a hybrid of state, federal, and academic scientists. This doesn't encompass all of what these synthesis teams do. There's also work on harmful algal blooms that's done for um, regulatory reporting requirements. Um, there are small groups of people uh, authoring papers on trends in water temperature in the system. At the top of the tier, this distilled information, I think it's a standard practice almost now to have fact sheets, briefings, blogs, um, talks, brief your director on the, what you've learned from these synthesis teams. And there's been public outreach. There's a very wonderful special edition of Frontiers for Young Minds, a collection of 35 articles led by um, the editorial board that included Dr. Peggy Lehman and Dr. Ted Flynn to um, be able to tell stories about what we know and make this accessible to children. So this, I hope you'll agree, is a very healthy pyramid of synthesis and of providing information um, so what is the problem? And is there a problem? That's the question. And uh, I'm going to say, yes, there's a problem. Um, and we've heard about it now. We've heard it, I think, loud and clear. This has been recently summarized uh, by the Delta Independent Science Board, which we have at least one member um, today. Um, former member, thank you. Um, but author, one of the authors of this, of this report review of the monitoring enterprise in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Um, this was a five-year effort to inventory and assess the rigor, accessibility, coordination, ability of Delta monitoring programs to provide information. And there's a lot in this report that we could all stand to read, uh, but I want to call out two, two important issues that came forward. One of the exercises of this major report was to conduct a questionnaire um, to understand from stakeholders what, uh, what was monitoring doing well, where could it grow, where, where did it need improvement? And the, a major finding was that there's this monitoring management disconnect. 
And the questionnaire was summarized by the Independent Science Board. I'm going to just read here so um, you can read with me. Many written comments indicated that data analysis and synthesis are not well connected to management decisions. Second finding that I want to highlight is that there's no program for regular review of monitoring programs. We need something more formalized. The recommendation from the Independent Science Board reads that we need a more formal organizational structure that should facilitate routine monitoring evaluation to identify gaps, redundancies, and management relevance. And this evaluation should include independent review at least once out of every four years. Now, many of us in this room probably have a lot of thoughts about these conclusions. And the one of them, especially that first one for me, might be hard to hear. However, this is the feedback and there comes a time when as communicators and as scientists, our job is to listen. There's more to the story. Um, the Delta system is changing and you might say changing rapidly. This is just a basic cartoon of a classic um, IEP conceptual model where you have landscape attributes that are the context for ecosystem drivers and habitat attributes that then drive species responses. At every single tier of this conceptual model, we're seeing major changes. For example, some of them we're doing restoration. We're changing the bathymetry of the system with um, tens of thousands of acres of habitat restoration occurring. In the ecosystem driver tier, we're seeing a major signal that water clarity is increasing. And then in the habitat attributes tier, we know that aquatic vegetation is increasing. Some of the species that are increasing, we know are ecosystem engineers. They are going to bring further change beyond their occupancy in the system. And water temperature is changing. This is a recent synthesis that used that integrated uh, data set of discrete water temperatures to illustrate that water temperature is, is our warming. Um, and they didn't stop with just, uh, just telling us what the trend is. They also noted that where some of this restoration is planned and is planned to is happening, that's some of where we see uh, water temperature increasing at the highest rate. So in addition, what we're trying to manage and monitor is a moving goalpost. There's evolving priorities. These are four actions, major management actions that are relatively recent within the last 10 years. You have the Sassoon Marcellinity control gates to improve Delta smelt habitat quality in the summer and early fall. Um, in critically dry years, installation of a barrier to maintain freshwater conditions in, inter in the interior Delta. A major upgrade to regional sands wastewater treatment plan, which is removing ammonium from the effluent, which is changing the nutrient profile for the system. And then finally, Delta smelt supplementation, which has been experimental and more of a pilot scale the last two years and is planned for um, uh, scaling up. So for all of these, we need baseline data. And you can point to some of these actions, especially those first two, where there's already been use of the IEP monitoring network to evaluate these actions. Um, yet despite these changing priorities, um, monitoring programs are not regularly reviewed. Instead, reviews are generally done on an ad hoc basis. There's not a programmatic approach currently within IEP, and this leads to discomfort and erodes trust in the, in the monitoring network that is housed by IEP. And that leads to a feeling of IEP monitoring is really everybody's business, and that's because it is. It's a major public service. We used to have an IEP, a, an approach for doing monitoring reviews, and that was the science advisory group, but that's largely been sunsetted and isn't, um, hasn't been for some time a formal approach. And so now we have a lot of other activities that are working to look at how's this monitoring working? Is it enough? Um, is it meeting our management needs? IEP took on this, this question in a pilot review uh, that was completed in 2020. A lot of these were synthesis science folks, actually, and they worked to develop a statistical tool to evaluate what happens to surveys when you change them using uh, a set of three surveys that track demersal fishes. Others outside of IEP, though, have also been reviewing IEP programs. I've already talked about the extensive review from the Independent Science Board. There's also a five survey review that's been um, done by now and is ongoing by a subset of agencies. Um, commissioned by the Bureau and is leading to changes in five major Department of Fish and Wildlife surveys now. 
What you might not be as aware of is that the collaborative adaptive management team, um, the guidance of CSAMP is also taking a look. Um, that's been underway for a few years, had three parts. And that last part on the slide there is the public water agencies. Now assessment of what are our major, major management questions, identifying what's needed, asking whether monitoring programs are responsive to these needs, really identifying the metrics. So a lot of different activities, a lot of different attention coming from different parts of the community on what IEP monitoring is providing. And I wanna ask this question, can IEP do this? Can IEP lead the monitoring review process? I think what we're being asked to do is to conduct two simultaneous adaptive management wheels. One of them, which is the big goal, is adaptive management of the system, the flow, the habitat, and our ability to manage those. But that requires adaptive management of monitoring programs. Luckily, from the ISB report, we do have a framework for how to do this adaptive management of monitoring programs. And what I want to assert is that we know from the last five plus, even longer years, that we have a very productive and capable synthesis team. They've already tried looking at some of the monitoring reviews and, 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 and taken a, a stab at that. But um, I would say that we could build on this great foundation that we have and start addressing program questions to ensure that surveys are meeting management needs. There's some example questions that could be addressed. I won't go through them all, and that's certainly not a comprehensive list. Um, but would generally ask whether monitoring programs and um, what are the changes needed, what are new metrics that are needed to be included to be able to pick up important signals of environmental change. And I would say that a big piece that, not, that has not been in place recently is that they need direction. Synthesis, scientists, should not be expected to come up with the right questions on their own. Um, and they need to, uh, they need a steering committee and to work collaboratively with that steering committee to chart the course. So what would it look like if IEP were leading this? Um, well, I, uh, first I wanted to say that part of the reason that I suggest this is that I think IEP staff and with the synthesis capabilities that we know are there may have the deepest and most appropriate knowledge to bear on these questions and they may be able to do this most efficiently. And I say this not based on a hunch, but from helping with the CAM to monitoring assessment that I talked about on the previous slide. One of, that, one of that, that first effort regarded looking at lessons learned of how previous reviews have been conducted. And one of the things we learned is that it was really important to have folks that are engaged with the program itself to be a part of integral to the review. If they weren't, then many times the, pre the recommendations were difficult to adopt. So again, what would it look like if IEP were to do this? Well, I think we need a clear roadmap. That's what, what this would look like, what themes would be taken on, what programs are gonna be reviewed and when, and what does that iteration cycle look like? We need to have dedicated synthesis staff to this. This can't be competing with other job responsibilities. Should it be only synthesis staff? No, it definitely needs external independent review. And that's where there's a peer review arm of the Delta Science program that is well positioned to take this on. It needs to be transparent. What if there were a space on the IEP website where it said, hey, this is how we take care of our monitoring programs and make sure they're up to date. That's what this looks like. And one of the things that I wanna spend just the last few minutes talking about is effective stakeholder engagement. That's really important and I think um, been missing. Um, I Another lesson learned from that camped review of how monitoring reviews have been conducted was that a lot of times in reviews, people thought they were doing effective stakeholder engagement, but they actually weren't. They were telling stakeholders what they were doing, but they weren't engaging them. And that's where I want to point to an example that I heard about just recently from Jeremy Gaeta, who comes from the synthesis team at CDFW, who experimented with a different model for stakeholder engagement. And he gave me these next few slides to um, help me explain this process. First, I need to explain briefly that the goal of this project was to come up with a modeling tool that would help predict salvage of winter run Chinook salmon before they're detected at the water projects. Um, this was a requirement of the incidental take permit for the state water project issued by CDFW. 
And the charge was to develop this tool, not only develop the tool, but make sure it's accurate, make sure it's useful. And key here resonates that this was something that stakeholders and agency leads could adopt because they would know about it, they would understand it. And he had to depart, he and his team had to depart from what IEP traditionally has done for stakeholder engagement, which looks something like this for a sample of three years. You might expect stakeholders to be present at project work teams, receive updates at annual workshops. There's a quarterly stakeholder meeting where the agenda is fairly general and there's time for questions and a little dialogue. I'm gonna argue that this is um, better, a lot better than not doing anything at all. However, it is sort of like being on the CC line of emails. It's updates. If I'm taking on a major project, I talk to my boss about it <laughs> and we have a conversation and that's not quite what's been happening. So Jeremy Gaeta and his team, which included um, Brian Maharshda and Trin Nguyen at also at CDFW, Brian Maharshda, the Bureau, um, took a much more targeted approach. They hand selected a stakeholder group that included the right expertise that they needed. And that included water project operators, op operation, operation leads for water projects, winter run Chinook salmon experts, technical modeling expertise, and use this group as an advisory team. This was not an independent group. This was an advisory team that really had a stake in the game. And they helped these PIs with uh, the critical project decisions like the modeling approach, the covariates to include. They met early and often. And by engaging this group, this group could then become communicators for the project. They could be ambassadors. And I would argue that this um, approach more than, this wasn't just stakeholder engagement. This was entering into a partnership that I think helped with resonating, um, bringing that this tool to be something that could be really adopted. So um, in a nutshell, my take home messages are, we need to get serious about these dual adaptive management wheels and paying special attention to the adaptive management wheel of monitoring. It's the bread of IEP, it's the pillar, it needs to be solid. And we need to engage our super strong, super productive synthesis team for this task and they need to have clear direction. With this clear direction, if they know the questions that are supposed to be asked and there's buy-in and there's good stakeholder engagement, they can position monitoring programs to be as powerful as they can be for driving adaptive management. And then I think, again, let's be targeted and careful about stakeholder engagement. Let's turn stakeholder engagement meetings into partnership meetings that articulate questions, frame the approach, and together we interpret the, what, what these um, our synthesis results mean. And with that, I am finished. Thank you so much for the time. And uh, apologies if I went over, but I really appreciate the time here today. Thanks for trusting me with this time. So everyone, please, Feel free to come down, grab a seat. I know a lot of people have been stuck behind traffic and so now you're making your way through this traffic. Um, to close out our plenary speech, uh, uh, session, sorry, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jay Lund. And again, I'm gonna read so I don't mess up your titles. He's the vice director for the Center of Watershed Sciences at UC Davis, where he's also a distinguished professor of civil, en em civil and environmental engineering. and as we mentioned before, a previous member of the Delta Independent Science Board and actually the chair as well. So welcome, Jay. Thank you. It, it's a real pleasure to be here in this August group. Um, I've been I've come to <clears throat> IEP meetings periodically over my 30 some years um, at Davis and in the system. I first started to go to IEP meetings uh, when they were in a Cellamar, which I think we all regret that they're no longer there, uh, those of you that have been there. Um, and when I started to go to those meetings, they were joint meetings or overlapping meetings, I should say, with uh, California Water Environment Modeling Forum. So a bunch of modelers and a bunch of eco ecologists. And, and as I rose in the, organ in, in the counterpart organization of QEMF, 
uh, I thought, well, I should really sit in on the sessions, which I found always very interesting. A at the time in the late 1990s, um, each IEP session seemed to begin with what, what I started to call the annual reading of the entrails. <clears throat> Those of you that were there might recall that there was an annual review of what we found in the stomachs of different kinds of fish in different kinds of places. And I thought, well, this is a, these are different approaches to science. And as Louise talked about, monitoring is really essential. Empirical knowledge is really essential. Part of our problem in the big sense, I think, is that we have a very empirical kind of knowledge that we're pursuing mostly on the ecology side. Although it's as as Louise has shown, it has certainly gotten better from the reading of the entrails stage uh, that I, that I was confronted with early on, and the modeling people who are really focused on mechanisms, mechanistic kind of approaches, hydrodynamics, conservation of mass, energy, momentum, calculations, things like that. Knowledge really consists of both those types of knowledge. The kinds of knowledge we need to actually work on these problems needs both of those and they need to come together. So I, I will uh, encourage IEP as I will encourage QEMF to integrate more of the other kind of knowledge because that's really what the problem cares about is how we bring this together. This is, I guess, the first uh, IEP meeting since COVID that's all that's substantially in person, but only half in person. Apparently about half of it is, is virtual. And COVID is a really nice example of many, of, of quite a few things. It's an example of failures and innovations that come from failure. If you had said in 2019, we want to have the IEP meeting be halfway remote, you know, where people can participate remotely, people would have told you it's impossible. It can't be done. In terms of science communication, in terms of synthesis communications, we would just have been told it can't be done. And, and we're seeing, in addition to all the tragedies of COVID, I think some innovations that come from the, our failures to manage this public health emergency. Um, so that we're ho hopefully one of the lessons for us is that things that we used to think, or maybe today we think are impossible, actually are possible if we have a, a good focus, focus failure in our case, this case, that forces us to do what we had previously thought of being impossible. So now to my talk. Um, Droughts, floods, droughts, and climate change, oh my. So this is, comes from lions and tigers and bears, oh my, or, or the one, wonderful Far Side cartoon for those of you that are old enough, the um, spiders, frogs, insecticides, oh my, with two you know, insectic, insects walking down their path. Um, I'm gonna, I'll give you the conclusions before I get to the meat. Fortunately, as you all know by now, this drought is largely, largely over hydrologically, but we have some very long legacy effects that we're gonna see certainly ecologically as well as in groundwater and some other ways. The Delta has high rates of variability and change in many ways. And I think uh, both Steve and Louise pointed this out in their talks and, and something that's fairly commonly known. As, as Steve pointed out, and I think it's really right, we're obsessed these days with climate change, whereas really it's climate change is part of a bigger, several bigger, I think, trends in our societies, our economies, and, uh, and our ecosystems. Native ecosystems uh, are mostly on an unpromising trajectory. I think I'll put that charitably that way, uh, as, as Louise and others have pointed out. I, I wanna be a little bit more forceful and, and say that our Delta science and management are not organized or resourced to succeed quickly enough with this problem. I don't think this is the fault of any individual. I think it's partly a structural issue that we can try to solve, but we're largely gonna to have to live with because we can't, as Arnold Schwarzenegger tried to do, we can't rearrange the boxes very well. That's well beyond our pay grade and really beyond anybody's pay grade because as someone pointed out earlier, Nobody really is in charge uh, of, of the big picture. Even if we can plan and prepare proactively, 
we're gonna need to prepare for failures. In the voluntary agreements and in all of our plans and, and, and discussions with policymakers, they're thinking that, oh, we can come up with a plan and once we implement the plan, it will be a success and there will not be a failure. Does anybody really believe that? I mean, these are really complex systems where we don't know very much about what's going on. If there is no failure that we detect, it probably means we haven't been looking, right? And we should expect there to be failures. In fact, I would argue from, from the engineering side of water management and over California's history, our successes have been built on piles of failures, okay? The only reasons we've made changes, big, big changes, strategic changes in our water system from the human side is because of failures. We should expect to see at least that kind of failure rate on the ecological side, where we only have a few decades worth of trying to solve those problems. Whereas with water supply, flood control, we've been trying to solve those problems for a thousand years. And only in the last hundred years have we had any success. So we need to prepare for failures. And in fact, utilize those failures to help us make improvements, strategic improvements. That's the only kind of thing that'll help you rearrange the boxes is failures. Frequent failures have always shaped California water policies and plans and managing the trade-offs and adaptive management can, can really help on all of this. Oh, I'm supposed to end at 9.30, okay. The drought's over. You can see in these plots how um, we've got a lot of water now. We have even more down in the San Joaquin and Tulare basins. This chart is um, forecasts of uh, San Joaquin River flows of Renalis as of yesterday. What I want you to, 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 do, to do here is, it, this is a nice illustration, I think, of the combination of mechanistic and empirical knowledge, where you have physically-based models of flow, a relatively easy variable for us to work with. We've been work, trying to figure out flow for several hundred years. This is how good we've gotten. It has empirical aspects. We have roughnesses of channels and you know all kinds of other empirical aspects that go into those models. How far out can we forecast these flows? Eh, a day or so, a few days, but after about seven to 10 days, it's all mayhem. It's basically the historical future. And there's some mathematical reasons why I don't think we're gonna get much better than this, no matter how much we invest in flow forecasting. Um, this just shows the reservoir side of it. Uh, I wanna illustrate this as, it, this is a very nice recent depiction of a uh, way of, of showing um, the amount of water we have stored in reservoirs in the state. Uh, and you can see what's, it's improved considerably uh, over time this, this season. This, chain, this ecosystem and our water management system have to deal with an environment full of variability and change. There is um, there's probably no, or very few anyway, other water systems, ecosystems that have seen more, have to deal with more inherent variability, natural variability, enhanced natural variability that climate change is bringing us and underlying change. In the last hundred years, California has changed its fundamental economic structure several times. That fundamentally changes the shape of our water demands, the kind of water demands and the politics that drives the whole system. We've gone from being a very poor society to being one of the world's richest societies. That has something to do with why we care about ecosystems now when we didn't so much before. We have our, the variability in the system is at many different time scales. We have a tidal time scale, a couple of times a day, huge ranges in flows. Seasonal time scale, wet season, dry season, the like. Floods and drought years, flood years, drought years. So we have a, a little longer time scale of variability in that. Levy reliability. We have to deal with occasional levy failures in this system. 
And then we have the human variability of budgets and election cycles and appointees to uh, leadership in the different or many different organizations that are here. So we have a lot of variability that affects all of our little plans and all of our little monitoring programs and all of our modeling efforts and our ability to, to develop that in a way that serves the whole community. In addition to those forms of variability, those diverse forms of variability, I'll add, uh, we have changes in ecosystems and the environment. Certainly climate is a major one, species composition with invasive species. Um, and then illustrated up here, channel geometry and connectivity. We've seen, I think, with the recent uh, adoption of the um, West Falls River bar barriers that we should also be thinking about making permanent and temporary changes to the channel geometries in the Delta. This is something that's really been neglected. It's something that we have a lot of technological capability to look at, but I don't know if we have the political will to look at it because people get used to things being this one spatial arrangement. But as we can see, I think from these pictures from before human redevelopment of the Delta and the current one, we fundamentally altered that physical landscape in, in, in ways that probably are not God given, right? We might be able to think of some better ways to do it. And we have the technology, I think, to do that. Changes in our understanding over time. Again, we've come a tremendous way, I think, in IEP and in the modeling world in improving our understanding of this system, of elements of the system. I'm not sure we've come that far in terms of synthesis, not certainly not as far in synthesis as we have in the pieces that are necessary for a bigger synthesis. Again, I, I mentioned before, changes in economic structure and, and water demands are really important. Urban water demands are not growing. I don't, I think they were, if anything, are likely to shrink over time in California. Agricultural water demands are probably plateaued. They're probably all, also gonna have to shrink over time if, if only to meet the uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And then we have all kinds of political and regulatory changes, uh, voluntary agreements, things like that. If, there's, if the voluntary agreements don't work, there's gonna be, have to be one or two or three or four other things that we have to try before we find something that's more likely to work. The state of the ecosystems, I don't need to tell you much about this. Um, very unpromising trajectory for many species, um, largely worsening conditions into the future despite very you know, sizable regulatory structures, agencies, and resources that are poured into this. Um, I, I would agree that if we hadn't done what we have done, it will be even worse. But I don't think we've done enough, and I don't think what we have done has been very well crafted from an engineering perspective or a larger scientific perspective. It has to be driven in many ways uh, politically. We've done relatively little preparation for variability and change. The ecosystems had to evolve in this highly variable system. We're now seeing some studies, as Louise mentioned, of what's happening during droughts with the ecosystem. Um, and, and certainly uh, Ted, one of Ted's really seminal contributions intellectually to the management of the system is what happens during floods. So really this system is driven by floods and droughts. Our science and our integration of science needs to reflect that both empirically and mechanistically. Our management tends to be very myopic in a highly variable system that often leads you astray. We have a, a management ethos and in management and in law that is really reactive. We want bad things not to happen we don't really think very much about what's the good thing we want to happen. That's a harder discussion politically, socially, and, and a little bit harder uh, um, scientifically. The organization of, of ecosystem management lacks sustainable accountability resources and mutually supporting authorities. We have, you, know, you could cover this with logos of all the different agencies involved in this ecosystem. It's hard, it's hard to see how this system could really work. If you were to do a similar kind of a logo fest for safe drinking water, you would see state, federal, local agencies, consulting firms, all with very definite 
and mutually accountable, mutually supporting relationships, including funding that sustain that whole thing. So I think you can understand how to make ecosystem management as successful as safe drinking water management, which is still not perfect, but it's 98% perfect compared to whatever percent perfect you would have to say for ecosystem management. A lot of it is how do you build the relationships among the institutions? Not blowing up boxes, but creating synergies across the boxes so that they have mutually supporting roles in a larger, well-organized, science-based context. It took us a couple of hundred years or so to get that in safe drinking water, and we're still fine-tuning it, and you always will fine-tune it, uh, but I don't think we're nearly there. The closest I've seen in ecosystem management in this state is the Central Valley Joint Venture for Waterbirds, where you have a, an organization that ties together the different private NGO, state, federal, regional um, authorities, uh, and, and they produce common plans and, and the like, and, and lots of mutually sustaining relationships. In this grand adventure that we are all on, um, and, and particularly the young people here that you will be on over the course of your career, you're gonna see failures. This is, failures are not something to run away from. Failures are things to run towards because they provide a lot of opportunities. Um, and you're gonna have them anyway. So when there's an earthquake anywhere in the world, seismic earthquake, the geotech faculty, the structures faculty in my department at Davis, they're gone. They've gone to see how things fail so that they can improve the building codes and the building construction and, the, and that ecosystem of people that provides earthquake safety. We should be, have a similar interest in failure here. Failures bring resources. They bring focus, both within agencies and between agencies. They're an educational opportunity. We talk about engaging stakeholders. They're gosh darn busy people. They really don't have much patience for us most of the time, but bring them a failure, they will at least give you the time of day. So take advantage of that. So sometimes you can get action out of that. But the actions that you would like to see coming out of failures, they have to basically occur within a short window of opportunity before those busy stakeholders get diverted to many other things that they have to also be concerned with. So our preparations for failure have to be able to make reactions to failure quicker so that we can be more effective and a little bit more farsighted in how we incrementally react to, um, to these failures. The other big problem that, that I think we cannot avoid is our governance very decentralized, which is good in many ways, but bad in some ways, uh, has difficulty deciding what kind of ecosystem we want. It's easy to say we should go back to the past, make the ecosystem great again. You can't do that. No, you can't do that. In fact, you probably wouldn't want to given the climate change that's happening exogenously. Okay, so you can't make the ecosystem great again. What can you do? Our scientists must, cannot make those decisions, but we can help frame that discussion. We can help inform that discussion. And that's probably the bravest and perhaps most essential thing that we can do strategically. Who else is better to frame that than, than people that study this all the time? The new Delta is gonna be different. This is something we did. This is from our 2008 study, one of our 2008 studies. Adaptive management. People say the word adaptive management when they, for, to mean all kinds of things. They usually say it meaning we promise to fix it later. Okay. And it can have very many other meanings. I like the original meaning um, from the 1978 work um, that has modeling at the center of it, where you build models, you know the models are wrong, you know they're imperfect, they're not accurate completely, but they do help get your head together. They help you provide a framework for combining mechanistic knowledge and empirical knowledge and improving mechanistic knowledge and empirical knowledge in a systematic way that is, anyone who's done modeling knows that modeling is not completely transparent, but it's probably more transparent than any other alternative. 
and use that to, to improve and test our thinking over time. Um, I was going to talk about trade-offs, but I, I'll do this very abbreviated. We have lots of different interests in this system, fish and money being two of them. We have, how many of you have seen Pareto optimality curves? I, I saw a science, Delta Science thing a few years ago. So here you plot up, each of these stars is a different solution. We have solutions that each solution gives you a different amount of money, a different amount of fish. We like both fish and money. So the solutions that are interior, they're inferior. The ones out on the edge, they have an edge. Okay, there we go. That's like my best I can do. And, and the slope at the point of the trade-offs that you decide on, that, that shows how much, that's your trade-off between those two objectives. You can imagine that in 47 dimensions, but don't. The shape of that trade-off curve is important for the politics and the game theory of the re resolution of these ecosystem problems. Where you have a nice convex shape like this, concave shape like this. Um, there's reasons for compromise. If it's a, the opposite, if it's a con convex shape, then you, you really have people that want money and people that want fish have a hard time compromising. And so we wanna to try to avoid that. We wanna to try to have as much concavity in these shapes as possible. We have alternatives to do this. We can manage flows, we can manage habitat, we can do all kinds of things. Um, and part of our difficulty and part of our challenge is how do we add things like adding floodplain habitat to change the shapes of these trade-off curves and, and create more knees. So the, the sharper the knee in these trade-off curves, the more attractive that knee solution is. So uh, we have a paper on this, but I'll talk about that. But because she's standing up, I know I'm out of time. And so it's a good thing that I talked about the conclusions at the summary at the beginning. And then of course, because I'm a professor, here's some further readings. Thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Jay. Thanks everyone. Um, that concludes our first session for the day. So please feel free to take a break and we'll see you back at, at 9.50 for session two, Delta Smelt experimental release. Thanks.
Hi, everyone. Could I welcome you back into the auditorium and go ahead and take a seat? That was not 20 minutes, but. All right, everyone, welcome back. Uh, we had a short break and we're going to try to stick to our schedule here so that folks can check out the talks as they're scheduled in case they're logging in on the, on the Zoom application. Um, welcome to session two, Delta Smelt Experimental Release. My name is Catherine Sun. I'm uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'll be co-moderating this talk with Brian Schreier from DWR. So go ahead, um, grab your seats and while you're doing that, I'll give a quick introduction for the five talks we've got lined up for you today. The session will run until 1130. Um, I'll start off with a brief overview on experimental release and just to catch folks up on the program um, to create a good launching pad for the rest of our talks here. Um, next, I'll hand it over to Brian Trier and he'll discuss the soft release design planning and initial observations of experimental release. Next up, we'll have Fred Fira with the USGS to discuss fish behavior during Delta smelt experimental releases as inferred by Arizona. And then we'll have Trishel Temple and Britt Davis to talk about enclosure studies that have informed experimental release. And then we'll have Steve Slater with CDFW to round off the talk with CDFW monitoring design review and fall midwater trawl survey updates. So we've got a great session for you. We hope you stick around till 1130. I'm gonna go, go ahead and just dive into my talk here in the interest of time. Um, so again, I'm Catherine Sun. I'm the coordinator for the experimental release project with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. I'll be catching folks up on what we've been up to for the past two years and I know a lot of folks have seen some version of this presentation before, so thanks for joining again, and we're excited to share with the rest of the broader IEP community as well. So um, the Delta Smelt Experimental Release Project, what is it? It's a three-year project that was proposed by the agencies to explore the basics that are needed to build up to a Delta Smelt Supplementation Program, and that need really came about due to the 2019 long-term water operations consultation and biological opinion in which Reclamation and DWR proposed to support the annual supplementation of Delta smelt and the eventual construction and operation of a Delta smelt production facility by 2030. So this project is really our first attempt at release of Delta smelt back into the wild environment. So we are really just trying to answer the most basic of questions with this pilot program of how do we, how the heck do we do this? So we focused a lot in year one on logistical learning and just proof of concept. You know, what, what's an efficient and an effective way for our agencies to release fish? And then how can we track that progress and make improvements using tools like tagging strategies, which we were able to implement this past year for year two of our project? The experimental release technical team or the ERTT is the multi-agency team that's been tasked with the planning and implementation of experimental release. And with this partnership with our six agencies and entities you see up on the screen, we've been able to tap into a lot of different areas of expertise in order to um, inform our study questions and also to continually refine our release strategies. So acknowledgements, I really could spend my entire talk on just reading the names on this slide. So thank you. You know, this doesn't even begin to cover everyone who, you know, we've we've shared a donut on the boat dock and I forgot your last name, but you know what, you're not forgotten. Um, so thank you to everyone who made this project a reality and you know who you are, you tagged a carboy, um, I'm sorry, you tagged a fish, you recorded a carboy, you loaded a carboy, you wrote a permit, you funded an agreement, you towed the boat that broke down in the ship channel. So really thank you to everyone um, who made this project happen. So a quick overview on what we did in year one, we completed our first year of experimental release last year, though the planning did begin in 2021 and the release spanned the winter of December 2021 through February of 2022. 
a total of 55,733 subadult Delta smelt were released across the North Delta arc at three release locations, um, as indicated by the yellow stars on the map. The Rio Vista in the center, deep water ship channel to the north, and then Montezuma Slough in Sassoon Marsh to the west. Most of these fish were hard released into the environment off of boats, and then we were also able to pilot a soft release cage mechanism um, with an acclimation period associated that we piloted for the first time at Rio Vista only. So what is hard release and what does that look like? Well, hard release really starts with the transport of Delta smelt from the UC Davis FCCL or the Fish Conservation and Culture Laboratory to the marina where we then load them onto boats and then we take these boats out into the channel. Um, these containers you see on the screen are called carboys and then these carboys are then gently lowered into the channel for a gentle water to water transfer. And from that moment, the fish are free swimming in the environment. And from start to finish, uh, hard release takes about two, two full field days to move a full release group into the water. And for context, each one of these carboys carries about 200 delta smelt comfortably. And soft release really relies on the same transportation principles, except that fish are then loaded into these floating enclosures that you see. They'll sit in the channel so that fish can acclimate for 24 to 48 hours. And after that acclimation period, the cages are then sunk in a way that fish just escape out the opening from the top. From start to finish, this method does require up to five days to wrap in the cage installation, the fish loading, the acclimation, and also the fish, um, the cage retrieval. So how do we know what's going on down there? Well, uh, for year one, we had USGS out there with us. Um, one of this really valuable tool we had was ARIS imaging, which involves rigging some sonar cameras to a boat that's alongside of release and trying to capture that fish behavior during the release event. So there was uh, a ton of uh, footage to work through, but we've been able to capture some of the fish behaviors during those release methods that will hopefully inform how we move forward with this. And Fred's talk coming up in a bit is going to cover that in depth. So um, with regards to the year one monitoring, um, what was the response? And I might start here by saying that we did not implement any extra monitoring for this project. We relied solely on the existing um, IEP surveys such as EDSM and SKT and other studies to uh, inform us if they were going to catch one of our released fish. So during year one, we recaptured 78 Delta smelt over a four to five month period. And that indicated that post-release survival in the Delta is promising and that fish were able to disperse from our release sites, as you can see the spread of red dots that indicated on the map. Um, we didn't have the resources for batch tagging to differentiate release groups or release methods, but that was something we built in for year two. And we'll discuss that in just a bit. And one last thing to point out is that um, reduced travel times and confinement periods for the smell inside of the carboys do influence our release site priorities when considering they're loaded at the FCCL, which is down in the South Delta, and then they have to get trucked up to these sites. So if we're noticing that dissolved oxygen levels are dropping too dramatically, it's really in our interest to release them as soon as possible into the environment. So given some of our limited resources, um, and the road flooding with some of the, the mega storms that we saw in early January, uh, we, we did not use Montezuma Slough for year two, which we'll cover in a second here. And then one last thing to point out from the year one monitoring is uh, there's a, a small blue mark in the center of the map. And that blue mark represents the, the one wild Delta smelt that was caught during um, the winter of 2021 through 2022 by um, surveys out on the water. So that kind of says to me, had experimental release not occurred, that individual data point um, would have been representative of the available wild spawning stock for that year. So you can see that um, experimental release, I think, came right in time. So moving on to a quick overview of what we did for year two, 
Um, for this cohort year, we had a slightly reduced survival at the FCCL in the production process. So we had slightly fewer fish available to release compared to year one. But um, I'd note that that was well within the expected variable um, production survival. So for this year, we released a total of 43,705 Delta smelt. We just finished at the end of this January. So we are fresh off of year two and we were able to continue with hard and soft release. And then we were also able to try a, an additional method of hard release um, using a fish haul trailer that was provided by DWR. Um, as I mentioned before, a fundamental improvement in the experimental release this year is the implementation of the batch tagging. So these are our six tag groups um, that we utilized for this year so that we could identify recaptures to the release sites and also by release type. So this was really important. And so far, um, all the fish that are coming in from the field, we've been able to categorize categorize them back into their respective release dates and release methods. Um, here we have the new release method, which is the fish haul trailer. Um, this was really more of a last minute opportunity that came up, so we're glad that we got to try that. A little over 3,000 fish were loaded into this um, trailer, and then it was backed up right to a boat ramp at Rio Vista. And that whole process from backing the truck up to the last fish being free swimming in the environment, it took under 15 minutes. So I think the, the time and labor savings on this would be, um, it's, it's just phenomenal. And we do need to continue to look into this and we're pretty excited about it. Um, this was a form of hard release since the fish did not have any acclimation time in the river. And another big difference is that, you know, it was right off a boat ramp um, along the shoreline whereas our other carboy releases happen in the river channel. So we're really excited about this. And we'd like to, as we're talking about scaling up our release, we are excited to look into more methods like this. Um, now we'll quickly revisit the available feedback mechanisms for year two. We still have Eris on board, but now we've also built in batch tagging, which is gonna tell us a lot about our recaptures. And then we also have the stress study, which is one of the enclosure studies that was conducted in parallel to the first release event that we had conducted at Rio Vista last November. So um, more on that talk with Trishel and Britt later, so stick around. Here's a map of um, the recaptures from year two monitoring to date. This spans from December, 2022, through the present day. And the good news is that so far we've recovered at least one of every release type. So that's really good news. And we hope to get some more recaptures before the end of the adult season. So maybe in the next month or so, um, we'll be getting a couple more. So this is not a complete data set yet on year two, but we wanted to share uh, what we've seen so far. Um, so the longest observed period is uh, the longest observed period between the release and the recapture of the fish is about 47 days right now. So we're feeling pretty good about their ability to survive and disperse um, in the Delta post-release. And this is all just, you know, as I said, preliminary information at this point. Um, I think what's also promising is that it's not reflected on this map, but we did also catch five unmarked fish in this, uh, in this current season. And those five unmarked fish are presumably offspring of fish that we received last year. You know, five by no means is a, is a ringer to save the species, but I think it's a lot more than one fish that we had observed last year. So we're moving the needle in the right direction. So, so far for year two, when we're speaking about our release methods, we are catching them in about the same proportion of the, the methods that we had released them, which is really exciting and something we just could not have known in year one without the tagging. So on, on the left there, that's the, the total released um, that encompasses the 43,000 fish. And on the right is all the fish that we've recaptured, um, divvied back up into the methods that we've uh, that they were released. So it's an early indication that they might be surviving about the same out there post-release, but there's tons more data to dig through at this point. 
um, that we just haven't had the time to look through yet. Um, we got we have things like environmental environmental conditions, um, body conditions, genetics, and much more that's still in the works and yet to come. We know that folks are pretty interested in the genetic side of this effort as well. And while we're still early days in getting that data back, what we do know is that when we catch an adult delta smelt that we released, so it has a tag, we can identify parentage because we have known spawners um, at the facility that produced this year's cohort. However, when we catch a wild origin adult delta smelt, um, a fish without a tag, and now starting this year, that can include offspring from hatchery fish last year. We don't have their parents' DNA on file to compare to, and thus with our current methods, we cannot identify their parentage or grandparentage. And then when it comes to larval delta smelt, uh, current techniques also limit our ability to extract genetic information, namely the standard formalin preservation methods that we have for larval sampling. So we do have methods in development to try to address both of these things, um, and we hope to be able to share some good news in the future and some adv advancements on these methods. So to wrap up here, what are our key takeaways that we learned from the first two years of experimental release? Well, we know that fish survive the transport process, and we know that they were able to disperse and persist in the wild for at least a couple of weeks to a couple of months. And we also learned that reproduction of hatchery in the hatchery fish in the wild is likely based on the 2022 cohort fish that were collected. And then when we think back to our primary goals, we just it just drills back home that we learned that larger scale solutions are necessary to tackle delta smelt supplementation. The process with the carboys that you see in the photos, um, each of these moving 200 fish and weighing about 200 pounds, it's way labor intensive. It takes a lot of time and a lot of staff. So we're hoping to move toward a future of efficiency while maintaining fish survival in the process. And um, this is my last slide to, to wrap up, you know, what's next? We plan to explore those larger scale release techniques. Um, and as well, we are going to be gradually ramping up our production numbers in the future. So as called for in the 2019 ROC LTO consultation and biological opinion, we're moving toward an initial target of 125,000 fish for supplementation. We will not be doing that this next year, but um, we do hope to scale up to 75,000 fish, which is 20,000 more than we had uh, last year, and I would say 20,000 more problems than we had last year. So we have our work cut out for us, and um, we hope to share a lot more in the future. And with that, I'll wrap up, and we can take a few brief questions before we move on to the next talk. Thank you. Yeah, question in the audience, and then we can flip to the Zoom. So the question is, if we're um, planning to do supplementation efforts in Montezuma Slough in the future, I think that's definitely on the table. We have not um, planned out, you know, what year to year it looks like, but there are definitely opportunities, I think, in different water years. And I think Montezuma Slough being one of those ideal sites where we've been catching Delta smelt for years, I think that's something we'd love to explore. It's just a little bit further from the facility, so not um, really ideal for what we're trying out in the early stages. All right, so with that, can we take one more or should we move on? Okay, we'll move on, we'll move on. We're on, we're on, um, we're on time here, but if we have some time at the end, we can go ahead and take more questions. So let's see. And next up we have Brian Schreier. Hey everybody, I'm uh, Brian Trier with Department of Water Resources, uh, here to talk to you about the soft release components of the Delta Smelt experimental releases that uh, Catherine mentioned. And very much in line with what Catherine uh, mentioned, this really does take not even a small army, kind of a large army to make all this happen. So a huge amount of gratitude to go out to all the folks uh, involved with this. Um, and before I get really into this with Delta Smelt, I just want to get everybody on the same page of what we're talking about with hard and soft release here. So 
um, part in the introduction of mammals. We uh, have a picture here on the left of a hard released individual. So we have uh, an individual being released from its transport container immediately upon arrival to the release location. Uh, on the right, we have an example of a soft release where we have an individual that's been uh, placed in a cage in its release environment, allowed to acclimate and recover from transport stress, and then is released. Uh, I should also take a brief pause to assure everybody, because I'm sure you're worried, we did not have barking dogs and firearms present with Delta smell hard releases. Um, trust us, we did not think that would be helpful. Uh, but why, why in the heck are we talking about this? So why are we asking this question for Delta smelt? And really, the ultimate goal here of evaluating hard and soft release is to maximize the efficiency of releases while also promoting the success of these released smelt. So if we look to the published literature, um, what, what do we find with this? So we, we see that we have evaluations of hard versus soft release across a wide variety of taxa, from mammals to birds to reptiles and fish. Uh, and we have series of metadata analyses that have looked at this across uh, all the different published literature. And really some key things come out from this. One is that it's very taxa specific. Um, there are examples of hard release being better uh, for released individuals. There's examples of no difference. And there's examples of soft release having benefits. On the whole, there is a uh, general concurrence that soft release tends to be better, uh, but it is very taxa specific. Um, and that mechanism for soft release being better is tends to demonstrate itself as uh, individuals dispersing less uh, further, uh, shorter distances from the release location. Uh, so going back to Delta smelt for soft releases, what is our hypotheses about what are the mechanisms that happen here? So we have first that we would expect that for soft release, uh, fish would school uh, better upon release, fish would stay, tend to stay better, uh, closer together. Uh, we would also expect that we might see some modest improvement in survival with soft release due to fish schooling together and possibly having lower stress upon release. Uh, and we see that uh, we would expect fish by soft release would disperse shorter distances from the release location compared to hard release. Uh, and I'll be referring back to these hypotheses um, as I go through the talk. So I've got some handy symbology here on the left uh, to help keep that organized. Um, but I also kind of want to give you an appreciation for what the engineering that goes into how these soft releases work. And really a huge shout out to UC Davis and in particular Dennis Cockrell here for being the brains behind this whole apparatus. Uh, so these enclosures are non-trivial. We're talking about seven feet in diameter, five feet tall. Um, hard to move and put in location, but uh, able to hold about 3,000 fish per release event. And we have multiple of these cages uh, that we deploy. So we start off with fish acclimating for 24 to 48 hours, up to uh, hopefully 72 hours in the future in these cages. When we start to do a release event, we have these buoyancy tanks on the side of the cages that start to fill with water. Uh, the cage then starts to sink. Um, we've got our Aris boat, you can see in the, the photo here from USGS that's monitoring uh, the environment. When that cage sinks uh, all the way to the end of its tethers, so there's mooring buoys that keep it from sinking all the way to the bottom of the channel, uh, fish then are able to move out of the top into the environment. And it's probably more accurate to say that the cage sinks around them and then they can move laterally into the environment. Uh, then after a period of time, when we're sure that uh, all the fish have left, we are able to use compressed air to refloat these cages and they are then ready to go for the next uh, go around. Uh, I also want to take a moment and as Catherine did revisit the tools that we have for assessing differences here. Um, how are we getting information to actually make quantifiable comparisons between soft and hard release? So one that you've already heard quite a bit about is that we have this ARIS underwater imagery um, led by USGS where we can look at the uh, behavior of fish and the schooling behavior and the potential for predation in the immediate vicinity in the seconds to maybe minute after a release event. Uh, we also have recaptures in our long-term monitoring programs, uh, but this is really only valuable for this purpose if we pair it with uh, differential tagging for each release type and release event. 
Uh, and we've been doing that with VIE tags, visual, visual implant elastomer tags. Um, but really being able to recapture those fish uh, in the environment gives us a good idea of how they're dispersing distance from release site, gives us a good idea about how close they are together, the distance among the recaptures for each uh, batch, and then the relative rates of recapture uh, can speak to survival. Uh, and then looking forward, we have uh, some new tools that we're hoping to get online to help speak to this difference as well. So one is evaluating acoustic tags for Delta smelt. Uh, there's currently a funded Prop 1 with UC Davis and ICF that is working on this uh, as we speak. Uh, and then the genetic tools that Catherine mentioned as well, so that really this is the gold standard for evaluating relative success of different release methods, is what are those uh, respective groups of fish doing when it comes to contributing to the next generation. So we've been able to do soft release uh, paired with hard release for two years now. So in year one, uh, we did not have that uh, differential tagging. So there is no results to speak to the relative effectiveness, but we did learn a tremendous amount about how to not deploy these giant cages in the river, uh, watching them drag 600 pounds of anchors downstream as we watched helplessly was uh, a learning experience. Um, so we came back in year two with a lot of improvements to our methodology, improvements in our anchoring system, uh, improvements in our transportation and deployment system that really made everything go a lot smoother. We were able to do two paired hard and soft releases, one in Rio Vista in the end of November and one in the Deepwater Ship Channel in January. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about that one from Rio Vista because we had very low recapture rates from both the hard and soft release at that location. So if we then go to a map, um, we've got a very lot of, a lot of very small uh, symbols on this map. So I'll draw your attention to a couple, uh, a couple key takeaways here. Uh, one is that we did have uh, fish from releases show up at salvage this year, um, as well as last year, but uh, some this year. The uh, relative proportion here, we, we saw approximately 25% of our total recaptures were at salvage. Uh, notably for the purposes of evaluating hard and soft release, all of those were from various hard releases. Uh, we did not have any soft release fish show up at salvage. Um, if I draw your attention to the North Delta, we do have uh, quite a few points there that represent uh, deep water ship channel hard releases and that star represents the release location itself. So we had hard release fish from the deep water ship channel that seemed to be hanging out in the North Delta. Uh, although notably, a couple of those did end up down at salvage as well. Uh, and then we do have our deepwater ship channel soft release that while a decent distance away downstream from their release location, all seem to be very close to each other. So how do we take this information and start to look at it in a more quantifiable way? Well, one approach that we took was to calculate the waterway distances between the individual recaps for any given batch and then the distance from each recap to its release site, and then we can plot those distances uh, on a figure. So we have those distances here in meters. For this slide, we've, we're looking at the distance from uh, each recap to its corresponding release site. Uh, and the three different batches we have are that hard release in January at Rio Vista, the hard release at the Deepwater Ship Channel in the middle, and then the soft release paired with it uh, in the Deepwater Ship Channel. And we see that for the hard release at Rio Vista, we have uh, the distances that fish tended to travel from that release site were uh, much larger than the other two groups at the Deepwater Ship Channel. Um, it's nice to see for the Deepwater Ship Channel release for both hard and soft release that there's less variability, although I will note those two outliers for the hard release at the Deepwater Ship Channel that were the fish that were at salvage. Um, we then can go and use the same methodology to look at the distances between the uh, recaptures, and we see, uh, so it's distances between fish, between detections and monitoring uh, for each, fit, each uh, pair of fish uh, in uh, each batch. Uh, for both of our hard releases, we see a large degree of variability um, in the distances traveled, so fish uh, detected fairly close to the release location and, and the other fish there, and then fish that went uh, quite a bit of distance apart from each other. And that really represents a dispersal of fish widely across the estuary uh, from down in uh, Sassoon Bay to the upper part of the Deepwater Ship Channel, all the way down to salvage. 
And then for soft release, we see a much reduced amount of variability in the distance between recaptures. And that really fits with our hypothesis, uh, number one, about these fish tending to be in closer uh, proximity to each other. So I wanna to touch also on how we're using Eris to speak to this. And I'll note that Fred is gonna talk a lot more about this in his talk. So I'll just show you a couple of very brief fun videos. Um, on the left, you're gonna see a little clip of a release from soft release enclosure. So you'll see the fish in the center of that circle. And then as the, is kind of a bird's eye view, the cage is dropping down and you see the fish leaving the, uh, the enclosure. Uh, and then on the right, we're going to see the hard release, and you'll kind of see the hull of the boat in the upper part, uh, the outline of the carboy that Catherine mentioned, and then the fish coming out of that carboy. And what we're doing with these videos is looking at, uh, of course, any evidence of predation in the immediate uh, vicinity of these releases, looking at the behavior of the fish as they leave their release mechanism, and the general uh, observations of whether those fish are scattering or if they're moving off in one cohesive group. Um, these videos are definitely still being analyzed by USGS, so expect more on that uh, in the future. So in conclusion, um, I really hope that uh, if nothing else, you got a very good appreciation for the sheer, sheer amount of logistics that goes into this. This is definitely an interagency uh, um, a good example of great interagency collaboration. We have a lot of people working on this that really makes everything successful. Um, everything that I've talked about today is of course extremely preliminary because we have very low recapture rates. Uh, we were very excited just to see any fish getting recaptured in monitoring. That was an open question when we started this. And it's exciting to see that we have some ability to get some, quanti quanti uh, some actual data to speak to these decisions. Um, but of course we need more data with this re uh, low recapture rates. Um, we have a solid stable of tools that we can put towards this with new, more powerful tools coming online. So we will, uh, after a period of time, have hopefully enough information that we can put towards making uh, very informed decisions for the uh, design of later uh, upscaled supplementation releases. Um, and just to revisit as well, the ultimate goal of this, uh, this effort evaluating hard and soft release is to identify the release method that best balances the least effort for release with the greatest benefit for the species. Uh, and with that, if there's time, I'll take any questions and leave you with this GIF of the paired hard and soft release from Deepwater Ship Channel and the recaptures from them. So we have about uh, five minutes for questions. Okay. Bruce. Thank you, Brian. Um, I'll ask you the question I was going to ask Catherine because it's the same issue. In year one, uh, I understood that all the releases were done in the daytime. Um, and I understand that the soft releases are close to shore and the carboys are out in mid, mid channel. And I asked then uh, how that jived with what we where we expect in wild fish to be that is in the daytime along the shore and in the nighttime venturing out in the open water have you done anything to see if the day of time of day affects your releases and maybe how along shore flows uh, are maybe not distributing fish uh, as much as the uh, flows in the thalweg uh so we've not tried nighttime releases yet uh, we don't currently have plans to do that. The logistics of that uh, and the safety concerns are going to be significant. Um, and especially with soft release, with needing to anchor these cages, doing that in very deep water would be very challenging. Um, I think it's something that is definitely on our minds that we would want to, you know, if, if there's a reason to think that it would be a benefit to the success of releases, that we would want to evaluate that. But we currently don't have plans to do that. We do them closer to shore, yeah. It would be relatively straightforward, I think, to do that um, since the actual release mechanism only requires really a small boat to open the valve and, and put compressed air back in. So yeah, that's something that we could we could try out. Um, but an increased you know, predator presence during the night as well may be a concern. So something we'd want to make sure we had Eris on hand to check out, yeah. Yeah, yep. 
Steve. Thanks, and I'm, I'm sure I'm asking you to speculate here, which you might not want to do, but with regard to the fish captured at the export facilities, does this tend to corroborate or refute any of our long-held uh, hypotheses about how and why Delta smelt get from places in the Delta and otherwise to the fish facilities? So that is a great question. Um, we had relatively similar uh, numbers of released fish, so a little bit lower number of released fish in the second year. Um, we did see a lot more fish at salvage this year. Uh, and of course, I'm speculating here a little bit, but um, it was very much in line with some of our existing conceptual models of when we have higher flows associated with these atmospheric rivers, we have higher flows this year relative to the drought year last year, much higher turbidity. We've had a lot of uh, intact turbidity bridges, a lot of widespread turbidity in the South Delta. So from that perspective, I think it's not unexpected that we would see these fish distributing more widely. Um, and those salvage events have generally been associated with uh, turbidity presence in that old river corridor down to the facilities. So um, yes, somewhat maybe surprising to see them making their way all the way down to the salvage facilities, but given the large volume of water and the relative to the long-term monitoring programs and how much water goes through the nets, uh, our salvage facilities do sample quite a bit more. So not unexpected. Yeah. Question? Uh, so the question was about speculating about why the uh, federal salvage facility uh, may have had more uh, detections than the state salvage facility. Um, maybe I'm going out maybe a little too much of a limb here. <laughs> I would suspect that clipping court four bay may play into that and the increased predation rates you would see there. Um, and it's relatively modest in numbers of fish here. And I forget now off the top of my head what the, the difference is, but it's not uh, not a huge difference regarding the difference between maybe like six or seven fish at one versus four or five fish at the other. Um, but I would suspect that if there is any reason for that difference, uh, it would be maybe predation related. All right, we don't have any questions in the Zoom, but I think we can go ahead and introduce our next speaker. All right, so next we have uh, Fred Fryer with USGS, who's gonna be talking about uh, the ARIS uh, imagery. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all in person. So as you've heard, uh, experimental releases with Delta smelt have been a really big endeavor with a lot of people involved. And the names you see here on the slide are just a few of the folks who have been kind of focused in on the aspect of trying to understand the behavior of these fish upon release uh, with the aerosonar tools that we've been using. <clears throat> Before I start the talk, I just want to acknowledge and make clear that I am by far the least important person <clears throat> on that list of people there that you see. Um, that's why I'm last in the authorship list. Um, in fact, I'm not even supposed to be here giving this talk. It's uh, Veronica Violet has actually been our lead person on this project. And so she's the one who was supposed to be giving this talk, but she's got a very good excuse for not being here. So she just recently had a very lovely little baby boy. And so she's at home taking care of her new child and developing her new family. So um, you're stuck with me instead. So um, I'll do my best. So um, how many of you lost a bet? Come on. Hopefully you didn't lose a lot of money. Um, I lost a big bet. My bet was that in the early days before this first actually happened when there was this experimental release team that was getting together to talk about the planning and how we were going to do it and how we were going to track the fate of these fish after they're put in the water. I was very vocal in that I swore that we were never going to see any of these fish again, um, especially if we were going to depend on monitoring programs to find these fish for us, right? Like we're just throwing a bucket of fish into the water. What are the odds we ever actually see any of these things again? Um, so I was just as pleased as everybody else that we actually recovered some of these fish in the monitoring programs and a surprise. Um, and so it's really great that we have that information. So that's really big picture information that we can get 
and collect on these fish. Um, what we want to do with the ARIS tool is to look in a little bit more closely to find out how these fish are behaving, what they're doing immediately upon release. And that's what I'm going to try to talk about a little bit here today. I'm going to be, um, again, this was Veronica's talk, but I'm going to be very big picture, uh, um, high level kind of coverage of this, whereas Veronica probably would have been able to get into a little bit more of the weeds with you guys. And so this is a shot here of Veronica pointing out some of these fish um, on the boat as we're watching them. So one of the great things about the, this tool is that you can actually watch it live as it's happening. Um, <clears throat> one of the, uh, there's a few limitations that we've had with this particular work. One is that um, we're really constrained on what kind of questions we can ask based upon what's going on with the grander scheme of the releases, right? So. There's a lot of logistics, a lot of work that goes into place that dictates exactly how, when, where, and why these fish get released and various, you know, hard release, soft released, and where and what time of the day. Um, so um, in terms of like the ARIS aspect of it, we don't have a lot of control over like, at least initially with experimental design and okay, what questions are we gonna ask and try to answer? And so it was very observational, very kind of responding to the moment, trying to understand what, is going on with these releases so then we can kind of develop those questions and move forward with the team as a whole moving on. And so initially these questions were very simple and I'm gonna uh, just kind of high level go over these today with you. Um, that is how do Delta smelt behave upon release? What happens when they get dumped into the water? What do they do? And then uh, whether or not these releases seem to potentially be attracting predators or not. So you dump a whole bunch of fish into the water we have predators that live out in the water. Does that attract them or not? Um, I'm gonna be focusing in on hard release studies. So you um, heard a little bit from Brian on um, the soft release aspects and kind of how that has played out. Um, but all every, everything that I'm gonna be sharing with you today is um, hard release information. Uh, so this is a little bit of background on this tool. I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with an Aris camera or a Disson camera, camera, it's sonar. Um, so I'm not going to get into the details of it. Um, when I was putting my slides together this weekend, independently, I had a couple of my kids walk into the room and say, hey, what are you doing with an ultrasound? And so it's basically what it is. It's kind of a glorified ultrasound on steroids, a big giant fish finder that you can actually control and steer and focus. And so it's really cool. Um, main thing I want you guys to take home and to understand is the limitations of what we can do with this tool. So it's not like we're just seeing everything under the water. There's a few uh, very important constraints with what we can actually do and what we can see. One is that because this is a cone of sound, of sonar, uh, we have a very limited field of observation. And so um, it's not like, you know, we can, you know, like, you know, I can see the whole room here. It's a very narrow focus beam of what you can see. And so there's some limitations there. Um, again, it's not a light camera, it's based upon sonar. So species identifications are um, challenging. Most of the times they're impossible. So we don't always know exactly what we're looking at, uh, but we have a pretty good idea most of the time. And then uh, the last piece is that there's a lot of information, a lot of data that gets generated from this and we are right in the middle of all that right now. So I've got some very high level um, videos and information to share with you. Um, and just know that we're in the thick of all of the analysis and we'll be getting into much more detail as time goes by into the future. Um, so how do we do this? So again, focusing in on the hard releases and you saw a little bit about how this was all oriented and played out from Brian's talk. Um, so what we have here um, on the left are the, are the two boats. So there's a release boat is the boat on the right. That's the boat that's going to be um, dropping the, the bucket of fish, so to speak, into the water. And then the boat on the left is the observational boat. And you can see those um, on the left-hand side of the boat, um, on the port side of the boat, you can see um, those rods that are coming up in and out of the water. Those are actually the arms that the ARIS uh, devices are on. <coughs> And there's a little shot below of what that actually looks like. And so um, on the right-hand side of this plot or this graph or slide is what I'm showing you here is, so the boats are, are anchored onto buoys. Um, 
and um, they're situated such that they're at a distance apart that's going to be suitable and optimal for actually getting this footage with the with the um, with the Eris. And so um, what you see there is the the red dot that I'm showing you. That's an indication of where these um, buckets of fish are being released into the water, the carboys. And then the two cones you see there. Uh, the first one, the light blue cone with the small fish in it, that's an eris that's focused in on the actual release itself. So the immediate area of where these fish are being bucketed into the water to get an understanding or try to develop an understanding of, of their behavior. And then the darker blue um, cone there with the larger fish is a separate device that's focused down below where that release is happening a little bit to the back essentially that's trying to determine uh, whether or not there's any predators or any other fish in the area that might be potentially preying upon or just in the area of the, of the release here. So this is essentially how we went about collecting the information. Okay, so I've got a couple of videos here to show you some uh, behavior of these fish. And there's uh, two things that I wanna share with you. Um, how these fish behave when they're released um, under low water velocities. And then I'm gonna show you another video to show exactly how they're behaving when they're released, um, when the water velocity is really high. And you might be able to guess what happens. Um, so what is going on here is, so this, maybe you can see my mouse. So this is the, the uh, carboy right here. This is, this is the boat. Uh, this is the carboy that's releasing the fish, kind of, you know, gently kind of uh, releasing these fish out in the environment. This is low velocity. Essentially, this is a slack tide, so there's really no water movement at all. So you see, as these fish are being released, they're just kind of milling around. They're not really shooting off in any particular area. They're not being swept away. They're kind of, um, relatively speaking, they're kind of staying put and kind of just exploring the area. Uh, they don't really seem like they're particularly alarmed and darting around or anything like that for the most part. Um, and, um, you know, the, the bucket is occasionally kind of uh, releasing little uh, bits of fish here and there, and they're just kind of doing their thing. Um, in a minute here, all the fish will be released. Uh, there's a little bit more that just came out of the, the carboy there. And... Um, they're just kind of getting accustomed to their new home. All right, I'll let you guys watch that. Okay, okay. To contrast that, here's an example of fish being released at high water velocities. So in this case, water's gonna be moving from right to left um, again, this up here is, is the boat, is the vessel, and this is the carboy that's going to be releasing fish. And there are some bubbles here and a little bit of fish that come out um, as these fish are being released. But pretty soon here, you'll see the fish being released. There's a few that come out. And these fish are being swept away right away, right? So... Um, <clears throat> They're not hanging around, they're not milling, they're not kind of going in multiple directions as we saw when there was no velocity taking them anywhere. These fish are going exactly where the water's gonna take them. So there was a question earlier about whether or not uh, there's gonna be any more releases in say Sassoon Marsh. People think that Sassoon Marsh is potentially a good habitat. This is suggesting that we could potentially get fish into Sassoon Marsh without actually physically putting, there, putting them there, right? So we could use the hydrodynamics and the flows to transport fish into optimal habitats where we actually want them to go. Okay, hard releases, hard transition over to predation. Um, so one of the things we're able to do uh, with this information that we gather from uh, these sonar units is we can enumerate all of the objects that we see um, that we believe are fish. And we can generate information on the size of those objects and their movements. And uh, with respect to the movements, um, direction and speed and all of those kinds of things. And so what I'm showing you here is just some very preliminary information on the size distribution of these non-delta smelt fish that have been in the area from that predator camera that I mentioned to you earlier. And I'm showing you four examples of, of this. And so going from top to bottom, 
just read through it. We've got the top panel there is the, actually the top two panels are examples of releases that occurred at Rio Vista, um, one in November, 2022 and one in January of this year, right? And so um, <clears throat> we've got those two. And then we've got two more um, done up in the ship channel. So you saw from Brian's talk and, and the others um, that there was also some releases done in the ship channel. Um, and these were both in January of this year. The, um, the third panel, the first ship channel panel is um, the day before the releases actually happened. So we went out and tried to collect some baseline information on what was going on before the fish were actually released. And then the very bottom panel is the day of the releases while they were taking place. So we've got four examples here. We've got the two Rio Vista examples are uh, instances in which we've, we're talking about the same location, but different dates and times, right? Um, and then we've got the bottom two are the same location day before day of the release. And so um, what you see, at least what I see initially is not a whole lot of difference in the distribution of, of these, I'm going to call them objects. We don't know actually that these are all predators. Um, we have not done any supplemental um, net sampling or anything else to actually try to identify what these really are. But um, um, you know, the, um, the distribution of these fishes are for the most part, they're, they're very similar. So um, that's one thing we can do with this predator information. And then I'm gonna show you two examples of predation events that we've actually observed. And I wanna couch this first by saying that we've seen very few predation events actually happen. Um, these might actually be the only two, if I'm remembering right. If anybody on the team remembers, let me know. But I think these are actually the only two. And um, just coincidentally, one happens to be in a very low velocity environment. One happens to be in a high velocity environment. So this one's going to go pretty fast. What you're going to see is um, a fish dart out and, and, and nab a, another fish. So um, it's the action is really going on down here and up here you'll see kind of the shadow of it so you can look either above or below. Is it all right. The the halfway mark um, on the screen there the above is kind of the shadow and the below is the actual um, event itself so you see that fish come in boom did you see that. I'll play it for you again. Okay, so I paused it there. So uh, you can't see my screen. Um, so if you look at the bottom there, you can see the fish and you can see the smaller speck, which is the fish that it's going to eat in just a minute. And then the dark shadow up on top, that's just another way of looking at it. That's the actual shadow of it. Um, but you'll, you can even see like it's opening its mouth and everything and getting it. There we go. Boom, all right. Okay, so an example at a um, high velocity environment. So high velocity environment is not immune to predation events. Um, I'll just say that about it. Um, so what you're gonna see is carboy releasing fish here. And then that was really quick. So from right to left, you saw that small fish come in smaller size predator come in and all the buttons. There we go. Okay, I paused it there. So you can see where the carboys being um, deployed into the water, fish are being released. Um, near the bottom, near that number five, you're gonna see a, a fish swing out from right to left and nab one of these fish as it's being released. Boom. Okay, two examples. Again, this is not something we saw widespread at all. These, these are literally only two, um, but they're really fun to look at and I'm sure you guys are interested in it. And everybody always asks about the predation aspect of it, right? Um, all right, so in conclusion, a very preliminary high level uh, kind of talk. Um, behavior, uh, so far what we're seeing is that hydrodynamics really seem to drive the behavior of these fish in terms of at least where they might get distributed to. So again, going back to that idea where we might be able to 
structure releases to then um, uh, determine the distribution and the fate of these fish into particular habitats. Um, I think that's a very important aspect of this. And then the predation piece, again, um, very few observations of that, but I think it's something that, in my opinion, that we can probably manage with how, when, and where we do the releases. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot. You had your hand up first and then I'll go to Wim. Oh, sorry. Hi, how's it going? So with the current sonar, it looks like it has a, it's like a two part question. It has a fixed view. That being said, is there a reason you're not using more commercialized units for fish finders, uh, forward facing sonar to identify the presence, absence or abundance of predators that can actually scan around the boat rather than a fixed view in such a short distance? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'm assuming you guys all heard that um, with the microphone, but there are, for those of you that don't know, there's a lot of, especially in the fishing world nowadays, there's a lot of these sonars that are a little bit more controllable and allow you to uh, generate um, slightly broader views of um, areas and habitats to observe. Um, one of the things uh, we've been thinking about doing is, um, well, we've been considering a lot of different orientations of cameras and camera types, um, but this is what we had to work with to start. And just like the broader project as a whole, this is really as much of a pilot as anything else. And so as we look into and dive into the data a little bit more, we'll learn a little bit more about what we could and what we should try to do in terms of those observations. So we might eventually get there. Yeah, Wim. Okay, and I've been told that's the last question. So come see me at the break. But then, but they're in a moving. Oh, it just turned on. They're in a moving frame of reference, and in that frame of reference. Yeah, it's going in and out. I can kind of hear you. So they're in a moving frame of reference. Yeah. So they. Well, they Well, so um, it, it kind of depends on what the question is and what the outcome is that you're looking for. So in terms of what the fish are doing and what's happening to them, if you put them into the water on a slack tide, those or in an environment, a very low velocity environment, whether that's a flooded island or some backwater or something, they're really not going to disperse very far until, unless and until they decide to. Whereas if you put them in the middle of the foul wig on a really strong flow, those fish are going to get distributed upstream or downstream, depending on which direction the currents go. And so if you wanted to say, for example, um, structure a release um, near near the ship channel, and you want you actually wanted fish to go up into the ship channel because of some question you wanted to answer. You would want to put those fish on the peak flood tide at the base of the ship channel, and they would go up there, and they may or may not come back out. Whereas if you wanted to send them, you know, downstream towards Rio Vista, you would do the opposite. So that's at this point, that's really all I'm saying about that. Yep. All right. Thanks. At this point, we'll have our next talk. We'll have Trishel Temple and Britt Davis with DWR to talk about enclosure studies informing experimental release. Okay. 
Um, hi, everybody. I'm Trishel Temple. I work for DWR. And today, Brittany Davis and I are going to be discussing some targeted enclosure studies that were designed to inform experimental release. So shifting gears a little bit, we're going a little more small scale with this one. But first, we both want to acknowledge that it really took a huge team of people to pull this work off. Um, it included a lot of collaborators from multiple agencies and universities. So thanks to everyone. This isn't totally our talk to give. So first I'll go into a little bit of background about the Delta smelt enclosure studies. So about six years ago, as the catches of wild Delta smelt progressed towards record lows, DWR partnered with the UC Davis Fungi Lab and FCCL to begin exploring the feasibility of introducing hatchery Delta smelt into a naturalized environment by placing them into these enclosures that were anchored in the river. Our first deployment was in 2019, and it was really an effort to explore whether cultured delta smelt were even going to be able to survive um, in these cages in the wild. And our initial pilot study was an overwhelming success. We saw survival rates reaching higher than 95%. We built off that initial success with additional deployments in 2019 and in 2021. So these studies occurred before experimental releases began, and they really allowed us to evaluate delta smelt growth and survival across different regions of the estuary, as well as across different seasons. So we're not going to talk about these studies today, but keep an eye out for write-ups describing our results. We're planning to submit them for publication in the coming months. In today's talk, we're really going to focus on work that was completed within the last year. So in 2022, we conducted two targeted studies to fill knowledge gaps surrounding the current Delta smelt uh, experimental release methods. The first was the feeding study, which looked at two different Delta smelt feeding strategies that we could implement at FCCL prior to release. And the second was the stretch study, which investigated the lethal and sublethal effects of the current transportation and release methods that are currently in place for the experimental releases. And so for the first part of the talk, I'll go over the feeding study and then I'll turn it to Britt to walk us through the stress study. So in the feeding study, we looked to explore whether these different feeding strategies implemented at the hatchery would affect the success of the fish once they reach the wild. We implemented two different treatment types. The first was dry feed, where the fish were maintained on a dry food diet up until the day they were placed into the river. And the second was live feed, where the fish were transitioned to live artemia, 30 days before they got put into the river. And our underlying question was really, was this exposure to live feed at the hatchery just before ending the river gonna give those fish an edge when they encountered live food in the wild? So as those fish were acclimating to their new diets, we headed out to the Sacramento River near the Rio Vista Army base and installed this system of eight enclosures. So four of these cages would be holding our live feed fish and four would be holding our dry feed fish. And on February 8th, we put 84 adult fish into each cage. And then we also retained uh, one tank of live feed fish and one tank of dry feed fish at FCCL to serve as our controls. Our experiment ended on March 9th, which meant that the fish were out in these enclosures for a total of 29 days. At the end of the study, we counted up the number of mortalities in each of the enclosures. And overall, our survival was really high, reaching or exceeding 94% for each cage. So during the experiment, we collected five subsampling events over the course of the month, and these happened once per week. During each subsampling event, we went out and we collected 10 fish from each of these enclosures, and these ended up occurring on days 2, 8, 14, 21, and 29 uh, days after being put in the cage. During each subsampling event, we collected the length and the weight data of each fish, and we used that data to calculate Fulton's condition factor. Uh, we also took the fish back to the lab to perform a dissections on a subset of the fish. We dissected 40 fish from each sampling event to gather some additional metrics. During the dissections, we looked at the total fat stores and the gonadal maturity of the fish. And we also sent their stomachs to the wet team at the University of, Wall of Washington to process their gut contents. And in today's talk, I'm going to focus on the changes in condition factor and some early diet analysis results. So one of the first things we noticed when we were handling the fish is that the dry feed fish seemed to be a lot larger than the live feed fish, and that observation held true. So in the plot you see here, we're looking at the change in Fulton's condition factor over the duration of the study for the fish that were put out into those field enclosures. And what we see is that the dry feed fish had a significantly higher condition factor on days 2, 8, and 14 following deployment, but no difference was detected at days 21 or 29. 
shifting over to the diet data, we really start to see the opposite trend. So the plot here, we're looking at the total number of prey items that were found in the stomachs across the duration of deployment. And this time it's the live feed fish that had significantly higher prey counts at two and eight days following deployment, but no difference was detected at days 14, 21, or 29. And I will know that this was all wild-based food. Uh, we did not detect any leftover FCC artemia in the guts. That same pattern emerges when we look at the prey diversity. So in the plot here, we're looking at the total number of different prey types it found in the diets across the experiment. And again, we see that the live fish were consuming a significantly higher number of different prey types at days two and eight, but no significant differences were detected at days 14, 21, or 29. So overall, what we're seeing is that um, each of these treatment types provided the fish a really unique advantage, but both of these advantages seem to be pretty short-lived. We saw that dry feed fish um, grew larger at FCCL before the deployment, and they retained that high condition factor for about two weeks in the field. But on the flip side, the live feed fish might have been a bit more savvy, savvy as predators during that first week of, of the experiment, as evidenced by the increased prey counts and diversity in their diets. And then again, after two weeks in the field, no differences were detected between the groups. We did note that um, both treatment types had really high survival across the four weeks. So it could be that other factors like logistics or cost may be helpful when evaluating a long-term feeding strategy. And we are just really now beginning to dive into that data. So there is gonna be more to come. Next, we wanna take a deeper look at fish condition by looking at differences in fat stores and gonadal maturation over time. We also want to take a deeper look into the diet data by looking at prey diversity at the species level um, and comparing that species competition or composition in the guts with some concurrent zooplankton samples we collected. And then I'll turn it over to Britt. Thanks, Michelle. So switching gears a little bit to the stress study that we conducted last year, um, really just this last fall, um, I want to first acknowledge we're doing this project in collaboration with UC Davis. Um, this is being led by master's student Nick Hudson and supported by postdoc Garfield Kwan. Oh, I might have just clicked out of my presentation. Okay, so as we've heard in the last several talks, um, experimental release, the first two years have been pretty successful, I think, logistically, what we've been able to learn, um, the improvements. But we have observed mortalities across time, across both years, um, noticed in the soft releases, or that's the way we can measure mortalities. Um, and, and so some level of stress is occurring in the, in the current methods. And so can we uncover where that's occurring, why that's occurring, and make improvements? So the stress study was really uh, geared to help fill these knowledge gaps in the current transport methods and uh, hopefully to improve survival and really an effort to inform future supplementation strategies and, and try to maximize uh, the effectiveness of our resource use. So the general goal of the stress study was uh, to characterize stress response and survival of Delta smelt following um, transport methods to inform future strategies for the experimental release team. Some of the project objectives included uh, determining sublethal stress accumulated from both transport and release, and then can we characterize a potential recovery as well? Can we quantify relative survival following transport? And then also, um, what's the effect of increased transport density? So jamming more fish in those buckets before release on stress and ultimate survival. And so as Catherine mentioned earlier, we really coordinated the stress study closely with the experimental release team this last year. Um, we tried to match uh, as much preconditioning as we could. We reared the experimental fish uh, together with the stress study fish. We tagged them similarly, we fed them similarly, we uh, transported them in the truck and the boat. And then instead of release to the Delta, we released into uh, eight cages as shown previously by Trishel. We uh, included two experimental treatments in our study. We had four carboys at the low or normal transport density at 200 fish per carboy or 10 fish per gallon. And then we had four carboys at 300 fish per carboy uh, or 15 fish per, per gallon. And this is our high density treatment. 
In addition to putting those carboys out at Rio Vista, we also had a handling control. So we had one carboy at low density that was trucked around for some known distance and then returned to FCCL. And those fish were released into a cage in a 20 foot uh, tank. So we conducted sampling for stress in two key phases, before transport and then after transport. The before transport really was focused on collecting baseline data for stress. So um, <clears throat> these blue uh, arrows here are where we collected up to 20 fish from the tank. So one was before any tank disturbance happened, no fish had been loaded yet for experimental release or the stress study, what's our baseline stress looking like? Then the first batch of experimental releases were loaded up and left, um, as well as the stress study fish. And then we took a secondary measure of sort of uh, handling stress. Then the fish were uh, loaded up into the trucks, into the eight carboys, transported to Rio Vista. We also took carboy water quality before the carboys were sealed, and then uh, just before they were released at Rio Vista. So in the after uh, sampling period, which looks extremely complicated, but essentially we're trying to capture this acute, potentially high stress and across hours, days, several days. And so we really wanted to capture this 24 to 72 hour target period for release that the experimental release team is currently using. Um, unexpectedly, the weather happened. There was a wind event in the middle of our experiment. So we made a, a real time decision to pull half the cages, two of each treatment, after the 24 hour uh, period to get uh, hard counts of mortality. And then we thought, wow, what a great opportunity. Um, we kept half of our cages in to see how the fish would survive um, and monitor stress through that wind event. And we pulled the rest of the cages after that 72 hours. I should also mention uh, the transport stress uh, time period was two and a half hours. And we made that decision following the, the release timeline that morning also took about two and a half hours. So why so many sampling time points? Um, the reason we have this is, is hopefully to generate a, a sort of a real time decision tool for the release team. Um, so here I'm showing you a conceptual diagram or conceptual hypotheses. So um, on the Y axis here, we would have any sort of physiological stress metric. And then we have time on the x-axis, so before the transport and then time after the transport. And I learned from Fred, you can't see the pointer, but essentially you'll have some baseline measure uh, at FCCL, so low stress metric. Let's follow the green line here. And then the FCCL control. You're going to have an increase in stress metrics, cortisol, maybe energy metabolism, following handling. But then typical fish response is after 24 hours, you'll return back to baseline levels. And so hypotheses here are after transport and release and potentially increased densities marked by this blue and red line here, you might have elevated stress measures or even sustained uh, stress a long time. And so as a decision tool, if we can measure stress and characterize these response curves, you could be out in the field doing soft release, there's a storm event coming. Well, we know based on the stress study that they have this accrued stress levels, maybe we should release now, maybe we should release in a little bit. That's the hope. <laughs> so measures um, we took were mortalities, measured car uh, carboy water quality, and then what's not happened yet, uh, but results will come out in uh, summer, or measuring the primary, primary and secondary stress responses. So looking at that cortisol, gill morphology, and then energy metabolism. So um, I'm gonna dive into some preliminary results. Uh, first, the water quality changes and then mortality. So the preliminary re uh, results for water quality, we do demonstrate. Um, quite significant changes in the carboy uh, across the two and a half hour period. Uh, we do see similar trends across the transport densities. So let me orient you here on these three figures. The first figure is dissolved oxygen before and after the transport um, in the low density in blue and the high density in uh, red, and then the control that was trucked around and, and went back to FCCL. 
The two uh, bottom figures are pH and then partial pressure of CO2. And so in general, we see the same trends in both the low and high density treatments. They're consuming a lot of oxygen, um, but most notably conditions are becoming more acidic. So normal uh, fish pH, uh, blood pH is near eight. And we see that after that two and a half hour transport, pH is near zero. Um, and PCO2, uh, we see a stronger effect of the higher densities. So PCO2 after that transport is near 2000. And this is a little concerning. Um, 2000 is near climate change projections for PCO2. So um, they're experiencing likely acute acidosis. Fish are good acid-base regulators. Uh, so a lot more to come on uh, accrued stress. So we also evaluated mortality counts um, here on the first y-axis and then percent relative survival on the second axis. Uh, we saw higher mortality counts in the high transport density. Um, and then following the storm event marked by this sort of yellow block of mortality counts, we, we saw morts in the high density that were not evident in the low density, but there's a lot of uncertainty here. We don't actually know if those mortalities came from the latent uh, mortality from the transport, whether this was from disturbance and moving those cages or the wind event itself. What's important here is that these black bars here are simulating that we had relatively high uh, survival. So greater than 97% across the transport densities. And this is consistent with previous experimental release data of two to 4% mortality uh, measured in the SOC releases. So in summary, uh, we did find high relative survival of smelt following current transport method me methods up to 72 hours, regardless of those water quality changes. This um, indicates that there is potential to improve resource use with maybe increased transport densities. Uh, we are exploring uh, trailer methods um, and Nick did also take stress measures of that uh, new method that we're exploring. So regardless of the uh, high survival, there's a lot of uncertainties. For example, we still don't know the effects of what those water quality changes on stress um, and how the increased densities might interact. So next steps coming in the summer. We don't know the effects of stress on behavior um, and predation on survival. So all of these, they're in a sheltered cage environment. Um, it's uncertain if there are strategies that exist to minimize stress effects of multi-stressor multi events. So for example, these smelts are undergoing potentially three rapid changes in their environment, hatchery uh, water quality, then carboy water quality, then back to Rio Vista. So do they have the capacity to handle these short-term changes? And then uh, finally, this study really focused on transport uh, density on stress and survival. Um, and I want to note that the soft release cages are uh, nearly double the density um, than the, the stress study cages were. So a lot more to learn, a lot more studies, um, but we have the tools and we have the teams. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Britt and Trishel. We might have time for one question as we're transitioning slides. Yeah, we have a question in the front here. Uh, th th thank you all so much for the talk and thank you uh, very much for the work you're doing with the Delft Smelt. Uh, I couldn't help but notice, and this is more of a comment, that uh, a lot of the challenges that were encountered logistically, cost-wise, um, and stress levels could potentially uh, be offset by the Rio Vista Science Center. So hopefully once that comes online, that'll alleviate a lot of the challenges that you guys faced with this study. So I look forward to hearing this again in a couple of years. Great comment. All right, time to go. <laughs> All right. Um, Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Slater. I'm a senior environmental scientist with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I work as part of the Interagency Ecological Program Monitoring Group out of our Stockton office. I'll be talking a bit about some of the monitoring design review that we've been working on over the last two years and some applications to um, Almond Water Trawl uh, survey updates we hope to um, implement soon. And first up, um, I'd like to acknowledge um, the, uh, the substantial efforts of the monitoring um, review design team, um, especially bringing in the added support of uh, Rune Mawani with Applied Marine Sciences and Mike uh, Talatsen from ICF, 
um, with the support of DWR and the and the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, without their help, uh, I don't think that this would be, would have been possible. And I've been thinking about um, Louise's talk about monitoring our view, and uh, we've been doing this during our ongoing activities. So that added support was necessary um, for the the continued success of this activities. So, quick overview slide. I'll be sharing a little bit of um, background on the five studies in question, um, uh, a bit about the monitoring design review intent and how it's set up with how we're hoping to apply um, uh, the findings into things we can implement for improvements regarding uh, new abundance estimates with uncertainties, um, spatial balance, proportional sampling of existing efforts. And then if you're gonna be adding stations, do we wanna consider questions of uh, fixed versus random um, sampling? Um, these five studies I'll be talking about are uh, summer tonet. Um, it's one of the longest running fish monitoring programs we have in the estuary, possibly the country. It's been operating since 1959 to consider the impacts of water projects on fish with the advent of the start of the Central Valley project in the South Delta. A few years following that, um, we started the Fall Midwater Trawl Survey in 1967 um, with the start of the State Water Project. Um, a few years go by um, with the listing of um, Delta smelt, um, we brought on board the 20 millimeter survey to look at larval and juvenile delta smelt um, patterns. And then uh, the spring Kodiak trawl survey starting in 2003 to look at the adult um, delta smelt population. Then um, with the listing of longfin smelt uh, by the state, uh, we initiated the smelt larval survey to look at larval um, patterns. And um, this is all occurring within the sample frame of the upper San Francisco estuary. These surveys are contributing to our understanding of um, informing annual recruitment, the abundance and distribution of these fishes, uh, which we call our status and trends type of reporting. But they're also contributing to entrainment risk um, of fishes by water project operations, um, which we refer to sometimes as the real-time monitoring um, um, operate, uh, um, activities. And um, a big point here is that these gears are all different. They're, they're applying seasonal gear efficiencies to target life stages of these fishes, and they're operating at different times of the year. A lot of the fishes we're interested in have a winter spring spawning period. And for, um, and I'll just run through it. So for the January, February, March period, um, that's when we're looking for uh, longfin smelt larvae with the smelt larval survey, smaller net. I think the um, mesh is on is like a um, half of a millimeter for the openings. And so um, starting in March, then through July, we have biweekly 20 millimeter sampling, looking at larvae and juvenile adult smelt, um, but all other fishes like lump and smelt also. Um, then transitioning with some overlap, uh, June, July, August, biweekly sampling of the summer tonet. Now we're scaling up to slightly larger meshes, um, around two and a half millimeters to then fall midwater trawls, monthly sampling, September through December. And if you think about the life history of um, a fish like Delta Smelt, we added that spring Kodiak trawl then to be targeting adults um, January through May at a monthly time scale. And um, to, to really hammer this point home, we're applying these gears to inform like life history as a fish like Delta Smelt. Um, in the bottom right corner, we see this March, April, May period, larval, adult smelt, then looking at the juveniles in the summer, subadults in the fall, um, adults in the, um, again, in the winter and spring. And, um, but to make another point is that these gears are also informing us a considerable amount about the overall pelagic communities. Um, there's a suite of fishes spawning in winter and spring that these um, gears are picking up. This example is just to be, um, a point about the number of taxa that the summer tonet picks up. It's been detecting over 66 fish taxa in the um, open water. This figure is of um, on the x axis is the fork lengths and sub frequency or the uh, some frequencies of fish caught in total 95 to through 2717 as an example of what I had immediately. Um, available for this, but then the uh, dark and dotted lines is the uh, delta smelt, lump and smelt. And so these gears, uh, this one in particular then, is picking up a lot of the younger fish. Um, but um, 
it's dominated mostly by say maybe 12 mostly abundant fish, but there's a lot of information to be had for other species. Um, so across these five surveys, there's a lot of similarities. We're generating catch information, fork length information. Catch per toe can be scaled up by volumes sampled at those locations for CPUE. And we're also generating indices by survey and or annually to get at the annual recruitment relative to uh, the environmental conditions of these studies. Um, but I, I'd make a strong point here that these surveys were designed independently of one another um, based on the management questions they're designed to approach with these different gears. And so the relative abundance indices were never meant to be interpreted as actual population estimates. Right? There are ways within the surveys to look at the patterns over time consistently. And in doing so, we have not been reporting them with uh, measures of uncertainty. Um, so the studies differ in index calculation. This is reporting by design, um, but there's a substantial amount of catch information that can be scaled up um, to look at patterns amongst life history. There is a lot of interest and in benefit in understanding if you have some abundance or population estimate of larvae, scaling that to juveniles to subadults um, for management of this fish. And Fish and Wildlife Service has done a substantial amount of effort of um, using the Department of Fish and Wildlife fish data um, with their adult smelt life cycle model and other efforts um, to look at different ways to generate abundance estimates um, from moving past indices to design-based or model-based abundance estimates with uncertainty. Um, so um, along comes uh, 2020 and in um, December, a six agency steering committee was formed with questions about um, what the department's um, monitoring surveys um, could be doing to look at um, review of our existing activities, but also uh, opportunities for improvement. And to do so, we formed a monitoring design team um, to look at the effectiveness of the five current studies with the idea of how could we make improvements with maintaining our long-term abundance and distribution data. And so that kicked off a rather um, intense uh, review period through 2021 that led to a report, I believe um, that was on one of Lu Louise's slides, the title of it. Um, and um, a, few, a few high points from that is, one of the base questions is across our five studies, how can we start synchronizing them in terms of the sample frame that we're operating in and how to scale up the catch to where we could um, link, um, not just for adult smelt, but for many species and surveys, um, more unified among its estimates. And the first question though was, um, what amount of the SR are we sampling? And so a high point was that we are actively able to access the vast majority of the water volumes from San Pablo Bay upstream um, that are greater than six foot in depth. We, one big point was that um, for our current gears and vessels, we're not able to access less than four feet of water depth. And so that would take um, another approach, um, possibly, um, special studies that are designed to work in shallow water, um, but we have a pretty good access to everything above six foot. Um, and that designing, um, or excuse me, implementing design-based abundance estimates would be possible. Um, there certainly would be issues of gear efficiency and life histories to be resolved. Um, and this structure then would be built so that we could not only um, uh, synchronize what we're doing amongst these five studies, but include others, including the work of other agencies. And um, along the lines of this review was questions about, um, we've had long-standing questions about the differences between fixed and random sampling. So we put together a special study to tackle some of that. So um, report has come out. Now the design team has ongoing tasks. Um, there are four major ones. Um, and to break this up, because there's a lot of words on this slide, um, I'll be sharing some of the technical note. One, uh, we're capturing a lot of our activities and our findings in a, a techn technical, uh, technical note series. I can't say that three times fast. Um, that we'll be able to share and then provide opportunities for folks to understand what we're up to and possibly provide feedback. And um, so we'll, as these um, activities are ongoing, we can continue making improvements. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about technical note number one. Um, in this talk. Um, task two then would be um, looking at spatial balance. Like if we are going to change or 
we are going to go through and rethink um, the sample frame and the areas we sample, um, we have to address then the amount of effort occurring in those areas. And maybe we need to change where and how we sample. Um, task three then is then again, if we're gonna be, you have your sample frame, the amount of sampling where that's occurring, how much of that should be fixed um, and or random sampling. Um, and then task four then is pulling together some of these ideas for uh, implementing possibly this uh, fall for Fallman water trawl. So te technical note number one, um, we've gone through and leveraging a lot of the work that Fish Wildlife Service has done for enhanced Delta smelt monitoring and the Delta smelt life cycle model. We've been adjusting to how and where we operate. Um, this has resulted in uh, 35 subregions, 12 strata, seven regions, um, so this gets at the areas of which we're defining for our monitoring efforts, um, but there's foundational um, ideas of then how are you going to dive into the um, actual calculations of volumes to scale up. This is getting to taking catch and volume sample to multiplying by these volumes of these areas to scale up your catch. So we applied um, bathymetry data from USGS and DWR um, to fill out um, these polygons and then apply filters because if we can't access waters, uh, say less than four feet, should we be including them in these expansion factors? And so at this point, no, we're, we're going to be looking at um, our sample frame, including um, areas greater than four feet, um, recognizing that our gears were actively sampling mostly around six feet of water or deeper. And this leads to other questions. As mentioned earlier, there's um, issues of aquatic vegetation. So if we are scaling this up for species that are open water pelagic fish that do not occupy vegetated areas, should we be including areas um, of water volumes that have vegetation? Um, possibly not. That could be over um, emphasizing uh, catch data for um, habitats that fish aren't occupying. So that's more, more to think about there on the um, application of aquatic vegetation uh, data. So we have our volumes within our polygons. We filtered out our depths, and now we're looking at then compiling our volumes per one meter depth bins, so then we can apply it to our gear types. Um, uh, spring Kodiak trawl is only a surface-oriented sampling gear. It samples effectively the top two meters, but our other gears can run to 10 meters of depth. And so... Um, take all this work and then you start applying it to an individual study. Task one would be then application of fall midwater trawl. Um, that results where we had our 122 um, ongoing fall midwater trawl stations, 100 of those we've been sampling for the total um, sample record. And those 100 stations then go to calculation of an index that we report monthly and then annually. Um, and those waiting volumes that we have for those include 14 historical areas. Um, here it's called the strata. Uh, but this new sample frame applying these stations to this new framework then results in five regions, 10 strata, 24 subregions. So that allows us to group and um, identify um, catch or potentially abundance at um, different scales. And then uh, applying that depths to 10 meter, um, excuse me, one meter bins through 10 meters of depth. Um, and in practice, what that's starting to look like, um, and th this is an example of longfin smelt and age zero striped bass. On the first or the left Y axis, we have the new design-based abundance estimates. On the right is the index. And what we're finding is that the, um, the results are highly correlated. We're able to actually calculate these new design-based estimates with uncertainty. Here I included standard error and they're highly correlated with our historical indices. So that was like a, whew, okay, good. Because we don't want to be finding that we've been doing things completely differently, but um, there are differences. Um, as you would expect, there'd be some amount because now we're structuring and weighting catch it in areas to different volumes. Um, but overall, the, the, the trends appear to be um, telling very similar stories for these fishes. Now, this sets up then our ability to do this, then which species would we apply this to? And also would we want to consider regional application? So um, Midwater Trawl has been reporting annual indices for six species. Um, 
And now we have the opportunity to do that for more. Some of the requests have been, what about Pacific Caring and Northern Anchovy? So we could do that. Um, so, um, but from a consistent reporting standpoint, um, we're still thinking through which species those would be. Um, task two then gets us to, well, if we're gonna have our historic 122 stations and we are going to adjust the amount of effort for these new areas, um, should that be based on volumes? Um, should it be based on um, reducing uncertainty? Um, that could result in some total of substantially more effort um, on a monthly scale. And so, um, but we have been applying some of these principles this year to um, uh, the monitoring design to spatial balance with the ITP expansion work for a smelt larval survey in 20 millimeter this year. We added a suite of stations in San Pablo Bay um, for SLS and 20 millimeter to help um, inform lump and smelt patterns. Um, luckily, we did with um, this incredible amount of water that's been shifting habitat downstream. Okay, lastly, um, task three, special study. I'll just boost, boost through this real quickly. Um, so to get at this, we've been conducting additional toes randomly. Um, in 2021, we added um, sampling in S San Pablo and Sassoon Bays. Um, following our routine sampling, um, we went back um, in 2022 and conducted substantially more random sampling. And this time it was same day, same bay overlap. Um, and we're still working through QCing the data and some preliminary um, results though from a high level would be, we're, we're finding um, remarkably similar patterns of catch between the fixed and random sampling. Um, to draw your attention, the top table green is the special study work. Uh, blue and is the bottom routine, um, and it's pretty remarkable considering um, the scale, say, for American Shad, 183 and 103 catch in November, December, um, 148, 156, November, December for the routine. Um, so the very similar scales of catch, um, uh, which um, is very interesting. So um, I flew through quite a bit of content. Next steps. Um, finalizing our work on the design-based approach, um, task one, um, pulling together the um, proportional balance with effort, the stations, how and where would we apply um, additional effort. Um, and um, for task three is finalizing some of our findings with the random versus fixed. And um, as we're working through this, hopefully pulling together a proposal for um, improvements to the fall midwater trial for this fall. And uh, that was a lot. Questions? Thanks, Steve. Good talk. Um, so during my talk, I brought up the example of how I lost the bet on whether or not we would ever see any of those released Delta smelt again. Um, one of the things that I thought I'd learned from that, though, and I might be wrong about this, too, is that our sampling program seems to be extremely efficient if we can catch those fish. And so I'm wondering, are there, is your group or anybody else, all of that information that is available now in terms of we've got a population size, we know they were released, like is anybody doing the math to kind of help dial in monitoring from that perspective? Um, regarding the supplemental release. Um, so that's a great question. So from the review for these five studies, now I'm going to think about Palmer Water Trail right now, we're, we've been looking at um, the total community, not specifically Delta smelt. So this is like the multi-species pelagic approach of like, if you're going to be looking at the amount of effort, should it be based on volumes for so consistent sampling or some amount of proportional balance because we want to apply this to all five studies of how much effort are we putting out. But it could be that based on management questions, maybe it's addressing the uncertainty. Maybe the effort should be based about the amount going into detecting Delta smelt. And that could be phased in for, well, for special studies or it should it be part of ongoing routine monitoring. So um, good question. I don't know, um, but considering how we um, do our ongoing monitoring, what should it be routine or what amount of special studies or intensive um, sampling could we do to address specific questions? 
um, versus just doing the same thing over all the time. I think there are, are some good thoughts. Got one more question over there, Sean. Sean. Thank you. Great talk. I'm glad to see all that progress. I was wondering when it comes to you're, you're looking at correlating of the different uh, efforts between the different types of studies, post expansion of what, what that would look like, and also the fixed versus random. But the questions about the monitoring was not focused on how well they correlate between those two methods, was how better it would inform management decisions. So, how are you looking at that? I didn't see that in the presentation. I saw how they correlate between different patterns, but how has there been an improvement in that you would think that would help with uh, management decisions, or is the effort just not really improving things. So what is the management decision that we're supposed to be looking at? And so one of the questions is then has been about the amount of effort and um, part of our marching hours were to look at uncertainty. So um, some of the tables in here have been developed by the monitoring design team that we, if we have yet to take to the steering committee. And so we can go back to the management within the agencies and say, okay, based on our current framework, and we could make these changes. This is the type of improvements in terms of the, the reporting we're providing. And if we want to adjust that, maybe again, I did a slide about regional abundance. Maybe that's more important for management, say, for depending on the question. Maybe it's species. Maybe we haven't been reporting on certain species that are now of import. So um, we, I think, are creating a toolbox here of opportunity to inform management. And the management bar, I think, as we've heard earlier, changes. And so we're going to provide a suite of opportunities for improvement and take that back to management and say, okay, what, what best suits your need at this point? Okay. Thank you. Great. Right. Right. Thanks so much, Steve. And that was our last talk of this session. Thanks for hanging in there. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I think we have an hour now for poster sessions and then two hours for lunch. So big thank you again to all our speakers. <laughs>
Hello, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. We're going to start the lightning talk session momentarily in about 50. Actually, we'll just start. Um, my name is Lynn Takata. Um, like I said, I'm uh, from the Delta Stewardship Council at the Delta Science Program. Um, welcome back from lunch. Glad to have everybody here and in person. It's nice to see everybody. Um, this is the lightning talk session. So it's a potpourri of different topics um, in a very, very short format. Um, and I'm really excited to be introducing you to a really great lineup of speakers. Um, we are going to start right now, if I can get the PowerPoints going. Our first speaker is Dulcinea Avoris from the University of California, Merced. And she's gonna speak about Mercury from space remote sensing proxy models for mercury retrievals in the San Francisco Bay Delta. So if you could come on up, Dulcinea, and I think this is your talk. There you go. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk about this project called Mercury from Space. Um, obviously, that's the short name, not the long name. Um, and this was a, uh, the objective of, the, of this project was to develop optical proxy models for um, mercury species in the Delta using both remote sensing and in situ measurements. Um, I was a postdoc at UC Merced and I led the remote sensing um, part of this project with Dr. Aaron Hester. It was a collaborative effort between um, folks at the California Water Science Center and at USGS Menlo Park. Um, and of course, in brief, mercury is a heavy metal contaminant that's a major concern in the Delta um, because of bioaccumulation, potential for human consumption of fish with elevated levels, um, among other things. So this work was funded through the California Department of Fish and Wildlife um, from the Water Quality Supply and Infrastructure Improvement Act of 2014. And the collaborators, as I said, were both from USGS Water Science Center here in Sacramento, as well as Menlo Park. This is a list of uh, people who participated in the project. I've probably left some people off this, but as most projects go, a lot of people um, were involved in it. So this project relies on two known relationships, the measurements of turbidity and dissolved organic matter by satellite-based optical sensors, and the relationship of that dissolved in particulate of dissolved in particulate mercury and methylmercury species with turbidity and dissolved organic matter in the delta. So we leverage those relationships to develop models for mercury retrievals based on remote sensing of those water quality parameters. And then we were able to apply that model to remote sensing imagery in order to create delta wide maps of mercury. We did this by collecting a lot of data. We measured both particulate and filter passing mercury and methylmercury at specific points throughout the delta. We measured a suite of water quality parameters at continuous monitoring stations um, to collect a tempor temporally dense data set over tidal periods. We also conducted a mapping campaigns that uh, collected delta wide spatially dense data sets of other water quality parameters. <clears throat> And then we combine that data set, that large data set, with turbidity and dissolved organic matter retrievals from the Sentinel-2 satellite sensor. Sentinel-2 is, is a satellite that was launched by the European Space Agency. It has a spatial resolution of 20 meters per pixel and a repeat time of five days. So we got a picture every five days and we could see the whole delta because our spatial resolution was small enough for that. We then use this data set to develop models for the mercury species. My collaborators at USGS developed successful models for each mercury species using the suite of field measurements. And I worked in parallel to their efforts to develop a remote sensing based model using that Sentinel-2 data and the in situ mercury measurements. I used a conditional inference machine learning framework um, to calibrate and validate the model for each mercury species. And then the successful model that came out of that machine learning framework was applied to our full suite of Sentinel-2 data um, 
essentially our imagery archive. So we could produce maps of mercury species for the entire time period that Sentinel-2 was collecting data. Um, this plot here shows the results for filtered methylmercury in winter, spring, and autumn. The R squared for this model was uh, 0 0.79, and the RMSE was uh, 0 0.06 nanograms per liter. So it was a successful model. It's the beginning of um, using things that we can see in the water to track things that we can't see. Um, and so this is a really exciting project. It's the one that was just wrapped up for me. Um, I am now working at the USGS California Water Science Center. Um, so, and this is my new contact information. So if anybody would like to ask questions later or talk about integrating remote sensing into your work, I'd be happy to uh, have those conversations. And I will be here tomorrow as well. Thank you. I have no idea how fast I am. I have no idea how fast I am. You are still finished. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Disnea. Um, our next speaker is Keith um, Boma Grigson, and he will be talking about um, cyanobacterial bloom in Frank's tract. Let me start the slide chat. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Keith Bauman Gregson, and I'm a research biologist at the USGS California Water Science Center. And today I'll be talking with you all about a cyanobacterial bloom that occurred in Frank's tract in 2022. And at the start, I'd like to acknowledge my USGS co-authors and also the California Department of Water Resources who funded this work. And so the problem is, how do you, present, pre how do you prevent salt from entering the central delta during droughts? When freshwater outflows are low during droughts, the shortest and fastest way for salt to enter the central delta is from the San Joaquin River through West Falls River and into Frank's Tract. And so to prevent this, an emergency drought salinity, salinity barrier or EDSB was installed by the Department of Water Resources in West Falls River in 2015, which was towards the end of the 2012 to 2016 drought. And with the EDSB in place, questions arose in the Delta Science community about how cutting off the tidal exchange between Frank's Tract and the San Joaquin River would change the water quality in Frank's Tract. And so monitoring was conducted from September to November in 2015 and did not find evidence of elevated chlorophyll or toxic cyanobacteria in Frank's Tract as a result of the EDSB. But then the rains returned, the drought was declared over and the EDSB was removed until 2021 when another drought returned and an EDSB was installed yet again near Frank's Tract. And so because of the conclusions from the 2019 monitoring, there was some surprise when in July of 2021, increasing cyanobacterial biomass was detected in Frank's Tract by satellite remote sensing data. Unfortunately, there was no dedicated event monitoring in 2021 for this bloom. And so what data we have was from long-term monitoring programs and a few sporadic sample collections that were possible. But as the drought persisted and the EDSB was going to remain in place for a consecutive year, the USGS was funded by DWR to sample Frank's track during summer of 2022 to understand how the EDSB might be impacting water quality and potential cyanobacterial blooms. And the primary hypothesis we had for how the EDSB might be contributing to blooms in Frank's tract is that water age or residence time increases in Frank's tract when the barrier is in place. Um, here I have some uh, modeling results from uh, DWR showing this. This gives phytoplankton more time to grow and form a bloom. And fortunately, we can use field measurements of stable water isotopes to estimate the water age and then compare these field measurements to the modeling results. And so in 2022, we sampled Frank's tract four times. And then we also sampled Mildred Island as a control because Mildred Island is not influenced by the EDSB. And so a bloom in Mildred might suggest that just the overall drought conditions might be contributing to blooms rather than the EDSB itself. And we collected data using our high resolution boat-based mapping system, as well as discrete samples. And we also collected data along three transects that span that water age gradient that was shown in the previous slide. And so what we found, well, sure enough, a bloom occurred. And um, in 2022, the bloom began in mid-July and extended into August. And um, chlorophyll in Mildred Island, which was our control, uh, did not actually increase over the course of the summer. It was just in Frank's tract. 
And according to the flora probe, cyanobacteria was dominant, was the dominant taxa in the phytoplankton community. And also the bloom was the densest in the south and western portions of Frank's tract, um, the air, which are the areas predicted to have older water by the hydrodynamic model. And so while the 2022 bloom wasn't that surprising given the 2021 event, what was quite surprising was the cyanobacterial composition of the bloom. Delicospermum, a genus of cyanobacteria, was the dominant taxa, not microcystis or phanazomenon, which are usually the taxa that dominate in the delta. Um, and I haven't heard about or read other instances of a delicospermum dominated bloom in the delta. So if anybody else has evidence or data on that, I, I would love to see it and see how it compares to the data we collected. And also notably, delicospermum did not seem to, seem to be producing any microcystins. The monitoring at the DWR FRK station um, only infrequently detected low levels of toxins. And so I think that the microcystins detected were likely being produced by the little bit of microcystis that was in Frank's tract rather than the larger populations of delicospermum or phanazomenon. And then our stable isotope calculations for water age are still um, underway and preliminary, but um, our, these initial results are showing gradients in water age. You can see here in this figure that we are measuring uh, younger water in the northern and eastern portions of Frank's tract and older water in the southern and western regions of Frank's tract, which line up with the hydrodynamic modeling results. And so we're still calibrating these results, um, and then we'll be sharing these data with DWR and looking at how our data compare with DWR's uh, models. So as we continue, um, we're, these analyses, we're trying to answer these questions. Why was the bloom dominated by delicospermum and a, fan, uh, and a phanazomenon, not, not microcystis? What are the relations among water age, chlorophyll concentration, and cyanobacterial cell density in Frank's tract? And ultimately, how can we improve our understanding of phytoplankton drivers to better predict how phytoplankton communities will respond to water management actions in the Delta? And so I'd like to thank all the field staff who are out there tirelessly collecting data uh, for us all to analyze, and also the groups that have funded this work, uh, especially um, DWR and um, all the collaborators there. So thank you. Thank you, Keith. All right, next up we have Megan Pagliaro, and she is from the University of California, Berkeley. And she is gonna talk about food webs and restored tidal marshes. There we go. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Megan Pagliaro. I'm a Delta Science Fellow, and I'm excited to talk to you all today about my research um, studying restoration in tidal marsh food webs. Um, this project is in collaboration with uh, USGS and ICF, and it is a uh, Prop 1 grant. So I'm only going to be summarizing some of the prelim preliminary analysis on my section. But tomorrow, Susan De La Cruz will be giving a general overview of the whole project. So I suggest checking that out as well tomorrow in session nine. So to get right to it, uh, our work aims to address the question, does the restoration of tidal marshes translate to the recovery of energy flows and food web structures? Um, and we we're addressing this question in the uh, six tidal marshes of the north um, of the upper San Francisco estuary. We study uh, three restored sites highlighted in yellow, and that includes the newest restored site, Tule Red, and three reference sites highlighted in orange. We uh, define a restored site as one whose breach or uh, whose dike or levee has been breached, and a reference site as one that's never been cut off from its tidal flow. Analysis is based on a block design, where each block or pair consists of one reference and one restored tidal marsh. To measure energy flows and food web structures, uh, we collected samples spanning multiple trophic groups and processed them for stable isotope analysis. We collected, nope. Yes. You guys can all see, right? Fine. I'll just ignore the pop-up. Um, we collected carbon, uh, nitrogen, and sulfur isotope data for all component parts, but today I'm going to talk about data from 808 fish and 80 F palm and phytoplankton samples. With the nitrogen data, I can calculate food chain length, that is the number of links between a basal resource and a top predator, and with all three isotopes, I can calculate isotopic niche volume. That is the uh, volume that encompasses all the isotopic data for all consumers in a community. And using those metrics, um, I want to, uh, wanted to first examine food chain length across marsh pairs. 
And then second, I wanted to understand variation in isotopic volumes first for the whole community, and then say, second, looking at native versus non-native fish. So these are gonna be the figures coming up with some um, preliminary results. So with food chain length, we calculated food chain length for each site and each sampling period. Um, and that re is represented by the box plots here. Each, se each section is comparing a different pair from that map earlier. The overall trend is that food chain length is higher in reference tidal marshes compared to restored as we hypothesized. Um, and then I'm immediately gonna jump into the niche volume. Uh, so this, we calculated the niche volume for the fish community at each site across years. Pairs are separated by that thick black line and years are separated by the gray dotted line. Um, so restored sites seem to have uh, lower isotopic volumes compared to their uh, reference counterpart for all years with one exception. That being Tule Red, which was breached in October of 2019. So in 2020, one year after it was uh, restored, it had a higher niche volume than its reference. But then in 2021, that um, uh, relationship reversed. And we think that this could possibly be reflective of the trophic surge hypothesis. And then for the very last bit of analysis, um, I wanted to use that isotopic niche volume, but look at generally comparing the difference between natives and non-native or introduced species in our system. Um, the figure on the left is showing the overall differences in the niche volume, while the figure on the right is showing the amount of overlap in that volume. Um, so to explain the figure on the right a little bit more, the blue arrow is saying that there's about an 82% probability that an introduced fish is found within uh, the niche of a native. And with the orange arrow, it's showing that there's about a 97% probability that a native fish is found within the niche of an introduced. So when you take both this overlap and the size together, um, I created this figure that that's what it's showing. So um, uh, while there is high overlap, there's asymmetry in that overlap. And, um, and that's, uh, so this is a very general trend and we're excited to, to dig into it a bit more, especially with all these preliminary analysis overall. Um, and that is it for the presentation, but if anyone has questions, I'll be here the rest of today as well as tomorrow. Um, from UC Berkeley, who will speak about phenological shifts and trophic mismatches. Wrong slide. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about a project that we've been working on examining phenological shifts and trophic mismatches in the San Francisco estuary and beyond. Um, so uh, the timing of life stage events for most species is relatively predictable throughout time. However, in recent years, we've been documenting more and more instances of phenological shifts where events like the timing of peak abundance or the timing of a migration event can occur earlier or later than the year than you would expect. Um, in food webs, this uh, presents a unique challenge as the uh, life cycles between predator and prey need to be relatively synchronous in order for the food web to match up. So in this instance, you can see that a potential prey item might advance earlier if the and if the predator remains static, those, uh, those food those food levels no longer match up and that they may destabilize the food web. Um, but phenology is hard to examine and you can't really examine it in a, in a vacuum, right? Climate influences phenology and estuarine systems, for example, changes in temperature or salinity might elicit different uh, dates of peak abundance. Um, but climate is of course not stationary, right? Climate is changing. So we approached this project wondering how can we model phenological shifts in estuarine systems while maintaining this climatic context for both drivers and the context of climate change. And then finally, in addition to that, we wanted to infer the potential for trophic mismatches using these uh, outputs. And so we settled on using trivariate mixed effects models, which jointly model relationships between phenology, climate, and time. And we used long-term monitoring data from three estuarine systems, the San Francisco Bay, the Massachusetts Bay, and Chesapeake Bay. And by the end of our data cleaning process, we ended up with over 2,000 monthly time series um, that are uh, incorporated about 138 taxa. 
we constructed models relating to both temperature and salinity because we figured those two were kind of master variables in these systems. And the phenological metric we were interested in was the yearly date of peak abundance. And while uh, we did examine uh, three estuaries for the purposes of this talk, we were going to focus on the San Francisco Bay. Um, now, two of the relationships that these model outputs are relationships between phenology and time and climate and time. So on the x-axis, you have phenology, um, uh, taxa that are significantly to the left of the zero are uh, peaking earlier in the year than you would expect, and taxa to the right of the zero are peaking later in the year than you would expect. On the y-axis, you have the covariate, either temperature or salinity. So below the zero on temperature, you'd have a cooling trend and above a warming trend, likewise a uh, fresher trend in salt models and a saltier trend. Um, and one of the things that we noticed that was quite interesting was that fishes in the San Francisco estuary tend to occupy a relatively narrow phenological niche, wherein they have a narrow diversity of trends in both phenology and climate. And coincidentally, the model also thinks that they are relatively sensitive to temperature because they occupy relatively narrow uh, temperature niche space, especially when compared to phytoplankton and zooplankton, which occupy a much wider diversity of trends in both phenology and climate. Um, compared to the salinity models, all three taxa tend to be more similar to each other and respond more similarly to the salinity than they do to temperature. So what does this actually mean within a realistic food web? Well, one of the things that we did was uh, construct regional based models that approximate a food web that could actually happen in nature. So these organisms exist within the same space. Um, and one of the things that we noticed is, like the previous slide indicated, that the phenological trends for fishes were relatively static. They tend not to be advancing their phenologies. However, many zooplankton and phytoplankton species are significantly shifting, primarily advancing their phenology, but also delaying as well. Um, and so this drastically increases the likelihood of a, of a trophic mismatch in the future. And to wrap this up, uh, phenologies uh, across our taxa tend to be more sensitive to changes in temperature than salinity. Um, but even still, many species are responding to both of these parameters. Um, they are shifting their phenologies, primarily in zooplankton and phytoplankton, with most of them are advances, but several are delaying as well. And there is a high potential for trophic mismatches, uh, according to our modeling framework in the San Francisco estuary. Um, and finally, while this is one way to do it, there are certainly other ways to model phenology um, and modeling of climate fluctuations that might be time varying in addition to directional trends might uh, add some nuance to this question and stick around for Denise Colombano's talk tomorrow, who's going to be getting into this in greater detail. So thank you very much. Thank you to the funders and to all of our collaborators. Thank you, Robert. Our next speaker is Joanna Griffiths, who will, from University of California at Davis, who will be speaking about um, warming and delta per, delta smelt persistence. It's a tongue twister. Hi. Um, yeah, as part of my postdoc, I have been quantifying the evolutionary potential for delta smelt persisting in a warming habitat. Um, and as we know, delta smelt are endemic to the San Francisco estuary, but are currently endangered with very few individuals left in the wild. And to prevent the extinction of the species, a refuge and hatchery population was created in 2008, where their goals were to stock for restoration and eventual supplementation. And to do this, the hatchery breeds using a pedigree so that they can maintain really high genetic diversity in the hatchery population. But one environmental factor that are uh, threatening delta smelt are rising temperatures in the bay, and we don't yet know how delta smelt will respond to these rising temperatures. We can measure an animal's thermal tolerance by measuring their critical thermal maximum, which is a repeatable and comparable measure of the maximum temperature that an animal can withstand. There are two different mechanisms for how delta smelt could increase their temperature tolerance. The first is phenotypic plasticity. So if we were to rear delta smelt at a warmer temperature, they could shift their thermal performance curve and increase their CTM. Another mechanism is genetic adaptation or evolution. So in this case, 
there needs to be genetic variation for thermal tolerance that is present in the hatchery population. So now the different colors here represent different genotypes that are present in the hatchery population. So to get at these two mechanisms of thermal tolerance, we used a quantitative genetic design to breed fish. So for example, in this design, we have uh, five sires that are being bred with two different females and their offspring are split and reared at either a cool or a warm temperature. And because we're also interested in looking at the genetic diversity for thermal tolerance, we also bred fish with different levels of hatchery ancestry, uh, also known as their domestication index. So we included fish of low, medium, and high DI, um, which is just a reflection of how many generations their ancestors have spent in the hatchery. So these quantitative genetic breeding designs are a really powerful tool to separate the factors that um, define a phenotype, which is a combination of your genotype and the environment that you find yourself in. So for example, we may hypothesize that fish will have a higher thermal tolerance um, if they're reared at the warmer temperature, and we can get at plasticity because we have um, full siblings that are reared at two different temperatures. So we can hold the family or the genotype constant to look at the plasticity me mechanism. We can also estimate the genetic component by looking at variation around CTM values uh, that is due to your parent identity. So because in this design, we have half siblings that share the same dam, but different sires, any variation we see in those thermal tolerances um, between fish that have different sires can be attributed to parent identity and therefore their uh, sire genotype. So after our fish have been acclimated to the temperatures until they're about three months of age, we measured the CTMs for 3000 fish. And so each individual dot on here represents an individual fish that was reared at either 15 or 18 degrees Celsius. Overall, we see that their uh, CTMs were higher if they were reared at the warmer temperature. But also su surprisingly, we saw that fish with a higher domestication index also had higher CTM values. And this was really unexpected because these fish have spent many generations in the hatchery where it's supposedly very cool and constant. So there isn't really anything uh, maintaining uh, temperature tolerance in the hatchery, especially when they're not being exposed to these stressful temperatures. So looking into the future and thinking about the implications for the Delta Smelt release plans, we want to be releasing fish that we think will have the highest fitness in the wild. Uh, so when thinking about thermal tolerance, one of the things we could do is to perhaps uh, rear Delta Smelt at a slightly warmer temperature uh, prior to their release, so they have a little bit of a higher uh, temperature tolerance. We could also focus on releasing fish of higher domestication, since we saw that they had higher thermal tolerances as well. Of course, we will need future work to actually look at the fitness of these hatchery individuals in the wild as well. And these experiments were a lot of work, so I have lots of people that helped that I would like to thank, and of course, my funding needs agency. Thank you, Jo. Thank you, Joanna. I I actually think we have a quick time for one quick question, if there is one. Seeing none. <laughs> oh, yeah. You want to come to the microphone? Yes, I'm sorry. I have a comment. Um, you, you know, just given that we can't really get any more wild fish into the hatchery, we are in fact uh, releasing higher DI to the smell the perfect hatchery, <laughs> whether we like it or not. So, yeah, yeah, cool. Great, thank you. Um, so, with that, I'll introduce our next speaker, who is Reed Hoshovsky, um, who will speak about subsurface chlorophyll in the northern San Francisco estuary. All right, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Rita Shovsky. I'm a graduate student researcher at the Estuary and Ocean Science Center out in San Francisco. And today I'm going to be talking to you about my upcoming thesis project, which concerns subsurface chlorophyll in the northern San Francisco estuary, which I'm just going to be calling the estuary for time. Um, and so this first figure is to prove to you that I'm not crazy and that um, chlorophyll is well distributed uh, throughout the entire water column uh, in the estuary. Um, and so this is vertical profiles from uh, five stations uh, from the USGS over a 20 year period. Um, 
And so despite chlorophyll being well mixed from surface to depth in the estuary, only chlorophyll or phytoplankton from the top two meters of the water column are used to calibrate a very important primary productivity model for this estuary from which all of us get our annual estimates of primary production. And so since this model is essentially estimating the base of the pelagic food web in the estuary, uh, it's important that we're getting accurate uh, numbers out of this model. And so uh, the most recent study to actually re-employ this model uh, back about a decade ago found that it was producing overestimates for the estuary, um, which uh, may be masking the problem of food limitation uh, uh, for pelagic fishes. And so I think it's important to revisit some of the original assumptions that the model made back when it was developed in the 1980s. Um, and one of these assumptions is that phytoplankton from the surface are representative of all phytoplankton throughout the entire water column. And another way to say this is that rates of vertical mixing in the estuary are always greater than the rates at, the rates at which um, phytoplankton can change their physiology, specifically in a process called photoacclimation, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and so in the days since the model was developed, we've actually learned quite a bit about vertical mixing and photoacclimation in phytoplankton. And it turns out that these two processes occur on timescales that actually overlap. And so it's important to um, conduct a study to see how these two processes uh, interact in the estuary through time and space um, and make sure that this assumption is still valid to make. And so what is photoacclimation? Uh, this is a biological process by which a photosynthetic organism can adjust its photosynthetic apparatus in response to highly variable light conditions. And so one way to display uh, photoacclimation in phytoplankton is by plotting the rate of photosynthesis or plotting a light curve which tracks the rate of photosynthesis over a range of available light um, and in a water column. And so if the original assumption of the model is true, then we would expect phytoplankton sampled from any depth in the water column to exhibit very similar light curves because they won't have a chance to photoacclimate. But if the assumption is not true uh, and photoacclimation is a process that can occur, then we would expect to see very or significantly different um, light curves from phytoplankton sampled from different depths. And so phytoplankton from the surface might be represented by a medium light acclimated curve, which has a high photosynthetic capacity at high available lights, typical of surface water. And if we, uh, and phytoplankton from depths would be characterized by a very low light acclimated curve, which would um, be characterized by a very high efficient use of light at low available lights. And so the way that I'm planning on testing this assumption and building these light curves is by conducting incubations uh, with chlor chlorophyll or phytoplankton sampled from many depths and incubating them over a broad range of light availability that would be characteristic of a water column. And so I'll be using isotopes of carbon and nitrogen to track photosynthesis in each of these bottles. And with these components, I'll be able to build light curves for each depth that I sample at uh, to test to see if photoacclimation is occurring uh, in this estuary. And so some of my expectations from this project would be to generate uh, in situ depth integrated primary productivity data, which is quite rare in this estuary. Um, I'll also be determining if and when photoacclimation occurs. Uh, there can be some seasonality to it, depending on fresh water flow, tides, and wind. Um, and last, uh, I'll either um, uh, I'll, I'll either validate or I'll prove an assumption wrong of a very important model that we all make use of uh, to estimate based the pelagic food web. And so with that, I'd like to thank my uh, advisors and my lab and my funders and my contact information is up here if you'd like to get in touch uh, or collaborate. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Reed. And we actually have time for one quick question if there is one in the audience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Reed. All right. Our next speaker is Leticia Cavoli, and they will be talking about fitness trade offs for migratory and resident delta smelt. Try to pull this up. This one? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Leticia Cavoli. I'm a postdoc at the Otterly Geochemist and Fisher College Lab at UC Davis. Today, I'm going to be talking about fitness trade-offs in that smelt. So I'd like to introduce you the concept of partial migration, which is 
when in a fish population we have both resident and uh, migratory uh, contingents or groups. And this is believed to buffer the entire population against uh, extinction because these multiple contingents can use different aquatic environments. Um, there are a lot of theories uh, about how partial migration has evolved, but generally it's believed that the fish, for example, in an anadromous species, fish that go into coastal environments, they uh, are going to encounter highly productive environments, um, but also at a higher risk of predation, while the contingents that stay in freshwater environments, they have less food uh, availability and less predation. But the overall result is that those that migrate are larger in body size. And this is true across many uh, fish lineages, as for example, in these uh, extensive meta-analysis that use more than 4,500 species, migratory fish and contingents have larger body size than no migratory. And as you know, uh, being a big female matters a lot because there is a high parametric relationship between the female body mass here in the x-axis and the reproductive output. So in a simple way uh, of putting that, that means that a big uh, female cod would produce the same amount um, of eggs than 37 smaller females. But how about the strains in non-commercial species such as the delta smelt? As you know, that smelt is a pelagic forage fish, super important in the San Francisco estuary. Uh, it's at high risk of extinction, and it lives in the upper reaches of uh, this ecosystem. But only recently, uh, people folks in my lab have discovered that this species also has partial migration strategy, which means it has a complex life history. Um, and here in this picture, I'm showing this the main uh, phenotypes or uh, groups uh, involved on this. So we have the migratory uh, groups, which go into the upper reaches of the estuary to reproduce in the winter and spring, and then come back to the downstream habitats to forage. And we also have freshwater residents that remain throughout their life cycles in the upper reaches of the estuary. And we have the brackish water residents that stay in the low saline zone. So we, we asked how uh, these doubt smelt migrants, if they have higher fitness, than residents, and how hydroclimatic conditions influence this body fitness and reproductive fitness. So we run uh, generalized additive models. Uh, it's a little bit complex. So today I'm going to be focusing on the effects of ear uh, and these different phenotypes on the body weight of this fish. We used 842 fish. And here, each color is a uh, contingent. We have in blue migrants, green freshwater residents, and red brackish water residents. And what we observed is that migrants were uh, marginally heavier than the residents, as we expected, but that was not significant. Um, it, this is distinct from other smelt in other ecosystems, such as the European smelt and the Wakasak, that usually the migrant contingents are much larger than the residents. And when we examine uh, the body weight across years, spawning years actually, we observe that during strong drought years, uh, the body mass was reduced. Now looking at the gonad weight um, as a function of the total weight uh, by phenotype, we observe that the freshwater residents actually had uh, larger gonads and heavier gonads uh, than the migrants. And again, during a uh, strong uh, drought years, the gonad uh, mass was reduced. And that's potentially due to gonad atresia and egg degeneration. Now, uh, one of the most important results, uh, we were also trying to predict how the fecundity, here is the clutch fecundity, the number of eggs uh, varies across these phenotypes. What we observed is that the migratory groups and the brackish water residents, they have um, much more eggs than the freshwater residents but the freshwater residents had larger eggs. So as conclusions, migrants, uh, they were more fecund than freshwater residents, but freshwater residents had larger eggs. Uh, and overall, uh, this fitness was reduced during uh, strong drought years. So if that smelt asks, should I stay or should I go? We would suggest they, sh they should do both because both strategies uh, are important to maintain the population in the long-term, the remaining population. 
and um, we recommend these three points. And thank you so much for listening and for all the funding. We have time for one quick question, if there are any. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just asked if she looked at the Brackish Water residents and how they compare. Yes, the Brackish Water residents, they were usually... Um, the red dotted line here, um, they behave, depending on the metric, more similar with the migrants groups or with the freshwater. But overall, they are very, like the proportion in the Delta Smart population is pretty small, is usually like 5 to 6% of the population are brackish water. So it's mostly migrants, 85%, 80%, and then freshwater. Thank you. Thank you, Letitia. All right, our next speaker is Christina Birdie and from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And Christina will talk about drought and salt and zooplankton. Okay. Hi, everybody. I am Christina. I'll be presenting for Arthur Barrows today, and we're going to look at how drought conditions affect the distribution and abundance of zooplankton in the estuary. And this is part of a larger uh, collaborative effort, the drought synthesis, which I think you'll be hearing about a little bit later. Uh, so to do this, we looked at uh, zooplankton data from the Environmental Monitoring Program from 1994 to 2021, and we classified a drought year type as two consecutive, two or more consecutive years with the Sacramento Valley Index of below normal, dry, or critically dry, and then a wet year type was two consecutive years with the index of above normal or wet, and then a neutral year was no consecutive years of either type. We focused on four uh, different zooplankton taxa based on their importance to the native fishes in this region. We looked at the Clodosteran daphnia, uh, the mycid hyper hypercanthomyces longirostris, the cyclopoid copepod limnoithona, and the calanoid copepod pseudodioptimus forbici. And we wanted to look at how their distributions changed during droughts. And so to do that, we looked at four key regions in the estuary, uh, the more brackish Sassoon Bay and Sassoon Marsh, uh, the confluence, and then the more freshwater region of the South Central Delta. Uh, and just looking at some results from those regional impacts. So this is a, a heat map, which shows the um, percent change in BPUE and red is an increase and blue is a decrease. Uh, and then we have the regions on the Y axis and the taxa on the X axis. And overall, um, during drought years, uh, Daphnia and Pseudodioptimus significantly decreased in the Sassoon region, so Sassoon Bay and Sassoon Marsh. Uh, Pseudodioptimus also significantly increased upstream in the south central delta. And then uh, Limnoithona and Hyprocanthomyces both saw increases overall. And this is uh, specifically the case in the confluence where both species increased. And Limnoithona increased in all of the regions, um, sometimes up to 200% increase in uh, Sassoon Marsh. And so we wanted to examine um, some of the drivers of these regional differences, uh, and we did that using uh, generalized additive models uh, and found that salinity was a significant factor in predicting zooplankton abundance, which shouldn't really be a surprise to a lot of us here. <laughs> um, and to further dive into that a little bit, what we did was we determined the optimal salinity zone for each taxa, which is essentially um, how like the salinity range where these taxa occur. And we did that by looking at the mean and standard deviation of that salinity range per each sampling event. And we weighted it by the BPUE. Uh, and this is just a graph of those overall changes where we have the log of the BPUE on the y-axis and then the year type, either drought or wet year type on the x-axis. 
and um, the taxa, and then their optimal salinity zone under each ax, uh, under each taxa. Uh, and overall, the uh, limnoid fauna significantly increased during drought years. However, there was no um, other significant changes between the taxa overall. Um, uh, so in conclusion, um, during droughts, flow decreases uh, and the salinity field shifts more upstream. And this can affect the uh, less salt tolerant taxa, such as Pseudodiaptimus and Daphnia, which shift upstream as well. Uh, and one of the important things about this is that it decreases these important prey resources in Sassoon Bay and Sassoon Marsh, which is a key rearing habitat for fishes. Uh, Hyperacanthomyces and limnoithona either remained unchanged or increased during drought years, and this is likely because of their higher salinity tolerance overall. Uh, and then these changes in the distribution and also abundance during these times represent uh, a potential challenges for environmental management, specifically uh, managing endangered species such as long fin smelt and delta smelt, and then also um, the timing and location of releasing hatchery fishes. And with that, thank you. And we, again, have time for a question, if, if there is any. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Our next speaker is Emily Richardson from USGS, who will be speaking about modeling light attenuation in the Delta. Hi, I'm Emily Richardson. I'm a water quality researcher with USGS, and today I get to tell you about how we've modeled light attenuation in the Delta. But spoiler, I'm amending this title because in the end, only one parameter wasn't important enough, was important enough to be included in the model, but I won't tell you which one just yet. Many factors influence light attenuation in the Delta, including turbidity, which scatters light, urban runoff and nutrient loading, agricultural runoff and pesticides, and dissolved organic matter, which absorb light, and phytoplankton, which uptake light for photosynthesis. But why do we even care about light attenuation? What even is it? Uh, light attenuation is the measurement of how far photosynthetically active radiation can move through the water column. So the more attenuated light is in a water body, the shorter the range of PAR is. Shorter range of PARs can have many downstream effects, pun intended, including disrupting photosynthesis and primary production. So it messes with the food web at the lowest, lowest trophic level, can alter predator and prey relationships for sighted creatures, can select for mobile species, which can navigate through the water column to find their optimum light level, and it can lessen the degradation of light sensitive matter and contaminants. But how do we measure a moving parameter? Well, we can use a constant called the diffuse attenuation coefficient of PAR or KD PAR. Now, this co uh, coefficient is a little difficult to measure. You need to take multiple PAR measurements at multiple depths. So this means that long-term sensor deployment is unfeasible. Instead, you can use surface level water quality parameters to model KD PAR, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, the field uh, collection effort took place in 2013 and 2014 at this really wide range of locations in the Delta. Um, at each of these locations, a PAR measure was uh, put through the water column every a half meter in depth until it reached a depth of about three and a half meters or until the light went extinct, whichever went, whichever came first. Uh, KD PAR was then calculated as the slope of the log transformed PAR measurements with depth over depth. You'll see here that these locations are also color coded by region. These regions were input into the model selection um, data set as a categorical variable. Also included in the data set were surface level turbidity, dissolved organic matter, chlorophyll, pH, water temp, and salinity. And then I also grabbed some open sourced um, data from CIMIS, including solar radiation, and also two that I transformed. The first one was a numerical sort of season proxy, which was the running sum of air temp by water year. 
And then one that was sort of a drought flood condition proxy, which was the run, running sum of precipitation by water year. So to find and remove covariable parameters, I ran a variance inflation factor test with stepwise or backwards removal. Uh, and this left me with my final testing data set, including turbidity, chlorophyll, pH, water temp, salinity, and that season proxy. On that pared down data set, I ran a stepwise regression with backwards removal, which left me with my final model containing turbidity only, big shocker. Uh, and this was a highly performant model. Um, this, uh, the best performing model was the one that had the smallest error. Um, and you can see here, um, just blows you away, uh, blows me away at least. Uh, and so now there are anywhere there are service level turbidity measurements, we can predict KD par. We can apply this to very spatially dense data like USGS mapping surveys, very temporally dense data like time series. This one here is for, at Grizzly Bay, for instance. Um, and now we can use these estimations to input into euphoto depth um, calculations into habitat suitability models. Uh, what I'm particularly excited about is primary productivity models. Maybe we'll use Reed's new model. Uh, and yeah, that's how we modeled light attenuation in the Delta. Thank you. Everybody's been so efficient in the session. We do have time for a question if there are any. Over there. Um, there's a very nonlinear relationship between FNU and another measure of turbidity, Secchi depth. And I'm curious whether you invested, um, looked at how the model looks when you're using Secchi depth instead of um, FNU. Yeah, um, we actually did. Uh, I used Secchi depth um, and I performed just like a really quick regression against Secchi depth and KD par. Uh, and our data had just no correlation at all. So I, I didn't even try it in the, the model and data set. I think actually we can take one more question. Was there one over here? Maybe, maybe not. All right. Well, thank you, Emily. All right. Our next speaker is Ravi Nagaharan. Um, from UC Davis, and he will be speaking about eDNA in monitoring fishes and invertebrates in the Delta. Okay, what did I just do? Oh, that is not what I wanted. Thank you, Lynn, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk today. So today I'll be talking about environmental DNA metabarcoding um, on Delta water samples. Um, and this has this potential to be this incredibly powerful, non-invasive tool to understand what species are in the water. And the reason why we can do this in the first place is because the Delta is this rich stew of information in the form of environmental DNA. So um, just like if you were to be blindfolded and try to take a spoonful of the liquid of a stew and to guess all the ingredients that were in there, metabarcoding would tell you, um, these are all the species that are, in the, that are in the water, even though you can't physically or directly observe them. So, okay, that sounds like a great idea. Um, and how can we tailor that so it's really accurate and efficient and works well for the specific ecosystem that we're studying here? So um, we took an approach of, performing DNA sequencing on multiple DNA barcodes. So um, there are multiple different types of barcodes. All bar barcodes are not created equal, um, and some have different um, taxonomic biases that make them more or less useful. Um, so we chose two fish-centered barcodes and two more invertebrate-centered barcodes. And we collect replicate water samples at a site, get the DNA, which is that from that stew, and then we'd sequence these four barcodes um, to try to determine uh, which fish and invertebrate species were present. So in order to really make this, um, to really understand this fully and to understand its relevance to management in the ecosystem, we paired our study with existing gear-based monitoring. So uh, we collected um, eDNA samples in collaboration with the EDSM Kodiak and 20 millimeter trawls, as well as with the um, the uh, rotary screw trap in the Yellow Bypass toe drain. 
And when we looked at just the sum of our data to date of eDNA uh, species detections for fish, in this case, um, we found that we could detect 34 different fish species with eDNA compared to a total of 17 for the gear-based monitoring. And if we dive in a little bit uh, more deeply into the 20 millimeter eDNA associated data, um, we can see the actual fish species that we detected. Um, so here's all the species that we detected over nine different sampling events for the 20 millimeter, along with the 20 millimeter uh, survey. Um, some species were detected more frequently than others. Um, and I just wanted to note that we detected the uh, state endangered, state listed longfin smelt at two sites. So these are not the number of fish, obviously, but the number of detections. Um, and so the question was then, how does this compare then to what the gear uh, monitoring looks like? So specifically for the 20 millimeter, um, there are 26 species detection events um, for the 20 millimeter gear um, for the samples we had paired data for. Of those 26 detections, 15 were also detected by eDNA, including the two long fin detections, um, and 11 uh, gear detections were not detected by eDNA. However, there are 66 other detections that were eDNA only. Um, and when we look at the other gear-based comparisons, so we're still uh, analyzing the data that we have, but what we've got so far is a similar pattern to what we saw with the 20 millimeter comparison, where um, we're seeing a, a, a larger number of eDNA detections um, and a partial overlap with the gear-based detections. So, um, so that's kind of where we are with the fish detections now. So I think we're, I was really um, just you know, pretty blown away by the data, honestly. Um, for the invertebrate detections, using the other vertebrate, uh, invertebrate barcodes, um, what we found is we still have kind of preliminary data on this, but we're finding from the same water sample by sequencing these other barcodes, we can detect invertebrate um, species that are relevant to the food web and to the ecology of the ecosystem in general, um, like diatoms, copepods, and in this particular sample, the Asian clam corbicula. So I think we have a lot of work still to do to refine the system, to refine the method, and also to you know, really get the right combination and number of barcodes, the most efficient uh, barcodes to really you know, be best suited for the environment that we're trying to detect eDNA in. Um, but we think this has like, a lot of potential as a um, non-invasive complement to existing gear-based monitoring. So. Uh, thank you to all my collaborators. Thank you very much. All right, and we have time for a question if anybody has one for Ravi. Oh, we got two. Oh, boy. <laughs> Sorry. Anna, I'm on your side. Hey, Ravi. Um, did you find that 12S or the 16S was way more uh, efficient at uh, defining to species? Which one was the winner? So it, most species could be detected for fish. Most species could be detected by either, but not always in the same sample. And that might just be, um, we're just not that great at using the barcodes yet. But um, for now, I think we need both. So for example, the long fin detections were 16S only. Um, and I think over time, it'd be great to just be able to use one. But right now, I think we need two. Yeah. We have time for one more question, I think. So... I'm working on a water primrose project and we're planning on using eDNA for some of our analysis, but more of trying to count it as biodiversity metric. So I'm kind of curious about the species that weren't captured by the eDNA, but by uh, the sampling that you did, like some of the reasoning for why it may have not have popped up in the eDNA, even right. though you guys have found it. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's a couple of different possibilities. One is that, um, the, the species was present, but there wasn't a lot of DNA in the water from that species. So they recently just came into the scene, didn't release a lot of DNA, or it's just uh, essentially a false negative of the eDNA approach and it was not uh, detected. Thanks. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, our next speaker is Christian Denny from UC Davis, who will speak about um, using FixCell Plus as a fixative. All right, thanks everyone for, uh, for coming. And in the spirit of speed talk, I will get right into it. 
So um, delta smelt populations have been declining for decades, and in particular, um, in particular in recent years, as we've seen in a lot of talks today, there have been very few wild caught fish um, in in our uh, monitoring uh, surveys, and. Every one of those fish is potentially really valuable. They can be used in a lot of different ways with different tissue types, including calcified hard parts like otoliths, uh, gonads and other organs or muscle tissue uh, for stable isotope. And so it's a really important question of um, how can we get the maximal use from every one of these increasingly limited um, samples? And one of the ways uh, we can think about that is how we handle and preserve the fish. So we designed an experiment where we compared uh, various fixatives, including the three traditional ones, uh, ethanol, formalin, and liquid nitrogen, to a proposed novel fixative XL+, plus, which is a formalin uh, derivative that is uh, purported to be safer and easier to use. So fish were um, stored, cultured fish from the FCCL were stored in each of these fixatives and then removed at various time points. And at each of those time points, a variety of uh, metrics correlating with different possible uses of different tissues uh, were examined. So uh, I'll get right into it first with uh, morphometrics. So to orient you to this plot, each column is a different fixative and the two rows, the top is change in standard length and the bottom is change in weight with uh, different time points on the x-axis of each plot. And so um, as we can see for change in standard length, all of the fixatives were approximately equal, relatively low changes, generally less than 5%. Um, and there weren't really big differences between them. However, in change in weight, we can see that liquid nitrogen is um, the clear winner. It had almost no change in weight whatsoever, whereas all the other fixatives had um, varying amounts of uh, change in weight from um, 20 to 40%. However, all of those were also relatively consistent. And as long as it's something you're aware of, it, uh, it's something you could still uh, deal with. Um, very briefly on histology, there's a lot of uh, stuff going on in this figure that I'm, so I'm not gonna talk about the details, um, but basically, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, formalin was the gold standard uh, winner for histology samples. That's what's generally used for histo histological samples. Um, and XL+, plus, which is similar to formalin and is often touted for um, soft tissues, performed well, but not as well as uh, formalin um, and had better results than uh, eth uh, liquid nitrogen and especially ethanol, which was not particularly good at fixing tissues for histological um, analyses. Um, so moving on to otolith structures, which is a lot of what we do in the lab. So again, each column here is a different fixative. The different rows are time points, and each picture is an electron uh, microscope image of an otolith uh, removed at that time point. Um, the first thing you notice, ethanol and liquid nitrogen on the edge did a great job of preserving the otoliths. There's even at six months, there's almost no signs of degradation of cracking, breaking, or um, calcium uh, decal or decalcification, as opposed to both the formalin and the XL+, plus, which even after one week, there were extensive amounts of cracking in the otolith, and after a month, and at six months in particular, there was large amounts of pitting, and especially uh, decalcification, most particularly in the XL+, plus sample, where almost all the calcium is gone, and it's mostly the um, protein matrix that remains, and this makes any kind of uh, structural aging and growth analysis of the otolith borderline impossible. However, it's potential that even though we wouldn't be able to count rings or measure a microstructure like that, that maybe the otolith chemistry um, remained uh, intact. And we also looked at the trace element chemistry. So here each plot is a different um, elemental signature. Uh, time points are on the x-axis and the um, signal is on the y-axis and each line is a different fixative on the plot. And as you can see by week 24, which is six months, the XL plus chemical signature was just dramatically different than every other one of the fixatives. And while you can't see it here because the, uh, the six month signal is so outsized, uh, it was also significantly different by week four, uh, which is one month. So basically if otoliths that have been stored in XL plus, you just can't trust the, the chemical signature in the, um, from those, uh, those otoliths at all. So in conclusion, every one of these um, fixatives has its pros and cons um, in ways in which it is uh, better, either in how easy it is to use, what different kinds of tissues it preserves and how well it preserves them. Um, and while I had to go through all of these results really fast, I hope that um, you either had a chance or will have a chance tomorrow to see Alex Lama's poster that goes into more detail about a lot of uh, these results. Um, but the conclusion is, uh, we think that uh, probably a default should be liquid nitrogen, which we think is a good balance between all the different tissues at the cost of being kind of tricky and expensive to store and use. However, um, every one of these fixatives probably has its place as long as you are cognizant of the costs and benefits um, and that you are with most of the others, you will probably be giving up 
one or another potential metric of a given um, delta smelt sample. So um, liquid nitrogen we think is a good default, but if you have a very good reason to be using one of the others where it is worth giving up another potential use of that sample, uh, it would be um, appropriate to do so. And uh, with that, I'm done. I'll take it. I think hopefully I have time for one question. We have, we have time for one question. <laughs> did you look at uh dna oh uh, we did not um i someone from kramer sciences at afs made a kind of throwaway comment that xl plus did not work very well for genetics for them um but that was not the main point of their work so i'm that's kind of tentative and we, we have not examined genetics yet that is which is an important thing to look at as well Thank you, Christian. Um, our next speaker and our final speaker, but not least for sure, is Andrew Goodwin, uh, who will be from the US uh, Army Corps, who will be speaking about fish movement, guidance and entrainment in water management operations. Thank you. My name is Andy Goodwin. I'm gonna be talking about near-term prediction of fish movement guidance and entrainment with regard to water management operations across different reservoir, as well as tidal river environments. So what we've been working on the last 10 years is a way to improve a methodology uh, that will predict what fish will do ahead of time um, before we actually do it. That is, uh, we either engineer or we manage something different in the river. Will fish enter or will they not uh, a particular area of the river, maybe highlighted with uh, uh, the, the dashed oval there, uh, or uh, will they entrain not entrain in a particular uh, divergence uh, or structure of interest. This work has actually been going on for a quarter century, uh, and I've been involved with it uh, since the beginning. Uh, for the first 15 years, our focus was on reservoirs and hydropower dams in the Corps of Engineers portfolio, as well as uh, hydropower companies, uh, fish uh, passage, so on and so forth. And the now outdated scientific methodology that I'm gonna be uh, building on was highlighted uh, nine years ago in uh, this publication in PANAS. The updated methodology, which builds off of that prior work, uh, which we, again, have been working on the last 10 years, will hopefully be out shortly in Frontiers and a special issue on cognitive movement ecology. What we've done here is update uh, our approach to uh, cognition <clears throat> and computational neuroscience. And with these new algorithms and mathematics, we have been able to show how different behaviors emerge from the animal's recent past experience using uh, different um, timescales of uh, memory, habituation, and acclimatization. What's really kind of interesting is that we've been able to show, which I will uh, get to in a couple of slides, that it appears that selective tidal stream transport in the context of the Bay Delta and juvenile Pacific salmon appears to be a conceptual superset hypothesis of what these fish are doing in reservoir and dam environments. So there seems to be the real true prospect that we can come up with a unified singular behavior repertoire that can do it all. And it seems like it's at our fingertips. We can do both, just right now, they don't have the same parameterization, but uh, we have a lot of optimism that, that is achievable in the next <clears throat> year or so. These are the core results. Um, what we were able to do is take a rather, rather uh, limited uh, data set uh, at Georgiana Slough, where we were trying to uh, describe how many fish go down the Sacramento versus going to Georgiana. As probably many of you can gather, the tidal dynamics make this far more complicated than the relatively steady flow that you get in a reservoir. Um, uh, at, you know, for instance, a large dam, you have the uh, flow reversing direction, uh, depending on the time of year, you have fish exhibiting a lot of different uh, movement modalities. Nonetheless, using a relatively limited data set, 
uh, for 2009, we were able to calibrate the model. Uh, we pretty much just have five parameters that can be tuned manually. You can get more fancy and apply machine learning or quantitative optimization, but you can do it manually. We then show that the model results are robust if you then uh, impose or you do a reduced order form uh, of modeling of the river. Uh, we 3D and 4D uh, hydrodynamics. Well, what can you get away with 2D? They're a lot easier to deploy and develop. We show that the results are robust and remain accurate, even if you calibrate in 3D, but you're like, you know, I only got the money to do 2D. Um, that's that middle column. Then more important is uh, without changing the model from the left-hand column, we were able to apply the model to 2014 conditions. So the flow is a little bit different, but in 2014, there is a novel fish guidance structure that was not there in our calibration data set. And this is how we wanna use the model. You have what you have in the past. Can you predict what fish will do relative to novel conditions that the calibration does not see? What you're seeing in each subplot uh, on the y-axis is what the model prediction uh, the model predicts in terms of entrainment, zero to 100%, and on the x-axis, what was observed with telemetry, but it could be hydroacoustics, fixed location, uh, mobile hydroacoustics. There are a lot of different ways to get at uh, your entrainment numbers. Uh, but you can see that behavior does matter. Uh, you don't get the right results by just doing passive particles really well. So it's great to have really good passive uh, particles, but it doesn't get you over the finish line. Um, with regard to the behavior rules, this is what we have found. If you just look at that top row, it's a repertoire of basically five behaviors, all of which um, are heavily talked about in the literature. And in our manuscript, we'll give the full uh, distillation of, you know, uh, so in, some in some cases, uh, over a century of uh, journal literature that defends one or more of these uh, hydrodynamic responses. But if you bring them together and you integrate them uh, from a cognitive uh, perspective, from the fish's point of view, you can mathematically integrate these so that the fish is trading these behaviors off in time. And with that top row of behaviors, you can describe juvenile Pacific salmon, not only in the tidal river hydrodynamics of the Georgiana Slough Junction, but also um, across 50 data sets uh, in reservoir environments, uh, basically 70 total data sets that represent somewhere between 65 and $100 million worth of telemetry and CFD collected over the last 30 years. And it doesn't stop here. Uh, later, um, we'll be showing that we can invert these hypotheses and describe uh, benthic-oriented movement of upstream migrating eels in other parts of the country. So it looks like um, um, there's some opportunity for continued growth. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. All right, well, please give a big hand to all of our lightning talk speakers. And just before you head out on break, I just want to remind you that the next session will start at 340 and it will be uh, the synthesis team. So hear all about synthesis at 340 after the break. Thank you. I think we're about to get started here. All right, folks, last session of the day, the best session of the day. You could all take your seats, please. That was a gentle hint, we're starting. 
We're starting. All right, thank you everyone for sticking it out for the last session of the day. Uh, and this last session is gonna be focused on IEP synthesis. And as, as Louise was talking about this morning, synthesis is really the use of all of the wonderful data that IEP's monitoring programs have been collecting. And it's a pretty broad term. It encompasses a lot. And this synthesis session is trying to showcase just a few of the synthesis projects that are being worked on at IEP. And they come from different levels of that synthesis pyramid. So our first talk is going to be on data integration and open science. Then we'll have two talks from kind of the middle of the pyramid where teams have uh, worked together to look at data in different ways and answer scientific questions. And then the last talk is gonna be from that top of the pyramid, using it synthesis to distill information and inform a management decision. So uh, for our first talk, we have Sarah Perry from the Department of Water Resources in her very first uh, in-person talk. And um, she's gonna be talking about the phytoplankton enumeration synthesis project. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Perry, and I'm an environmental scientist at the California Department of Water Resources. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about a project um, as part of the interagency ecological program um, that I am leading, known as the Phytoplankton Enumeration Synthesis Project, or PESP, um, that has the main goal of uh, synthesizing the various phytoplankton data sets throughout the Delta. Um, and so background information about why this is important and um, why this exists. Um, so as most of you know, phytoplankton is in a very important part of the San Francisco Delta ecosystem. Um, and it's an important driver for zooplankton productivity. Um, it's used as a food supply for trophic levels. And in order to tackle the various research and management questions that we have related to phytoplankton, it's important that we collect a lot of data um, that varies both uh, spatially and temporally. Um, these projects can target things such as low primary productivity or the relationship between phytoplankton and other ecological drivers. And phytoplankton has been um, sort of a hot topic recently in our community. Um, we've had a lot of recent projects that have been focusing on it. Um, some of these are looking at the effects of microcystis and other harmful algal blooms on the Delta. Others are looking at the effects of droughts on phytoplankton and how that has been leading to an increase in these harmful algal blooms that we've been seeing lately. Um, and other things uh, from a management side is we've been doing things like flow action events to try to increase the primary productivity within the Delta. Um, and so see, these are just uh, some of the projects that have been using these phytoplankton data sets. And so the good news is uh, we do collect a lot of phytoplankton data. Um, multiple agencies and groups uh, uh, spearhead these efforts throughout the Delta, ones at DWR, such as mine at the Environmental Monitoring Program, CDFW, USGS, um, in addition to some others. However, if you actually look at the literature and the research, um, a lot of these data sets haven't been utilized to their fullest extent um, due to the challenges and complications with uh, using phytoplankton data. And a lot of researchers has been, have been using um, chlorophyll data as sort of a proxy for primary productivity, which definitely works and is useful, but doesn't really give you the full picture of what's happening within these communities. And there's been two main challenges um, that a lot of researchers have been running into when utilizing these data sets. Um, one is the accessibility of the individual data sets. And the other, which is one of the bigger goals of PESP is the standardization between them. Um, so to talk a little bit about the um, accessibility issues that people have run into. So um, as many of you probably have noticed, not a lot of these data sets are currently publicly accessible. Either they're housed in private data sets, um, some are just in Excel sheets like in my program currently. Um, and so that's definitely a challenge for researchers having to reach out, having to find the contact for the groups and all that. And it can be, it can be a hassle to get this data. In addition, a lot of groups um, host their data individually with no other references to other data sets within the Delta. Um, so it can be difficult for people to know if they're actually getting all the data that's out there that they can be utilizing. Um, there's no one hub to see it all. And these are problems that um, a lot of different types of data sets have within um, the Delta community. 
Um, but something that's uh, more specific to phytoplankton is that the raw data sets that you get back from your contractors that the groups work with can be very difficult to interpret if you're not a subject matter expert. Um, on the bottom right, um, this is just a brief picture of all of the columns that uh, uh, that are in our data set when we get it back from our contractors. Um, and some of these columns are useful off the bat, some aren't, some are only useful in specific cases or after being converted into certain um, values. And it can, be, it can be very challenging to use this data um, without having someone who has cleaned it up for you and providing guidance on how best to do so. And that leads into the second main issue, which is standardization. So say you get all the data sets you want, you have them, you, you're sure you have all the data you need. Um, but as I alluded to in the previous slide, phytoplankton data is very complicated. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that there are so many different types of phytoplankton of different shapes and sizes and densities and clustering mechanisms. And the best way to collect your data and to interpret your data is very dependent on your species of interests. And what that means is, is between all these programs collecting data, there's a lot of differences in the metadata, um, both between the programs and even within the data itself. Um, EMP has been collecting data since 1975. We've had change in contractors, change in methods. Um, so, there are, so there are a lot of differences. Um, and there's a couple of main issues in terms of standardization. One is non-standardized taxonomy. Um, phytoplankton data, uh, taxonomy changes a lot through all the different taxa levels, um, and different groups are um, adapt these changes at different rates. Uh, so one data set may call something one thing, and another data set might call it something else. So you really need a good handle of all the different synonyms for all of the uh, species of interest. In, in addition, there's a lot of different ways to report phytoplankton data. There's biovolume, there's biomass, there's natural units, there's cells per milliliter. Um, and so you need to make sure that the data you're using is all reported in the same way and that it's also the best way to use it um, for the questions that you're asking. And the last problem um, that a lot of people run into is there's a lot of differences in laboratory and field methods, such as different net sizes or different magnification levels to look at the phytoplankton. Um, and because phytoplankton is so varied, this can lead to large biases in what you actually observe in your samples. And because of this, this means that um, depending on the metadata for these different data sets, the data might not necessarily be directly comparable or it's not comparable um, unless you do a lot of interpretation. And so you really need a good handle on all of the methods that are used for every single data set before you're able to properly um, synthesize them and use them. And so this is just um, one brief example about why uh, this sort of effort is important. Um, this slide was provided to me by Ted Flynn from the um, North Delta uh, uh, Flow Action Project. Um, and all you need to know about NMDS for this slide is that phytoplankton communities that are similar are bunched closer together. And if you look at this before slide, um, what you would see here is there's basically two communities. At some point in 2018, there was a major shift in phytoplankton composition and data collected from the middle of 2018 on is very different from the data collected beforehand. And if you assume that the phytoplankton data that you got was already cleaned up, was already synthesized correctly and everything, your interpretation would be there was a major shift in this, these communities um, at this point. But it turns out that wasn't true. What actually happened was there was a change in the taxon names um, from Croococcus, the old name, to Eucapsis. And once the researchers went back and uh, retroactively fixed this change, it turns out that there wasn't actually some huge event that happened in the middle of 2018, and actually that the phytoplankton communities were fairly similar over this entire time span. Um, so this is just one example of why it's so important for um, an effort like this to happen before um, people start really utilizing all these data sets and synthesizing them. Sorry. And so that's what led to um, PESP, to our solution. So the goal of PESP uh, broadly is to create a da standardized data set of phytoplankton data. Um, and we're modeling this after a previous IEP project um, called Super, which did a similar effort for zooplankton data. Um, and this data set will be published to the Environmental Data Initiative, which is a public data repository. And in addition, we'll create an R package for ease of data import for um, various end users. 
And in addition, um, this data set will be integrated into the USGS's um, phytoplankton dashboard, um, which is uh, led by Emily Richardson. And you can see a beta version of that below. Um, and this, so this will be useful uh, just to sort of visualize um, the data set itself. Um, as for the current progress of uh, PESP, so PESP recently um, finished a major milestone, which is that we finished standardizing and uploading DWR's environmental monitoring program data set to EDI. And this was such a big effort because all the code we use, all the standardization methods we use for it, we're going to be using as a template for future groups. So this was a large part of the workload uh, that we completed. In addition, um, we have a method subgroup that's led by Christy Bowles that's um, collecting and standardizing the metadata from all these different groups. Um, so that's also going to be very useful for our end product. And we've also began um, the creation of that R package that will be used for data import. And so for next steps for PESP. So um, our next step is that we will start working with each of the other groups individually to publish or update their data sets. Um, again, using ENP's data as sort of the model format to use. Um, once we have all of this data um, uploaded and ready, We'll work with each group to determine a plan for future updates um, in subsequent years. Um, this will probably look like writing individualized, individualized scripts to automate data formatting with the main goal that each group will be able to update their data sets going forward um, with minimal involvement from PESP aside from the synthes uh, synthesizing portion. And our goal is to have this project finished by the end of 2023, both with the um, creation of that R package and the integration into the phytoplankton dashboard. Um, oops, I forgot an ending slide, but I would like to thank uh, all my collaborators at IEP um, and everyone helping me uh, with this effort at the various agencies. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Going once. Oh, we got one. Excellent. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Could, uh, based on your experience thus far with the project, what would you say would be the most difficult part? I know you went through some of that, but um, could you could you tell us like what are the nuts and bolts of like the really tough stuff? Like what 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 would be the advice for people get getting into this kind of database management? Yeah, um, I think some of the problem is uh, the metadata aspect has actually been pretty challenging. Um, not everyone takes really detailed notes about, you know, all the different net sizes they use and what the contractors do and everything. And then, so once we started the synthesis effort um, and got the method subgroup started up, uh, yeah, we, we realized there was a lot of people that were missing that information or really had to dig deep to find it. Um, and so that's been probably one of the most challenging parts. So definitely recommend taking good detailed notes of all your methods. <laughs> Um, maybe I missed it, but what, what's your geographic spread? So it's pretty much the entirety of the Delta we have data for. Um, uh, not the Bay and not upstream, just the Delta. Uh, I forget off the top of my head. Uh, I haven't worked too deeply with the non-EMP data sets yet. So EMP's data set is mostly focused yeah. the Delta, but I believe we have data a little deeper into the Bay. But yeah, we do. We do. USGS has that. Yes. So. And anybody can contribute data to, to yes, you. Yes, yeah. Um, if you have data sets, um, I should have had my contact information somewhere, but um, I can give it to you later if you have data sets you like to contribute. Thank you. Good to hear. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure, you know, how you guys actually fig figured out the taxonomic shift example, but for things like that, I'm curious if you think that for some databases, there's like a ticking clock where if, if something like what you're doing now, if it waits too long after the data was generated, that things like that might be lost and might be impossible to fix after a long enough time span, because the people who know it might be, you know, retired and inaccessible if, if, if things aren't recorded adequately. Of course, you have thoughts about kind of 
Um, yes. Yeah. Thing. So that's another um, aspect PESP is tackling as well. Um, we have some of those issues. EMP's data set goes back to 1975, and we don't necessarily have the greatest records all the way back then. Um, part of what PESP is also doing is looking really in depth into those and documenting all of those issues um, and making sure we know if some data maybe isn't usable, we at least have a very good handle on what the issues are and that end users at least know what happened to that data. So we are still documenting that and making sure that that's available to people. All right. Um, my question is regarding um, data that's used as a proxy for phytoplankton. Is that something like, for example, chlorophyll? Is that going to be included in the you know the data set that you're that we're, you're working on with PESP, or is that kind of out of scope for this project? So the chlorophyll data won't be part of PESP itself. Um, if groups are collecting chlorophyll, EMP does. So we have that data set uploaded already on EDI, um, and and yeah, and so groups can also upload. Their chlorophyll data as well. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will give a, a brief plug to the work that Sam Bashevkin uh, and others have done integrating some of that discrete water quality data, including chlorophyll as well as nutrients. So there's another data package available if you want that integrated chlorophyll. Um, moving on, we have our next talk. Uh, da, 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 pull it up. And this will be by Laura Tordekleb and myself. And it is, I realize we have a different title in the program than the slide, but either way, we have the responses of Meodius, the jellyfish, and Batamocorbula, the clam, to flow and drought. And I will let Laura take it away and I will um, play tag team. Thanks, Rosie. Um, yes, yeah, sorry for changing the, the name of the presentation at the last minute. Um, so this research was part of the IEP drought management analysis and synth synthesis teams evaluation of each ecological impacts of drought on the San Francisco estuary. And we released a preliminary report in February of 2022 that includes um, some of these analyses on clams and jellyfish responses to drought. Um, and so for this study, um, we decided to focus on the effects of invasive species um, during drought periods or their responses to droughts. Um, and this is because invasive species can vastly alter aquatic food webs. And so um, an example of this that we are all pretty familiar with um, is the overbite clam, Potamocorbula amaransis, um, that was discovered in the San Francisco estuary in 1986 um, and quickly became numerically dominant in San Pablo Bay and Sassoon Bay. Due to its high filtration rate, um, it has had large impacts on the biomass of both phytoplankton and zooplankton in the upper estuary, and these declines in plankton have also influenced um, pelagic fish species. Um, so its effects have rippled throughout the food web. Um, and the food web impacts of invasive species can be exacerba exacerbated by extreme events um, such as droughts and floods that are increasing in frequency due to climate change. Um, droughts in particular have favored invasive species in the San Francisco estuary. Um, so for example, Maharja et al. Um, showed that Invasive species like largemouth bass are more resistant and resilient to drought than native species like longfin smelt and delta smelt. Um, and so this means that invasive species um, populations decline less during drought periods and they rebound more quickly following drought periods. Um, and with more frequent droughts occurring in the estuary, this is a really um, troubling pattern um, that could have large consequences for the estuary and food web. Um, so in recent years, um, we have seen several um, very large and severe or long, long term and severe um, droughts occurring in the San Francisco estuary. Um, so here I'm showing um, the Sacramento Valley index um, over the years, and I've outlined um, drought periods from 1986 to present. Um, since the year 2000, we've experienced four drought periods. Um, so these are years of successive critically dry, dry, or below normal water year types. 
Um, and the most recent droughts um, of 2012 to 2016 and 2020 have been especially severe. Um, and so we wanted to determine how these drought periods, um, in particular, the more recent drought periods have influenced invasive species in the estuary. Um, so we focused on responses of non-native filter feeders to dry years because these um, because filter feeders have the potential to have severe impacts on the food web um, through their grazing impacts on phytoplankton and zooplankton. Um, and so we examined responses of populations of the overbite clam, um, as well as the Asian clam, Corbicula flaminia, um, which was discovered in the San Francisco estuary in 1945, and then jellyfish meodius, um, which were discovered in the estuary in 1959. Um, so, uh, Potamocorbula and Corbicula occupy different salinity niches in the estuary. Um, so Corbicula is um, found in the freshwater portions of the estuary down to the low salinity zone um, in the confluence. And Potamocorbula um, occupies more saline portions of the estuary. These two species overlap in the confluence um, and they may have different responses to drought because of their different um, salinity tolerances, where during drought periods, we tend to have um, higher salinities in the upper estuary. Um, Meodius um, occupy, uh, oops, sorry. So Meodius occupies salinities from two to nine on the practical salinity scale, um, but little is known about its ecology in the estuary or its responses to drought. So we examined the effects of dry years in the upper estuary, which we defined um, as extending from Sassoon Bay in the west um, to the north and south central delta in the east. And we looked at responses of Potamocorbula, Corbicula, and Meodius to dry years. Um, we looked at changes in their abundance, um, change in, changes in the center of population dis distribution of Potamocorbula and Meodius. And we also looked at grazing rates um, to understand implications for the food web. So we hypothesized that in wet years, uh, Potamocorbula and Meodius population centers of distribution are seeded in Sassoon Bay and Sassoon Marsh. And in dry years with increasing salinity in the upper estuary, we expect that their abundances increase um, in Sassoon Marsh and Sassoon Bay and that they also um, shift their distributions further upstream towards the confluence um, where they overlap more with corbicula. Um, we also hypothesized that these population changes may result in higher grazing rates um, during dry years. Um, in particular, in the low salinity zone in the confluence region, um, which is a critical habitat for food limited estuarian species like Delta smelt. So um, I'm going to talk about the responses of Potamocorbula and Corbicula to dry years, um, and then Rosie will take it over and talk about Meodius. So to evaluate abundance of the clam species, um, we used EMP and GRTS data um, from 2009 to 2019. Um, so GRTS um, was a collaboration between USGS and the Environmental Monitoring Program. Um, and I'm showing here the EMP long-term benthic sampling locations. Um, so EMP's long-term benthic sampling um, doesn't sample um, all of the regions of the estuary that GRTS samples. So GRTS has um, had more comprehensive um, sampling. Um, for the center of distribution, um, I used the EMP long-term benthic sampling data um, from 1987 to 2020. And I looked at um, the Potamocorbula center of distribution changes. Okay, so first um, I'm showing the clam density changes um, in response to dry years from 2007 to 2019. Um, so we have density on the y-axis and um, water year type on the x-axis and corbicula responses are on the top panel and potamocorbula on the bottom panel. Um, so we found the highest corbicula densities um, in the north, south, central and confluence regions and found that their densities declined during dry water year types. Um, Potamocorbula densities were highest in Sassoon Marsh and Sassoon Bay, but they were also found in the confluence um, and their densities increased during dry years. I also examined how Potamocorbula's center of distribution changed during dry years 
um, and found a one year lag in the response where the population shifted up upstream in the year following a dry year because of higher juvenile recruitment. So this figure is showing the center of distribution um, measured in kilometers from the Golden Gate um, plotted against the previous year's Sacramento Valley Index. Um, I also noticed an interesting pattern in this relationship where clams sampled prior to 2000 had a much stronger response to dry years um, than clams sampled post 2000. So the top line shows the clams sampled prior to 2000 and the bottom line shows clams sampled post 2000. Um, and so although um, clams sampled in either of those time periods um, shifted their distribution upstream towards the confluence, in the year following a dry year, um, there was a much stronger response um, prior to 2000. So to try to explain this pattern, um, I look back at clam densities in the long-term EMP monitoring data. And so here I'm showing um, the Potama corbula density um, plotted against year and found that in the Sassoon Bay region, the Potama corbula density increased substantially post 2000, but not in other regions. And so these increases in Potamal Corbula uh, post-2000 mean that even though the population shifts upstream toward the confluence in dry years, their center of distribution remained more firmly anchored in Sassoon Bay. Um, notably, this increase post-2000 coincides with the timing of the pelagic organism decline and may be an underappreciated um, contributor to that pattern. Um, so to summarize, uh, I found that Potamo Corbula increased in Sassoon Bay to the confluence during dry years, um, whereas Corbicula decreased in the north, south, central, and confluence regions. Um, the Potamo Corbula distribution shifted upstream the year following a dry year, and post-2000, the Potamo Corbula density increased substantially in Sassoon Bay. And now I'll hand over the talk to Rosie to talk about Maodius. All right. Thank you, Laura. So. Maodius. It's a jellyfish. Who studies jellyfish in the Delta? No one. There's been hardly three or four papers on Maodius. Uh, very understudied. We don't have any surveys dedicated to jellyfish. However, we do have a lot of fish surveys, and many of them have started counting jellyfish in their nets, especially in recent years. Um, only in recent years though, so while many of these surveys have been around for a very long time, we only have a complete jellyfish data set from 2007 through 2020 right now. Um, this data came from the CDFW's Bay study, Falmouth Water Trawl and Summer Tonet, and UC Davis's Sassoon Marsh survey. So we have our data set. We limit it to just June through October because that's when 99% of all of the jellyfish were caught, and we limited it to just Maodius because that was 99% of the species caught in this upper estuary area. When bay study is further down into the bay, they catch a lot of other species, but we wanted to limit it to this spatial area. So when we break it up by region, we found that we hardly ever catch them in the north because it's probably too fresh for them. In the south, we only got them in very dry years, probably because that's when salinity starts to intrude and creep up in that south central region. In the confluence, we had a highly significant inverse relationship with flow so that critically dry years, we got a lot more of them. Wet years, we got a lot fewer of them in the confluence. The situation was reversed, however, in Sassoon Bay, where there were less of them in critically dry years and more of them in wet years. Sassoon Marsh, there was any uh, significant relationship. This different relationship in Sassoon Bay versus the confluence made us think that this was probably due to the salinity range shifting, similar to the, the zooplankton trends that Christina talked about earlier. And indeed, if we limited this to just the salinity where we found most of the jellyfish, which was uh, between about three and seven parts per thousand, we no longer had a statistically significant relationship between Maodia CPUE and water year type. It looks like wet might be higher, but it didn't uh, meet our statistical um, test. But it was pretty curious in terms of how much we had high jellyfish in those wet years. We were really expecting dry years to have higher jellyfish catches. 
Looking at it by year, however, we noticed that there was a ton in 2017 and 2019, very few in 2011, which was our other wet year. For some reason though, those two years were just bumper crops of jellyfish and we really have no good explanation for why. There was you know, more zooplankton in wetter years in Sassoon, but it's a bit of a mystery and we'd love any theories that anyone has on this. But back to that shift in salinity that we noticed um, and using the same methods we use to look at center of distribution for Potamocorbula, we could look at the center of meiotis distribution um, on the y-axis by mean monthly delta outflow. With clams, we had to use the annual index from the previous year because they took a while to move. Jellyfish move really fast. So we could just use the uh, outflow from that month. And we saw that indeed they do shift um, downstream in higher flows and upstream in lower flows or droughts. So higher abundances in the confluence in dry years, higher abundances at Sassoon in wet years, we don't know why, and movement upstream during droughts with their salinity zone. But what does this mean for the rest of the food web? Well, uh, fortunately, due to work by Jan Thompson and her colleagues at USGS, we have really good idea of what grazing rates uh, Potamocorbula can produce. So based on their biomass, filtration weight, and water depth, we can calculate how much of the phytoplankton they will remove from the water column. With Maeotius, like I said, no one's really studied them in the estuary. Even other locations, we, I could not find any published grazing rates for Maeotius. Filtration or grazing rates for other jellyfish vary hugely, but just to kind of get a order of magnitude idea of what they might be doing to the ecosystem, we use grazing rates from another small jellyfish and the observed CPUE uh, that we caught to figure out how much of the zooplankton they might have removed per day. So I'm comparing the clearance rate per day, which is proportion of either phytoplankton or zooplankton removed from the water column versus water year type for Potamocorbula in green and Maeotius in that reddish color. And we see that in most cases, Maeotius doesn't even show up on the graph. Potamocorbula just blows them away. The only times when uh, Maeotius has a bigger effect is when you find them in these really dense blooms, like in 2017 and 2019. Um, however, this is an area we really need more research. We need some actual data from this estuary before we can say very much. Um, so to summarize, as flow decreases, both clams and jellyfish move upstream and clam abundance really increases. Other work by the drought synthesis team found that chlorophyll decreases in Sassoon during drier years. Uh, and so does zooplankton. So this grazers may be part of the reason why we see those declines. And as Laura mentioned, the pelagic organism decline, which was the big decline in fish, happened around the year 2000 when Potamocorbula really started taking off. Coincidence? I think not. So a huge thank you to the studies and surveys that produced the data that went into these analyses. And definitely a thank you to Jan Thompson, USGS researchers for those grazing rate calculations. Thanks to Christina Birdie and Betsy Wells, our co-authors on this. And thanks for the, to the drought synthesis team for help with the data wrangling and manuscript review. And with that, I will take any questions. All right, interesting presentation, thanks. Uh, question uh, for Laura, I guess, although either of you can respond, but she talked about it. When you, I'm curious as to the process uh, by which you arrived at understanding that there was a change in 2000 that you talked about. Um, was that something that you, you, know, you just sort of put in the model different years until you found something, or was that something that you noticed because you're intimately involved with the data set? Or how, how did you actually decide that that was a, 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 some sort of change point that you, you would make some conclusions about or an illustration of?
a change between those two sampling periods? Oh, thank you. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't know why exactly we would be detecting that change. Um, our hypothesis is that um, there was a extended dry period um, followed by a very wet period um, that we've hypothesized the dry period um, before 2000 may have favored tamocorbula. Um, and then uh, it may have been so extended that other species were not able to respond favorably in the following wet period. Um, but we don't know. We you know, we've asked this of the IEP, various IEP synthesis teams, if they have any ideas for why we may be detecting this pattern. So if anybody has ideas, um, you know, we would be very interested in hearing them. The Yeah, yeah, basically it was just data exploration and then, um, you know, the, the statistical analysis um, supported the pattern that we were observing in the data and then we started asking about it. The other thing that we've been thinking about in terms of drought overall is we haven't had two wet years in a row since before the year 2000. So it could be that because we've continued to have dry years, you know, one wet year might not be enough to really knock them back. Bruce. Um, just, do you have any sense of how much myotis there is down the other side of Carquinas? Do we have a supply up there that's just leaking up here, like, like you described for the crunt lamps? So as I, Let's see, where's this? Uh, da, da, da. So we actually don't even get very many in Sassoon Bay in dry years because it isn't, it's too salty for them. So there uh, definitely aren't more of them in the bay. Okay, great. Yeah, and there, there are other jellyfish that um, like it saltier, uh, but they tend to be more in the spring and winter for some reason. Thank you. Well, um, Moving on, because we've got more to do here. Our next speaker is Daniel Constable, who is uh, speaking on behalf of Dylan Chapel, his co-author, um, talking about ecosystem restoration progress review for the Delta and Sassoon Marsh. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna pivot a little and take a different approach to synthesis here. And as Rosie mentioned, I'm presenting some of this on behalf of Dr. Dylan Chapel, who couldn't be here today, but did a lot of this work. So first off, just to give you a preview of where we're going with this, this map on the right is showing progress, um, planned, existing, um, or completed restoration project projects since 2007. I'll get to why that date was chosen in a minute, but you can see some pretty extensive areas, some large footprints on this on this map. A couple of things to highlight here. This effort here is really focused at understanding a few things. One is to give a comprehensive view of how much we have achieved on the landscape and maybe how much more we need to achieve. If you look at some of the scientific synthesis work that's been done, that says what needs to be achieved if you want to recover um, have a more enhanced ecosystem in the Delta and Sassoon Marsh. I'm going to give a quick overview of some updates to the Delta plan, which I'll go over what that is in a moment again as well, because it's relevant to this effort, and then go over the methods and results. So just to take a step back again, um, I'm from the Delta Stewardship Council, both Dylan and I are, um, and our guiding document is the Delta plan. It sets out a vision for the Delta and Sassoon Marsh. And today when I say Delta, I'm really referring to both those locations. It came about as part of the Delta Reform Act in 2009, which directed our agency to develop this comprehensive plan. And it includes a series of 17 regulations, as well as several non-regulatory performance measures and recommendations to other agencies that they should do to achieve some um, goals. Since 2013, several parts of the Delta Plan have been updated and amended to reflect uh, primarily changing science, but also sometimes changing conditions on the ground as well. 
As a little bit more background as why this is relevant to ecosystem and some of the scientific synthesis here, is that back in 2013, when the Delta Plan came about, it was envisioned that the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, or BDCP as it was known, was basically going to come into the Delta Plan, and that was going to be our approach to ecosystem restoration. As you may know, that laid out a vision of around 100,000 acres of restoration, 65,000 acres of title or so. It was very, very ambitious. The way that it was written is that if the Bay Delta Conservation Plan came forward as a Habitat Conservation Plan or a Natural, Natural Communities Conservation Plan, HCP or NCCP, that would just be brought into the Delta Plan. Well, as many of you know, in 2015, the state pivoted away from BDCP and it went to a division of restoration and mitigation under Eco Restore and some other projects and conveyance under what was then known as uh, water fix. Um, that's really important to highlight because as soon as that happened, um, in 2015, the council started looking towards an amendment because this was no longer going to fill the gap for ecosystem. We suddenly had a gap in the Delta Plan. And so since 2016, we have started kicking off work on an amendment to, the, to um, the Delta Plan, the chapter focused on ecosystem restoration. And just in this last year, in June of 2022, that became part of the Delta Plan. And again, I'll get into in a moment why this is relevant and important to synthesis. Okay. So just a little bit more background on what this amendment includes. Chapter four of the amendment is reflective of a lot of new science and again, changing conditions on the ground that have changed since 2013. It's informed by synthesizing research that's been conducted over the last nearly 20 years. And that includes 14 recovery plans, conservation strategies, and other species specific resiliency plans, including documents like the Central Valley Joint Venture. And so the targets that we came up with are based on targets identified in those documents. And there's a bit of a synthetic effort there in that it doesn't tell you, oh, this many acres should be in this exact area. So there's some, some work that needs to be done to figure out where those could be on a landscape. Um, I also wanna emphasize here that those targets, although they're called targets, are non-regulatory. So there is one new regulation under the amendment. These targets, these acreage targets are non-regulatory. They set a vision, but it doesn't mean that you have to do these. A couple other points to highlight here is that the amendment is centered around these five core strategies that are shown up here. I won't read through all of them, but they also help shape some of the vision and actions that we think should happen on the landscape. And then lastly, there are several other considerations here, um, things like implementing uh, and following what's known as the good neighbor checklist, making sure that you do not put in restoration in a way that uh, negatively impacts your neighbors. So for example, if there's farmland next to a restoration project, you are taking account of that. Um, and then a couple other things just to highlight here. Um, one thing is that we got some very, very useful feedback from some tribes and we included a mitigation measure around that. And one of the ones um, to highlight there is that it requires for restoration projects that they consult with tribes a little C, not a big C, prior to AB 52. So when they're coming up with a design prior to that, even going out and speaking with tribes, so you don't get to sequa, then all of a sudden realize that, oh, we really should have done that and it's too late. Um, so that's, that's quite important. Okay, that's just an example of some of the documents here um, shown up in the the slide, but again, there are 14 total. And I also want to give a shout out to Ron Melser, Dr. Ron Melser's shop, who really kicked off all this off and set out a lot of the guidance for this happening. He's now at State Parks. Okay, so looking ahead a little bit, Appendix E of this amendment tries to summarize what those different targets are. And they're shown up here on the screen. The blue ones shown up top are the ones that we're gonna be talking about more today. And the ones that are highlighted there for the reason that we have more data about those and there's been progress towards those. The ones shown at the gray at the bottom, there honestly has not been a lot of progress. There just hasn't been that much done on the landscape. The targets here are for 2050. And I should note that um, we're looking at a 2007 baseline again. And the reason that's a 2007 baseline is that when this process kicked off, we were using the best available uh, land use data at the time, VegCamp, the state's kind of great land use data. Um, and that had, the last time it had been updated for both the marsh and the delta at that time was 2007. It's subsequently been updated and it's going to be updated again, but that's what we had available at the time. So that's where we set our baseline because we could actually measure things against that. Um, this table shows, again, these um, areas on top where that's been key progress. And just to highlight a couple in the kind of the leftmost column for non-tidal wetlands, historically based on work by the San Francisco Estuary Institute, we think we had somewhere around 116,000 acres of um, non-tidal wetlands. As of 2007, we had 5,800 acres. So basically everything was converted to farmland, urban, um, non-wetland non land uses. 
based on the synthesis work we did, um, we identified a target of around 19,000 acres um, as a net increase above that baseline. So if you add those two up, we're looking towards 24 or 25,000 total acres for that. The rest are listed out here. Um, one of the other large ones, just to highlight, is for tidal wetlands, um, is that there's actually a, a somewhat sizable, depending how you think about it, baseline, uh, 20,000 acres of 2007, but as a percentage, that is a small fraction of what used to exist in the historic estuary. It's basically all been converted. Um, there's a goal of adding another 32,000 acres, again, coming from recovery plans and various documents, so bringing it up to 52,000. So it's still only 10% or so um, of the historic level, but it's some progress towards that. Okay, so going back to the map here, um, wanted to, to bring us back to the intent of this project, that really overarching intent was to synthesize how much progress has been made to answer the question, what have we actually done in the landscape? And starting this off, you'd think, well, isn't there a database of this? Like, we should know this. And the answer is no, we actually didn't, or we're still working on it. There are some databases out there, but not a comprehensive picture um, from these exact dates. Um, a couple other things to note here, too, is that we are using our jurisdictional boundaries, which is the legal delta and Sassoon Marsh, which are shown there on the map. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done outside of those areas and that's planned outside of those areas, but that's what we're looking at. We only looked at projects that had some spatially explicit component. Um, so if there was a project out there and they don't identify how much acreage is going to be constructed as part of it, we can't work with that. It's essentially there's, the data is not there. And the few different phases that we're looking at that it's been split out for. Uh, one is completed. Uh, hopefully that's pretty straightforward, but they've, they've constructed something on the ground. It may not be totally functional yet because these projects take a long time to get up and running. So if it's a recent project, maybe it's not all uh, working as intended yet, but at least it's there. Um, in progress, so maybe they've they put shovels in the ground, they're reasonably far along, and then planned. This was, um, there's a number of criteria there, but essentially it's reasonably far enough in the environmental documentation process that it looks like it could go ahead. There is some judgment call there, understandably. An example of that in the South Delta shown here in kind of the orange yellow is Paradise Cut. There has been a lot of work done there, but it doesn't mean that that project's 100% gonna happen. Um, some other work that was done is a literature review, uh, looking at various restoration and management actions that have been going on the landscape. Um, and then lastly, I'll, I'll hopefully say this again to emphasize it, but thank you to several of you who looked at these lists, looked at data and gave us feedback and specifically gave Dylan feedback on what um, should, be, should be here and should be captured here. One other point to note here is that this does not capture flow or related actions. So, um, this is only looking at projects that have a physical acreage footprint, not at the management action. So we would hope the necessary flow to make these functional um, is there. If you don't have that, that's a different question. Okay, and then I guess lastly, just to note, um, for each of these focal e ecosystems that I was just speaking about a moment, so title, non-title, et cetera, we also looked at the literature review there high at the bottom, um, but we're gonna focus a little bit more on the quantitative, the acreage outcome. So there was a bit more work done on this of how do you look at um, what the intended functions of these projects are. So where does the data come from? A lot of it is starting with um, the Eco Atlas. And that was the starting point for much of this. Um, kicking off, Again, this was done by some more work that Ron Melser had started off trying to answer a similar question before he moved to parks. Um, this began with, began with a review of what's on EcoAtlas. Um, 178 projects were initially reviewed on there, um, identified as some sort of restoration writ large project. That was narrowed down to our spatial boundaries. So things in the Bay, areas outside of the Delta and the Marsh were kicked out of the data set. Um, this included projects like Aquas, um, well, I guess it kicked, it kicked out some projects that were focused if the intent was just acquisition or just preservation, those type of projects that didn't count in this list. And so they were also kicked out. After doing that, there were 63 projects remaining. And then after hearing again from, from many of you through some interviews and other outreach, another 18 projects were added back in that were not initially an eco restore. And this gets to a point of that this is ongoing and there's kind of a, a hamster wheel that you eventually have to publish something because the projects keep getting added, which is great, but there's no static list out there. So thanks again to all of you who've given feedback to Dylan on this. Um, one other point to note here, 
um, is that the acreages that we're talking about and shown the table and I'll show again in a moment are based on project documents. So they're not like taking a polygon and a GIS and saying, oh, we have a thousand acres of tidal wetland. We actually looked at the documents. Dylan looked at those documents and said, oh, maybe it's a thousand acre footprint, but the project says they're going to create 300 acres of tidal. It's going to be a hundred acres of something else, et cetera. And so they're real numbers. So jumping to the results, what does this actually show us? Going to go through a few slides here and show what have we achieved since 2007. Um, first, I'd like to highlight up top here saying that Dylan looked at projects prior to 2007, prior to that baseline established in the ecosystem amendment. Um, but there's actually not nearly as much that has been done in the past. But we did look at those numbers. Those are not counted towards our targets here, just as kind of a way we do the math for the ecosystem amendment. We're only counting things above our baseline, which was in that year. But there had been some work already done prior to that. Um, if we look at things that have been constructed since 2007, and I should note this is um, completed, planned, in progress, all everything all kind of wrapped together, um, there's been quite a bit of progress. Um, I think there's a positive story to tell here. Um, 5,700 acres or so of tidal wetlands, which is quite impressive, 2,700 of non-tidal um, and 940 or so of riparian and floodplain. And one point to note here is that the Delta plan does not uh, separate those out. So floodplain and riparian are kind of joined together here. We're not um, disaggregating the mix, although that does exist. If you look at what's in progress and plan, though, it becomes even more impressive. So already in progress, there's been about 5,200 acres added. And then for, for title, I won't read the rest, but you can see that there's been quite a bit um, in progress. And then there's quite a bit planned. So if you add all that up, there's about 14,000 additional acres of tidal wetlands, almost 5,000 of non-tidal and 2,500 of riparian and uh, floodplain together. So quite a bit has been done. A lot of that has been just since 2017. So there was a huge uptick, particularly in title, that has kicked off since then. So that's, that's quite impressive. Um, for some planned projects, just for example, included projects, things that had a, uh, identified as spatially explicit acreages, so like Chips Island, Little Egbert Tract, Knights and Wetland Project are some of the examples there. Um, and then some ones that are a little bit more conceptual were not included. So things like Frank's Track, Elk Slough, two examples that were not included at this time. They could be in the future, depending what happens there. Okay, so when we compare these to the targets that are identified in the Delta Plan, where does this leave us? Um, the Delta Plan targets are listed there again for a second, just from the bottom in black text. So for tidal wetlands, it identifies that target of net an additional 32,500 acres. Um, almost 20,000 acres for non-tidal and 16,000 or so for riparian and floodplain. And if you subtract those and figure out what the math is, um, there's a pretty sizable gap still. And I think there's both a positive story and some uh, necessary work that shows what needs to be done here. Uh, 18,000 acres of tidal, almost 15,000 of non-tidal and 13,000 of riparian and floodplain. And I say there's both a positive and sobering aspect to this because it shows how much has been done, but yet how much is also needed. Um, on the positive spin, some of these are within striking distance. Like it's not the BDCP, we need another 100,000 acres. It's actually maybe achievable, which is really good news. Um, let's skip ahead here. So another aspect of the synthesis was looking at what is the motivation or what was the reason for these projects? Um, some of them were state initiatives. A lot was driven by mitigation. So Eco Restore was a big driver of a lot of these. The Delta Levies program, um, uh, formerly FESRO, and then the Fish Restoration Program. I, I'm sure many of you work on that and have worked on that. And so thank you again for the great work on that. You brought forth a lot of acreage on the, on the landscape. Some other in sequa NEPA mitigation um, that's gone on, and then some ecosystem service green infrastructure type projects and what we call voluntary restoration. So ones that were actually not legally driven or required, but projects that people put on the ground. So the Nature Conservancy, others, folks who just put some acres there, um, which is great. And so if we graph those and see what those look like, um, mitigation is the, the main driver here, is the takeaway. So water project mitigation, nearly 40%. Um, Delta levies program, another 21%. Ecosystem services, 20 and so on down the list. Voluntary is, is the lowest level, which is not surprising. But if you add up the water projects and Delta levies programs, you're getting to nearly 50% just there is what's driving the acres that are, that are on the ground or planned for this. Um, this list also includes pre-2007 projects, I should note, although those weren't a huge number, so it doesn't throw things off that much. 
So where should we go next after this? Um, these results give us a picture um, of kind of what is out there, what is planned, um, but it's by no means comprehensive and a lot of more work needs to be done. Um, as new projects are added, there's a need to track those and keep this up to date. So there's definitely a, a need to continue the work on this. Um, I'd also note that there's a performance measure that Delta um, Stewardship Council has it's shown there on the right, trying to track that. And so it, we have an appendix to the Delta plan, to the ecosystem amendment that lists out specific acreages for different target types or different habitat types, more than I showed up on the table here a moment ago. Um, it's also important to note that a majority of the tidal wetland restoration really has been completed since 2017, as I mentioned. So a lot of this is very recent. Uh, we don't quite know how it all functions yet. And so that brings in a need um, and a focus on the importance of synthesis again, is that all the work you're doing and tracking how this actually functions is really important. We have acreage numbers, but we don't know how it's all working yet. Hopefully it's going to be great, but it takes time. And then future projects will need to be adaptively managed um, based on what is added and how they're functioning. So just a couple more things here. Um, there's a potential to expand the boundaries beyond just the legal delta and Sassoon Marsh. So we looked at those jurisdictions because it's what drives our work. However, the project shown here, Big Notch, Lower Elkhorn, et cetera, some of these are outside of the delta or partially outside of the delta and are still important. Similarly, targets for oak woodland and vernal pools might actually make more sense partially outside of the delta. I'm just looking at where they historically were. And so we might wanna track those as well. And then lastly, I wanted to note that climate change, as you all know, is really increasingly affecting the need for some of these projects and how they function. So when we're looking at that, we need to consider how climate is going to affect these ecosystems, everything from the physical impacts of sea level rise to various things like heat, stress, food web impacts. Um, I do wanna highlight that the council is working on a separate initiative, Delta DAPS, which is our climate change initiative. And one of the aspects of that is looking at ecosystem adaptation. And so we are trying to address that and would certainly welcome more feedback on that from all of you as well. The map shown here on the right is just elevation and it shows some of the considerations for, for example, if you put in a project in a certain area will eventually become tidal. If it's in a slightly planned area like sea level rise adaptation area, how do we count that now? How do we count it in the future? Okay. Just want to say thank you again presenting today on behalf of Dylan Chapel. His contact, his email is up there. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Dylan as the corresponding author. This should be uh, published. It's preliminarily, it's been sent out to some folks internally for review as well as externally. Um, so I'm hoping maybe in the next couple of months it'll go forward. Dylan knows more um, and that this will all be available. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, we're about out of time for questions, so I think we'll just move on because it is the end of the day. But thank you so much. Very interesting. Restoration is very near and dear to my heart. But um, our last talk of the day is going to be uh, by Brittany Davis. And unfortunately, you have to hear from me again. But um, we are going to be talking about structured decision making for Delta smelt habitat, synthesizing multiple streams of IEP data to inform management. Great, thanks. It is the end of the day. So thanks everyone for sticking around for the last talk of the evening. Uh, Rosie and I are going to be sharing um, about the structured decision-making process for the summer fall habitat action. We've been working on this for a couple years with our agency partners, public water agencies, uh, many IEP folks. So I'm going to frame up uh, what the summer fall habitat action is, um, uh, what the decision is to make, and then Rosie will follow up with all uh, the technical modeling, IEP data, the synthesis, and then that decision outcome. So the summer fall habitat action is part of our current regulatory framework uh, for the long-term operations of the Central Valley Project and State Water Project. It's a conservation uh, mitigation action um, identified in the biological opinions and the incidental take permit um, in various water years listed here. And uh, the action is intended to improve key physical habitat attributes, also improve access to food for Delta smelt during summer fall periods uh, <clears throat> when those might be limited. And it's thought that um, increasing access in uh, good habitat could potentially improve growth, survival, and ultimate recruitment of the species. 
So the environmental and biological goals of the summer fall action, um, specifically in below normal, above normal uh, water years, and then some wet and dry years, um, are really focused on creating low salinity habitat and access to food. So goals include uh, first, maintaining low salinity habitat in Sassoon Marsh and Grizzly Bay. Second, managing the low salinity zone overlap with turbid water and food. And then lastly, uh, establishing a, a connected low salinity habitat from the Cashlew complex uh, through Sassoon Marsh. And so in effort to meet those environmental and biological goals, uh, a suite of management actions were proposed, habitat actions and food web or food subsidy actions. Some of the habitat actions highlighted in blue here include Fall X2, Sassoon Marsh Salinity Control Gate reoperations um, to maintain low salinity habitat in the marsh. So hopefully allowing smelt to occupy uh, more of those key good habitat features like turbidity and food. Um, also, in, in uh, given water years, uh, there could be the potential for a 100,000 acre feet water uh, block during summer and fall. Um, let's see, food web actions. So food actions are highlighted in orange here on the map. Um, the food actions currently are experimental and optional. Um, they include the North Delta Food Subsidy Action, the Sacramento Deepwater Ship Channel Action, and Managed Wetlands in Sassoon. So where does the planning for summer fall habitat action occur? It occurs in the Delta Coordination Group, um, what I'll refer to as the DCG. It includes federal and state partners, public water agencies, um, and then it's broken out down into a core team where the structured decision-making process happens, and then a hydrology and operations team and science and monitoring team, where a lot of the brainstorming and technical uh, work is being conducted. And so the DCG annually goes through the structured decision-making process for uh, the summer fall habitat action. So each year we're evaluating what the water conditions are like, what are your forecast, what the smelt distribution status and conditions are like, um, and hopefully to make a recommendation for the summer fall habitat action. And, and we do that through a systematic structured decision-making approach. I'll refer to that as SDM through the talk. Um, and so the DCG partners, we work through this SDM process together in hopes to make this sort of consensus-based recommendation for the adaptive management of this summer fall action annually. And so uh, in 2021, the DCG started uh, the SDM process. We initially adopted the PROACT SDM approach um, we developed the first uh, prototype um, for the summer fall action, and it wasn't until this last year that we actually completed the first sort of full iteration of the SDM process. We developed the decision frame. We came up with our desired directional objectives that we wanted to meet or that the summer fall habitat action should meet, uh, what performance metrics we would use to evaluate that. And all of this together resulted in a um, performance, uh, or excuse me, a consequences table that we could then use to evaluate trade-offs with uh, the benefits and potentially unintended consequences as well. Um, so today we're gonna share uh, the 2022 last year's SDM process and go through the large use of IEP data for the SDM performance metrics and ultimate uh, management decision. So the decision uh, the DCG had in 2022 was what suite of actions, and this includes the habitat and food actions, should the DCG recommend for the next summer fall habitat period, June through October, given the likely water year types? Uh, last year, um, although we all know now, you know, uh, no surprise, it was critical. The decision frame and water forec forecasts were still below normal and dry year, so that's what we evaluated. In the dry year, we evaluated three, evaluated three alternatives, including no action, don't do anything, um, and then two uh, potential North Delta food subsidy actions um, using agricultural return drainage in the Calusa Basin drain that would be redirected through the bypass in hopes to create a food subsidy uh, downstream in cash flow complex. And there's two different ag water alternatives there, testing different uh, intensities and durations of that augmented flow pulse. 
In the below normal year, we again had do nothing, no action, um, compared to Sassoon Marsh Slinny control gates um, with two operational triggers. So evaluating a trigger uh, at four PPT or six PPT at Belden's Landing for the start of the operation of the gates. Um, in addition to the North Delta food subsidy action, uh, the ag water drainage, there uh, is the potential to re redirect Sacramento River water through the bypass um, as well to cash loot complex. And again, we have multiple alternatives uh, at the um, varied intensities and durations. So, uh, and what that means, I should probably explain that is, do you create a big pulse that's high intensity and blast it through, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks to, to get it down? Or do you potentially do a longer duration, low intensity, net positive flow, but you're maybe increasing residency time, can you get more productivity in food? And then what if we did a summer sack action uh, plus a fall agricultural action? So we have the potential to restore more natural uh, conditions with net positive flow. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Rosie uh, to talk about the objectives and performance metrics um, that we went through. All right, thanks, Britt. So for our uh, objectives, what do we wanna do? get out of this suite of actions. We want to increase delta smelt food, and we'd measure this by looking at zooplankton biomass, increase delta smelt habitat, and we'll get at this by using a habitat suitability index developed by Beaver et al. with temperature added on top of it, temperature, turbidity, salinity, current speed. Um, delta smelt growth, we want to increase delta smelt growth and survival, and uh, we used a bioenergetics model to figure out, okay, how much are they growing over the course of the summer? Minimize resource costs so we don't want to spend too much water or too much dollars uh, in the process. We want to minimize contaminants. You know, we know especially the North Delta flow action had the potential to increase contaminants, and we'd rather not have too much of that. We didn't have great data on how much it was likely to increase that. So we basically used expert elicitation, which is a fancy word for asking people who know a lot what they think will happen. And same for impacts of salmonids. We didn't want to make things better for Delta smelt while making things shittier for salmon. And um, we just asked a bunch of salmon experts what they thought. And we'd like to have a better way of looking at that in the future. So... To actually quantify as many of these performance metrics as possible, we did a lot of modeling. This spaghetti diagram indicates all of the interwoven, interlaced models and expert elicitations that uh, gave us our final response metrics that we used to evaluate the suite of actions. And this is where the IEP connection really comes in because we used a lot of IEP data and IEP experts to uh, get at these performance measures. The um, temperature and turbidity was all from IEP's long-term monitoring, as was the zooplankton, and that data was integrated using the uh, Zuper R package that was developed by the zooplankton synthesis team. Contaminant data came from a lot of special studies that were in IEP's work plan. The zooplankton models were developed by uh, the zooplankton and float management analysis and synthesis teams headed by Sam Pashevkin there. Um, expert elicitation was leveraging our salmon project work teams um, and the contaminant project work teams. So a lot of real use of IEP's data here. But this giant spaghetti network of models started with the hydrodynamics. Here we use DWR's modeling crew headed up by Eli Telovich and Ian Ecker to look at, uh, predict the salinity that we were likely to see at Belden's Landing in different combinations of salinity control gate operations, and the flow that we were likely to see in the YOLO bypass with uh, the different scenarios that Brittany described. Now, that um, salinity forecast that we made, we were able to use models developed by Sam and Arthur Barrows, Christina Birdy, and April Hennessy to uh, look at the potential change in zooplankton correlated with the change in salinity that we saw in the schism models. 
Um, from this change in salinity in Sassoon Marsh, we got a change in zooplankton with the North Delta flow action. We used a combination of models and some expert opinion on potential changes with a North Delta flow action to get a difference in zooplankton biomass in these different scenarios. For habitat, we took the outputs of the DSM-2 models, put them into a three-dimensional um, hydrodynamic model, applied uh, use of turbidity and temperature data from similar years to get a forecast of where we might see good delta smelt habitat. Now, with the outputs of our smelt habitat model and our smelt food models, we used the uh, individual based model in R developed by Will Smith and others um, to see, okay, if we increase food and we change salinity and turbidity and temperature, um, what are we likely to see in terms of a change in delta smelt growth over the course of the summer? So we could get how much our actions might influence smelt growth. With all of these different performance metrics, once we'd quantified them in one way, shape, or form, we put them all into what we were calling a consequence table. What are the consequences of each of our management scenarios? So this table, uh, we used the AltaViz computer program with the help of Jenny Hoffman from Adapt and Insights. Um, and so we have columns that are each scenario. In this case, these are the three salinity control gate scenarios in a below normal year no action, four parts per thousand and six parts per thousand. And each of the rows is one of our performance metrics. So marsh habitat suitability index, for example, or incremental growth in Delta smelt. We could highlight one of our potential actions and it would automatically uh, show you which scenarios had better options for that performance metric. So for example, highlighting the six parts per thousand scenario, we see that the four parts per thousand gives us better uh, growth increment in Sassoon Marsh, um, zooplankton, food availability, and um, habitat suitability in the marsh. However, resource cost in terms of water cost and operating cost is better in the below normal action. So this allowed us to compare the different actions. That DCG management um, decision-making team got together with uh, all the modeling that had been done by the sub teams and this consequences table. And we had a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion. There was much talking, some arguing, some um, texting each other on the side. But in the end, uh, with the leadership of our excellent facilitators, we were able to come up with a decision. And because we we're having to make this in um, March of last year, we didn't know what exactly the water year would happen. So we coached it in terms of if the water year was this, uh, then we would do that, et cetera. So if it was a critical year, there would be no action. Water quality in uh, Yolo bypass was likely to not be good if we tried to do an action on a dry year. We didn't have enough water to run the gates in a dry year or a critical year. So nothing would happen. If it was dry, whoops, we decide, whoop, uh, shoot, PowerPoint goof. If it was dry, we would do the North Delta food subsidy action with agricultural water of log domation, low magnitude and maximize opportunities for learning. If it was below normal, we would do a North Delta food subsidy action with Sacramento river water with low, long duration, low magnitude and operate the salinity control gates at four parts per thousand. We were very proud of getting to this decision. It's a lot of work, a lot of trade-offs, and then yeah, it was critically dry. So we couldn't actually do an action, which was a bummer, but this did give us a chance to learn about the process, learn about how to step through it as a group um, and feel a lot more prepared for a year where we would have an action. And this really is an adaptive management process. We went through kind of half the process last year with planning, structured decision-making, trade-offs. Then we ended up not doing an action, but we still monitored to see what happened during that non-action year, reported on the outcomes. And now we're in the process of going through this again. We're currently working through the SDM process uh, this year because we didn't have a lot of real new information from a no action year last year, um, we 
Okay. Having the process be very similar to last year's SDM. Um, however, in looking at the different salinity control gate options last year, they're pretty similar. And it was pretty clear which one was better. So much of the rules for when to operate the salinity control gates are kind of baked into the regulation. That there isn't much of a decision to make. We'll operate them per the rules in the ITP um, and not use structured decision making there. Um, however, we still are doing the North Delta food subsidy action with uh, structured decision making. And we've added learning as a specific objective. And as I mentioned, we're in that process now. We're also adding more special studies of um, stable isotopes on the old bypass to better learn from the action if we do it this year. And we have a new study uh, looking at managed wetlands in Sassoon Marsh to hopefully use that um, as one of our actions in future years. I'd like to thank all of the DCG members and technical sub teams for all of their hard work going through this process. Um, our structured decision making facilitator, Jenny, and the Kearns and West team for helping facilitating the meetings. And of course, all of IEP's long term monitoring staff for providing the data that went into our model. And we will take any questions. Dan. So you piqued my interest at the end there, like teasing those new stabilized stope studies. And so I'm wondering, since you sort of have plans for how you're going to act based on the potential outcomes, how do you think, like, what are you looking for from those studies? And then how do you think actions might be taken? Yeah, so there's still a fair amount of uncertainty. And Brittany, feel free to come up if you want to explain this better than me. But um I should really invite Laura up because she was the lead of the project in the stable isotope. But hopefully um, some of the pilot data looks really promising for the stable isotopes, carbon signatures, and uh, distinct gradient across the, the yellow longitudinal um, uh, axis. So we're hoping that in an action, we can use this to determine sort of mechanisms of transport. And so if we're able to uh, trace upstream uh, food subsidies moving downstream, into the cash complex or potentially in the diets of smelt, then, uh, you know, it'll help us evaluate the efficacy of the action and, and uh, future adaptive management of the action as a whole, whether it's SAC action, ag action, how we're moving water and food. Yeah, that's that adaptive management loop, because if, you know, we have some evidence thinking that a flow pulse to the bypass will increase food for smelt downstream, but then there's other situations where it's not as clear and it could just be a coincidence that we saw more phytoplankton downstream. So we want to get a better handle on it. And then using the stabilized tips to trace things down, I think will help. Other questions? Well, thank you all very much for sticking it out to the end. And I don't know if Stephanie has any announcements before we adjourn. Like you said, thanks for sticking it out to the end, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the talks today. Uh, just a reminder, if you have your badge and you're coming back for future days, hold on to them. So um, we still have you all registered and figured out. We don't have to double check everything. Um, so bright and early tomorrow morning, we'll see you guys and um, have a good evening. Drive safely. The weather is really terrible out there right now. Thank you.